Um, I hope y'all are enjoying this series of the audiobook, Scott Liberace. And, um, anyways, we're going to go ahead and get into, I'm going to try to upload chapter 12, 13, 14, and 15, and maybe 16, if I can. So, I'm going to go ahead and play this, and then I will come back at the end with uh, a little bit of feedback on my thoughts. And when we get through with this book, um, I will have a reaction. Or I might just upload a reaction video in the afternoon after the audiobook um, each day. So, but let's go ahead and get into this. It's going to be part 12. 13, 14, 15, and 16, and possibly a little more if I can get it in there. Okay, and I do have to give a disclaimer. This is all uh, allegedly, and um, this is uh, Scott's version of, of this. So, anything that he says in this book, you know, is allegations. So, let me just go ahead and get started, and I have to cover myself on YouTube. So, I have to say, you know, everything's alleged in this book. Although my concern surprised him, he agreed at once. Gladys had been deeply hurt by her virtual exile in the Hollywood Hills, but she was too loyal and devoted an employee ever to broach the subject of salary herself. And Lee never worried about the nuts and bolts of daily life, especially details as mundane as someone else's salary. In all honesty, he didn't have time. When Lee worked Vegas, he gave two two-hour shows, seven nights a week, he wasn't a kid, and performing took all his energy. By necessity, our lives revolved around his needs, his schedule. He'd get up between 2 and 4 in the afternoon, shower, shave, and dress for the day, often in one of his favorite jumpsuits. A late afternoon breakfast was usually followed by a shopping trip. Lee craved shopping the way an addict craves a fix. He felt the day was incomplete if he didn't purchase something. Buying his own groceries and browsing in supermarkets would do if nothing more seductive and costly loomed on the horizon. He could wax ecstatic over imported cheese, fresh vegetables, prime beef. Ooh, fabulous, he'd say in his benevolent wine when something pleased him. By seven, we'd be at the Hilton getting ready for the first show. Lee liked to get there early because he did his own makeup, in part to protect the secret of his baldness. He didn't want some talkative makeup artist telling the world that Liberace's luxuriant locks were phony. He used the hour and a half between the eight o'clock supper show and the midnight cocktail show to rebuild his energy. It was our private time, and heaven help anyone who made the mistake of intruding. We'd have a light meal, and afterward Lee would take a cat nap, leaving instructions to be wakened 15 minutes before he was scheduled to go on stage. Once he nodded off, I'd slip out and wander through the casino gambling or just having a quiet drink by myself. It was the only time in any given 24 hours while I shared my life with Lee that I could count on being alone. My first visit to Lee's dressing room with Bob Black had been a rare exception to Lee's hard and fast rule of no visitors between acts. In the years since, I've often wondered why he permitted two strangers like Black and myself to come backstage. Was he hoping that someone like me would come along? I'll never know. Inviting us to the house the next day was even more out of character for Lee. He saw people in his dressing room after the last show. Friends from out of town, visiting celebrities, people he couldn't avoid seeing. He preferred playing host in his dressing room to inviting guests to his home. Describing him as an intensely private man doesn't seem adequate. Once he left the theater, he didn't want anyone around him other than his lover. A cross-at-your-own-risk line divided his public from his private life. Even close associates like Arnett knew better than to drop in on Lee unannounced. If anyone called, fishing for an invitation, Lee made it instantly clear that they wouldn't be welcome. He had a standard routine when Heller, who was Jewish, telephoned unexpectedly. You can't come over tonight, Seymour, Lee would say with ill-concealed glee. I'm cooking pork for dinner. We usually got home between three or four in the morning. It might have been the crack of dawn to most people. But for Lee, the workday had just ended. We'd have a snack, watch movies, play with the dogs, or sit in the jacuzzi smoking and having drinks until he unwound enough to go to sleep, usually about seven in the morning. The routine had been established long before I arrived on the scene, and although I often felt isolated and missed having other people around, Lee refused to alter his restrictive and reclusive lifestyle. 
Despite the crazy hours, we led a very sedentary life. That came as an unpleasant surprise to me. I'd been expecting a private life that in some way matched the glitter and excitement of Lee's onstage performances. But nothing could have been further from the truth. Lee had no hobbies, played no sports. He lived for his hours on stage and his lover at home. The routine was perhaps well-suited to a man in his late fifties. But it soon bored the hell out of me. I cared for Lee deeply. But no single person can satisfy another's every need. I craved other conversation, other viewpoints, the company of people my age. But if I voiced those desires, Lee would either call me a fetch or accuse me of not loving him enough. Since he insisted I be with him every minute, I sometimes felt like a prisoner in paradise. True to his word, Lee made me a part of the act when Jerry left. Even though I would participate in the show hundreds of times, seeing the house lights dim always got my adrenaline flowing. The stage would be completely dark when Ray Arnett, standing unseen in the wings, said, And now, ladies and gentlemen, the star of the show, Mr. Showmanship, Liberace, the man who is famous throughout the world for his candelabra. At that moment, a spotlight would illuminate a single golden candelabra that seemed to float disembodied in velvet darkness. After a meaningful pause, Ray's voice continued, and his piano. Then another spot would reveal a piano. Not your everyday concert grand, either. Lee's stage pianos always glittered with gold leaf, mirrors, or rhinestones. The full orchestra would begin to play. A rose-colored spot would play over the wings, and I'd drive Lee on stage in his mirrored $250,000 Rolls Royce. I wore a white chauffeur's uniform liberally sprinkled with rhinestones, a white peaked cap, knee-length white boots, and full stage makeup. Lee loved the outfit. You look like an Adonis, he said the first time I wore it. My own blonde Adonis. Lee would continue to sit in the car after his entrance, his demeanor as regal as a king's, until I opened the door and helped him out. His most outrageous costumes were reserved for his entrances. They generally included floor-length coats or capes with long trains, many of them adorned with priceless furs. Lee spent half a million dollars or more each year on his costumes, in part because he had to rotate them and could never wear at any engagement what he'd worn the previous year. He also owned the many cars he used in the act, and most of the stage props. Set pieces, the least costly part of the production, could usually be rented. After stepping from the rolls, he'd walk to the edge of the stage and give his audience a brilliant smile. Well, look me over, he'd say. I didn't get dressed like this to go unnoticed. One of his favorite coats was a virgin fox with a 16-foot train. Think how long it took to get the pelts, he'd joke when he wore it. Lee could play a crowd even better than he played the piano. He'd look for someone wearing conspicuous diamonds, and then, holding his own bejeweled fingers up for display, he'd jibe, I didn't have to do anything to get mine. What did you have to do to get yours? It was his standard introductory patter, and the audience never failed to respond by laughing in all the right places. Once his rapport with them had been firmly established, Lee would turn toward me, saying, I'd like you all to meet my friend and companion, Scott Thorson. I'd take a bow, salute, and drive the rolls off stage. As far as I was concerned, Lee might as well have announced that we were lovers. To my amazement, his fans never seemed to draw the obvious conclusions. Next, Lee's ballet would make his entrance and remove Lee's coat. I'd appear again, this time driving a Volkswagen that had been modified to look like a miniature Rolls. The valet would put the coat or cape in the car, and I'd drive off, while Lee explained that his was the only coat in the world to have its own car. It wasn't sophisticated, but it worked. I'd exit to appreciative laughter. After the opener, Lee would get around to playing the piano. By the 1970s, the music was almost an incidental part of his act. The real show was Lee himself, his clothes, his cars, his outrageous stage persona. He rarely played more than five minutes at a time before saying, I have to slip into something more spectacular. That never failed to elicit a laugh and applause. Early in his career, Lee's costumes were made by Frank Acuna, a superb tailor. 
By the time I joined the act, they were being created by Michael Travis, one of Hollywood's most gifted theatrical designers. Travis, who looks more like a matinee idol than someone who works behind the scenes, made a great contribution to the success of Lee's act in the 70s and 80s. The two men met through Ray Arnett, who was a long-term friend and associate of Travis. Travis's credentials were outstanding. He'd worked for the Bell and Firestone television shows in New York during the 50s and moved to Hollywood in the 60s to do Laugh-In. Stars such as Dionne Warwick, Diana Ross, Neil Sedaka, and Wayne Newton were on his client list. More important, Travis had a genius for the spectacular that matched and complemented Lee's. The first costume he created for Lee was a silver-blue chauffeur's livery trimmed in mink, which Lee wore in 1976 when the mirrored roles became part of the act. Six months later, Travis had, as he puts it, ascended the throne. From then on, he made all Lee's costumes. The two men had a terrific working relationship based on trust and respect. When it came to costumes, they were on the same wavelength. Lee never quibbled about the cost of his costumes, his sole specification being that they be more eye-catching every year. The virgin fox coat with a 16-foot train, made at a cost of $300,000 by noted furrier Anna Natisse, was the most spectacular to date of Travis's ideas. But he had an even more fabulous number on the drawing board for the 1987 season. The piece de resistance was to be a cape the size of a stage curtain adorned with an electrified candelabra embroidered in gold. The scenario called for Lee to open the act wearing the cape. At the strategic moment, the hem would have risen slowly until the garment became the stage's back curtain. The costume would have been a fitting climax to the highly successful collaboration between Travis and Lee. But tragically, Lee didn't live long enough to wear it. Like all stage entertainers, Lee faced his share of hecklers, I've never seen anyone handle them better. If his patter was interrupted, he'd walk to the stage apron, his toothy smile never faltering. Hey, who's running things? He'd ask. You or me? If the interruption continued, he'd put on his Jewish mother routine, scolding, Don't be a kvetch. If that didn't end the problem, Lee would raise the third finger on one hand and, still grinning, look directly at the heckler, asking, How do you like the ring on this finger? By then, the audience would be roaring with laughter and ready to lynch anyone who interrupted the act again. Lee would get them laughing even harder by saying, Oops, I really didn't mean to do that. He could do no wrong on stage. He made ten or more costume changes during a regular performance. Acts such as the Chinese acrobats, Barclay Shaw and his puppets, or the ballet folklorico kept audiences amused while they waited to see what outrageous outfit Lee would wear next. He'd come to refer to his million-dollar wardrobe as a very expensive joke. Although sometimes I suspect he thought the joke was on him. I'm sure he had no idea what would happen on the night when he wore that set of white tails at the Hollywood Bowl. The next thing he knew, he traveled with 54 trunks full of costumes and a full-time employee to care for them. Lee was justifiably proud of his ability to pick outstanding performers to be part of his show. He felt particularly proud of having introduced Barbara Streisand to Las Vegas. Streisand had just done I Can Get It For You Wholesale on Broadway, but according to Lee, her reputation hadn't traveled beyond the greater New York area back then. In the early 60s, Barbara had yet to achieve the celebrity and glamour of her later Hollywood years. Lee described her as an average-looking girl given to wearing high-necked drab dresses. But she had the voice of an angel, he said, the first time I heard it, I got goosebumps. He brought her to Vegas as part of his act. When the hotel's entertainment director saw her rehearsing, he complained to Lee, What the hell will our audiences make of a girl with a big nose and a neckline up to her chin? Lee just laughed. They don't know what to make of me either, and it hasn't hurt me a bit. After seeing Barbara on stage, Baron Hilton came to Lee in a fury. I want that girl out, he said. Hilton was a powerful man, accustomed to having his way, but he'd more than met his match in Lee. If she goes, I go too, Lee said quietly. Hilton, not wanting to lose his most popular headliner, backed down. Lee's instincts were dead right. Vegas audiences fell in love with Barbara's magical voice. <laughs> 
Her later glamour was just frosting on a very talented cake. After the Vegas appearance, Lee took her to the Sahara Tahoe. While she was performing there, she got the offer to star in Funny Girl on Broadway. The rest is show business history. Many performers who never worked with Lee were influenced by what he did on stage. In the 50s, when Elvis Presley made his first Vegas appearance, which laid a giant goose egg, he sought Lee's guidance. Lee gave him a gold lame jacket, the start of Elvis's glittering wardrobe, and some succinct advice on how to woo an audience. Don't be a phony, he warned the young Elvis. The audience can spot a phony in a minute. You've got to give 110% every time you go on stage. Although Lee didn't understand rock and roll, had no feel for it, really, he was a staunch Elvis supporter. Then, near the end of Elvis's life, Lee told me he went to see an Elvis performance and came home close to tears. Elvis was just going through the motions, Lee remembered sadly. That would never be said about Lee. Sick or well, happy or sad, he put his personal problems behind him the minute he stepped on stage. He gave everything he had to every audience he faced. Whether Lee appeared with the Young Americans or Streisand or the Rockettes, the heart of the act was always Lee himself. In the 1960s, his Riviera show was called Come As You Are. The production revolved around the fictionalized story of Lee's life, narrated by the then-famous horror film hostess, Vampira. It was a crazy concept, but Lee loved it. The wilder the better, he used to say. Over the years, he made entrances flying across stage in sequined hot pants, looking like a superannuated cherub, or popping out of an enormous replica of a Fabergé egg while dressed as a bunny. Lee went for laughs and seemed to delight in poking fun at himself. When the act called for him to dance with the Rockettes' famous high-stepping chorus line, he said, I'm no good, but I've got guts. He and Ray Arnett created a new act every few years, but certain tried-and-true shticks never varied. Flashing diamonds on every finger, he'd tell an audience to look all you like. After all, you bought them. At the end of the act, he'd walk to center stage, grin confidingly and say, I've had so much fun tonight that honestly I'm ashamed to take the money. Following a perfectly timed pause worthy of Jack Benny, he'd add, but I will. It was pure corn, but he made it sound fresh night after night. It's almost impossible to describe his genius to people who never saw him perform. He closed every show by leaving the stage, walking between the tables and singing, I'll be seeing you. People would line up to shake his hand, and I was always surprised by the many macho types who waited patiently until Lee got to them. Time and again, the men would say, My wife made me come, and I thought I'd hate your act. But you're the greatest. Lee never used security people or police to build a wall between himself and his fans. I often saw a crowd surge toward him and felt certain he'd be trampled, only to hear his voice saying, If you'll all back off, I'll shake hands with everyone. Unlike many other celebrities... He didn't want to be protected by a phalanx of police or security when he dealt with the public. He claimed the protectors would cause more panicked pushing, shoving, and general pandemonium than the most eager fan. Lee spent ten minutes after each show talking to people, signing autographs, as he called it, paying his dues. By the time I joined the act, Lee was coming dangerously close to revealing his homosexuality on stage. Wearing one of his most glittering costumes, he'd comment, This is one of my sport coats. But don't ask me what sport. Part of his magic was the ability to make people like him, to accept him no matter how he looked or what he did. His middle-aged conservative fans lapped up his performances like contented cats drinking cream. Lee was the only major entertainer I can think of whose entire career depended on live performances. He never understood Streisand's refusal to appear in nightclubs after she became a superstar. He'd done television and made lots of records. He even made a few movies. But he lived for his stage act. You can't tell what an audience is thinking when you do television or work in a recording studio, he explained. He might have added that you can't feel their adoration either. The approval of a room full of living, breathing, applauding fans reaffirmed Lee's sense of worth. His psyche demanded a steady diet of that kind of feedback. He loved what he did, and he felt so serenely confident of his ability as an entertainer 
But he never exhibited a trace of apprehension or stage fright, even when things went wrong. He was unflappable, the eye of calm in the center of the backstage hurricane. One night, disaster seemed inevitable. After an absence of several years, Lee was debuting a new act at the Riviera Hotel. Everyone associated with him wanted him to have a dynamite opening, a new set, the most expensive and elaborate of Lee's entire career, was being trucked up from Los Angeles, where it had been built to order. But the truck ran into a snowstorm on its way. One hour before the eight o'clock curtain, the set had yet to arrive. Pandemonium reigned backstage. Arnett and Travis paced the floor, more nervous than expectant fathers, wondering how in the world to handle the sudden emergency. When they couldn't delay any longer, they went to Lee's dressing room to advise him of the impending disaster. To their amazement, Lee was so relaxed that he'd fallen sound asleep. After being told he had no set and hence no new act, Lee just smiled and said, Don't worry, it will all work out. He'd started his career with a piano and not much more, and he wasn't afraid of opening that night the same way. And the audience gave him an enthusiastic reception after being told of the problem. Once Lee knew a particular line or joke worked, he refused to change it, no matter how much pressure the club owners applied. Some of them complained bitterly that he had been using the same opener for years. I'll change it when I stop filling rooms, he said. The act worked, night after night and year after year. The costumes and the props and the sets changed, but the patter grew by accretion like a pearl. Lee built his own career without the backing of a powerful agent, studio, or network. He knew better than anyone else, what audiences wanted from him. He listened to people like Ray Arnett or Seymour Heller, but in the final analysis, he made all his own decisions. Lee told me that he and Heller were often at loggerheads because Heller wanted him to work more than 32 weeks a year. Heller, who by contract got 10% off the top of every dollar Lee earned, would present Lee with a proposed schedule, often one that would have kept Lee working steadily for months. Lee would glance at it, say, I'll do this, this, and this, forget the rest, and toss it back. If Heller argued, Lee just said, I'm not going to be the richest piano player in the grave. Lee alone decided when and where he'd perform, which contract to sign, how much he wanted to be paid. He'd sit through a business meeting while Heller explained the pros and cons of a particular deal. When Heller finished, Lee would spell out the terms he was willing to consider, if the terms Lee insisted on didn't bear any relationship to the contract under discussion, that was Heller's problem. Lee didn't negotiate. He knew his worth. By the early 1970s, he was getting a minimum of $150,000 a week. Net dollars were always more important to him than working conditions. He played the same stadium in Hershey, Pennsylvania three nights every year despite a dressing room that consisted of a locker room redolent of dirty jocks and gym socks, where the only privacy was supplied by army blankets hanging on a clothesline. Many other stars would have refused to do a show under such conditions. Lee never balked at things like that. But his normally placid demeanor exploded into anger when he was opposed. He was the boss and his people knew it. Heaven help those who didn't. I remember an associate director on The Tonight Show who made the mistake of treating Lee like your average garden-variety celebrity, instead of the uncrowned king of the world of live entertainment. First, she asked Lee to submit a list of subjects he wanted to discuss with Johnny Carson, and then she told Lee what time she wanted him to show up for the taping. Lee reacted to her somewhat cavalier treatment by failing to submit the required list and by arriving at the studio two hours late. Another time, when Lee was making an appearance on Dean Martin's show, he flatly refused to participate in a skit that called for him to take a pie in the face. The writers had to be called in to do some frantic rewriting in order to satisfy Lee. He wasn't being deliberately difficult. He simply knew what he wanted. He didn't mind having people laugh with him, but he'd be damned if he'd put himself in a position where they'd be laughing at him, and he wasn't used to taking no for an answer. That extended to our relationship, and in particular to the way many of his employees reacted to me. When, after we'd been together six months, 
I mentioned that I was still having trouble with some of his staff. Lee called a meeting. The most important person in my life, he told his people, is Scott. His job is to make me smile, to keep me happy. And I did, for five more years. Twelve. I wish I'd known Lee before he became a success. Once his stage act had been defined and polished, once he'd achieved international stardom, his drive, energy, and ambition had no way of venting themselves. The man was a bundle of energy with no place to go. He didn't know how to sit still, relax, and smell the roses, even during his vacations. Lee was a workaholic who seemed to lack the inner resources to keep himself amused and happy. His loyal staff protected him from having to deal with the real world. In fact, Lee lived a sheltered existence, free from almost every worry. He didn't read the papers, was blissfully ignorant and uncaring when it came to politics or events of national concern. He avoided confrontational situations, using Seymour Hillard to act for him. When we went home after a show, Lee locked himself away from the outside world. No one came to see us without express prior invitation. His need for privacy bordered on paranoia. Even members of his inner circle, old and trusted friends like Ray Arnett, were restricted to a limited number of invitations to Lee's home each year. After Lee's performances ended and we went home, the world narrowed down to just Lee and me. Christmas was the sole exception to his demand for total privacy. He began planning and talking about the holiday at the end of October, and from then on it took on gigantic proportions. Few children, even those young enough to believe in Santa Claus, looked forward to the holiday more than he did. Although he considered himself to be a religious man, the spiritual aspects of the season paled in importance before the opportunity to spend. Christmas gave him the perfect opportunity to exercise the power he had over the lives of people who worked for him, to reward or punish each individual by the size of the gifts he gave to each. By late October, he was hard at work making lists of everything he wanted to buy, literally hundreds of items he planned to purchase personally. At one time, he'd used the services of a professional shopper and gift wrapper to send out countless gifts to people in the industry. But that deprived him of the fun of doing it himself. The most dedicated shopper would quail in the face of the task Lee set for himself. But he was no ordinary shopper. He transformed shopping into a quasi-religious experience, a reinforcement of his power. He reveled in spending, gloried in it, devoted a large part of his waking time and energy to it. Early in November of our first year together, Lee asked me to pick up a check for $25,000 at Lucille Cunningham's office. The money wasn't intended for gifts, just decorations. When I remarked that it seemed like an enormous amount to spend on tinsel and baubles, Lee didn't blink an eye. He made it clear that the $25,000 would go for decorations and incidentals in the Palm Springs and Vegas houses, not for any of the presents he planned to buy. I knew firsthand how generous Lee could be. But nothing I'd experienced in our life together up to that point prepared me for the next few weeks. Lucille Cunningham and I had already established an antagonistic relationship, so I wasn't surprised when she balked at the size of my request. You're just like all the rest, she scolded. Out for what you can get. You just tell Lee he can't afford to give you that much money. I couldn't help grinning. Lucille knew very well that no one told Lee anything. But she felt duty-bound to try to control his spending, and since she knew he wouldn't listen to her, she tried to do it through me. It's not for me, I explained, knowing she probably wouldn't believe me. Lee wants it for Christmas, and you know how he is, Lucille. She fussed and fumed, but like the rest of us, Lucille didn't dare say no to a Liberace request. I had the check in my wallet as I drove back home. Lee gave me carte blanche when it came to readying the houses for the holidays. That money was mine to spend any way I liked, as long as I turned Shirley Street and the Cloisters into a Liberace-style fantasy. I wanted to surprise him, to give him the most beautiful holiday house he'd ever seen. So I asked him to move out while I went to work. For anyone else, that might have been an inconvenience. But he still owned his previous Vegas home, 
called the White House for its pristine white exterior and interior. The White House was fully furnished, ready for immediate occupancy. Lee packed a bag and left, leaving me to my job. He kept an entire truckload of decorations from previous Christmases in storage, and I had them delivered. Meanwhile, I packed up most of the objet d'art that cluttered the rooms, emptied the casino of all the gambling equipment, and put everything in temporary storage. I felt like one of Santa's helpers who had stumbled across a treasure trove as I began opening the stored crates of ornaments. There were thousands of lights, a dozen reindeer, a life-size nativity scene complete with wise men, shepherds, and a zoo full of animals. Fourteen carat gold lame cloths to put under everything. A king's ransom of goodies, plus all the things I bought. For the next five days, I did nothing but unpack and put up decorations, going without sleep a couple of nights to get everything done in time for Lee's scheduled return. That year, we had 18 huge Christmas trees, more than 350 red and white poinsettias, Table decorations, greenery, wreaths, enough candles, lights, and tinsel to stock a department store. Getting everything done required a huge expenditure of effort and unbelievable expense. I spent every one of those $25,000. Looking back, it's hard to imagine doing all that for one 58-year-old man's pleasure. It was fun at first, but by the end of the third day of doing nothing but putting up decorations... I decided that Lee and I were out of our minds. The experience of readying the Vegas house, plus the one in Palm Springs, was pretty far removed from the spirit of peace on earth, goodwill toward men. It was damn hard work. Putting up one tree is great, especially when children are around to help. But the only children who would see the house that year were Seymour Hellers, and they celebrated Hanukkah rather than Christmas. Putting up 18 trees is pure torture. It's like being forced to eat one rich meal after another, hour after hour, day after day. The senses soon reach saturation and the mind goes into overload. Lee, however, wouldn't have had it any other way. Too much of a good thing is wonderful. Whether it was sex, cars, pianos, costumes, clothes, or Christmas, he lived by those words, overindulging his way through life. When he came back, I'd successfully transformed the Vegas house into a winter fairyland. Outside in the glaring Nevada sunshine, it might have been 70 degrees, but inside, Santa reigned supreme. Lee walked through the rooms, ooing and eyeing over everything. Fabulous, he exclaimed gleefully. It looks fabulous. Heaven help anyone who suggested a booking during the holiday season. Lee would have been outraged. He had too much to do, shopping for dozens of people and wrapping every single gift himself. By the time he finished, hundreds of presents surrounded the bases of the 18 trees. As a foster kid, I often dreamed of the kind of Christmas I would have liked. But nothing in my wildest fantasies prepared me for Lee's extravaganza. The holiday culminated in a traditional Christmas Eve dinner, followed by the ritual opening of all those gifts... The people Lee worked with, from the stagehands on up, were invited. It was the only time during the year that most of them saw him socially. A few old friends from his early days in show business were invited, too. We were a motley crew at best. Joel Strote, Lee's attorney, and Seymour Heller, his manager, didn't strike me as the sort of men who enjoyed mingling with the stage crew. Lee's family came, too. George and his wife Dora flew down from Sacramento... Angie and her husband flew in from God knows where, and Francis came from Palm Springs. To my surprise, Lee's sister and brother were not accompanied by their children, nor were Rudy's widow and children present. With the exception of Seymour Heller's wife and children, family groups were conspicuously absent from the party. That first Christmas, George and Angie seemed somewhat estranged. As I watched them treating one another with a formal politeness, I remembered the story Lee had told me about their past problems. Fortunately, Frances seemed unaware of the strain between her children. Despite Lee's constant complaining about his mother, I thought she was a delightful lady. Outspoken, full of life, and fun to be with. 
The tension between family members was only one of the undercurrents evident when the people closest to Lee gathered in one room. They were always jockeying for position, fighting to get close to him, to get the smile or nod that meant he approved of what they said or did. But despite the stress and strain, Lee made the party work. He had such a good time that everyone else followed his lead. Gladys had prepared a traditional turkey and trimmings dinner for 30 to 40 people, and it was wonderful. That first Christmas, I half expected Lee to sit down at the piano and play carols, even though I'd never seen him play at home before. But he didn't offer and no one asked. Sing-alongs were part of Lee's act, not his holiday traditions. The two months of preparation had been aimed at the moment when we began opening presents. From beginning to end, it took four or five hours. Each gift had to be admired, held up, or passed around. Most of the time, Lee's generosity had no parallel. Arnett, Heller, and Beau Ayers, Lee's conductor, received extravagant gifts. Angie, Francis, and Dora received furs and jewelry. More practical gifts like color televisions and VCRs were given to lesser employees. Torn paper and trashed ribbons piled high while Lee presided over the ceremony like a jovial genie. That first year, he gave me two diamond rings, a black mink coat, a white mink jacket, a coyote and leather coat, a sapphire cross, a gold watch wreathed in diamonds, lots of clothes, a Maltese puppy named Georgie, a schnauzer named Precious, and a basset named Lulu. I was overwhelmed inundated with expensive goodies and barking untrained dogs. There was no adequate way to thank him. I have been told by people who were with Lee for decades that his generosity to me was unparalleled in his relationships with other lovers. But Gladys, who'd worked even harder than I to make the party a success, got a token gift. I didn't understand Lee's hit-and-miss generosity then, and I don't now. The pattern repeated year after year, and Gladys was usually one of the people he shortchanged. One Christmas, I put my foot down and insisted that he give her a fur coat and some jewelry that had been slated to go to Angie, who already had more furs and jewels than she could possibly use. Lee's spending was equally erratic when it came to charity. He was the perfect example of the old saying, charity begins at home. I don't recall him giving to any nonprofit organizations other than the one he later established himself. The almost obscene scope of our holiday extravaganzas took place in stark contrast to the fact that Lee's generosity rarely reached the genuinely needy. It bothers me now, but that first Christmas, when I was just 18, I threw myself into the orgasmic event without a care. Gifts were piled so high in front of me that I couldn't see over them. That holiday seemed to open a floodgate of spending that never closed during the years we lived together. Lee continued to give me valuable presents, often for no reason at all. Spoiled rotten you are, he exclaimed gleefully. And I love it. Lee was constantly giving me jewelry and clothes. And enough never seemed to be enough. I soon learned to copy his wildly flamboyant style. But no matter how far I went, I could never top Lee. I still feel sort of awed embarrassment remembering a typical incident. We just closed at Warwick, Rhode Island and five of us had to catch a plane to New York for a meeting at Radio City Music Hall. Since Lee felt the way I dressed reflected on him, I wore a navy blue suit, a white shirt, and 14, count them, 14 gold chains around my neck. But Lee took one look at me and said, I think you need one more. He delayed our departure long enough to buy another one, which he placed around my neck with immense satisfaction. I looked more like Mr. T than a model for gentlemen's quarterly. But Lee was enormously pleased with my appearance. I've never figured out why he bought me so many things. Of course, he could afford it. And he cared for me and wanted me to stay with him. But that doesn't fully explain the hundreds of thousands of dollars he spent on me. Once, when we were out walking, I admired a passing car. A few days later, Lee had a custom Camaro delivered to the Hilton. When I asked why he'd purchased the car, he said it was because I'd admired a similar one. Without thinking, I told him the car I'd actually been admiring had been a Rolls Royce. Within a few days, a ribbon-wrapped Rolls was waiting for me on the floor of the Hilton Casino. If Lee was trying to buy my love and loyalty, 
He was wasting his money. I was deeply committed to him because he cared for me as no one ever had before. 13. To my knowledge, Lee never invested in stocks or bonds or other aspects of the financial marketplace. He bought, decorated, and sold houses instead with an extravagant disregard for cost. When we began living together, he owned the property on Herald Way, the cloisters in Palm Springs, a condominium in Malibu, and the two houses in Las Vegas. Lee loved to invest in real estate for two reasons. First, property was tangible, something he could see, touch, live in. Real estate, particularly luxurious real estate, held a powerful appeal for the man who'd grown up in that drab tiny house in West Allis. Second, and perhaps even more important, buying houses gave Lee an excuse for exercising his dual passion for decorating and for spending vast amounts of money. Every time Lee bought another piece of property, there'd be unhappy rumbles from his business manager, Jay Trowman, and his accountant, Lucille Cunningham. But he shrugged aside all their well-meant advice. If I'd have listened to people like that, he said, instead of following my instincts, I'd have gone broke years ago. After bringing Gladys to Vegas, Lee put the Harold Way house on the market and sold it for $1.2 million dollars. He gleefully confessed to having paid $80,000 for the house when he bought it years before. With the large amount of capital thus freed, he wasted no time buying a house in Tahoe. We were appearing in Sparks, Nevada at John Osquaga's Nugget, an annual booking, when the deal closed. Every night after the last show, we'd pile into the car at two in the morning. I'd play chauffeur and drive the 60 miles back to the house while Lee slept. Once we got home, we'd both catch a few hours sleep getting up before noon to go shopping. Lee wanted to finish the decorating before his six-week Sparks engagement ended. Spending money was a fever in his blood while he worked on the house, a desire even more compelling than sexual hunger. He just couldn't stop buying things. After four weeks on that schedule, I gave up, totally exhausted, and told Lee he'd have to shop by himself. He was shocked at my refusal to continue with what he considered a fun project. Not even appearing on stage energized him the way spending money did. He was 40 years my senior, but he had incredible energy. He often hired decorators, only to fire them because he enjoyed doing the job himself. Lee knew what he wanted. Excess, excess, excess. After becoming successful enough to indulge himself, he jumped from project to project. Our years together marked the zenith of his spending. His next major purchase was a five-story building on Beverly Boulevard in Beverly Hills. He renovated and refurbished the first four floors of offices, installing huge aquariums to add the luxurious Liberace touch. The parking lot was repaved and glamorized by the addition of large trees and planters. But Lee hadn't bought the building because he wanted to rent out office space. He intended to turn the entire fifth floor of the building into a penthouse for his personal use and he only had a four-week hiatus from work to do it. We spent the entire time shopping, spending more than $100,000 a week for the entire four weeks in a mind-blowing demonstration of his personal wealth. The fifth floor, which had been a disaster, was transformed into a magnificent private hideaway. The sad thing is that Lee rarely spent time in his various homes after he finished decorating them. We occupied the Tahoe house only when he worked there, three to six weeks a year. The penthouse was a terrific place, but Lee treated it more like a hotel suite than a home, rarely living in it for more than a few days at a time. Lee also purchased four condominiums in Vegas, just for the sheer pleasure of decorating them. Later, in the wonderful private world of Liberace, he told his readers that he'd been commissioned to decorate those condominiums as models. Like so many of the statements he made in the book, it wasn't so. Lee bought those condos and decorated them for the fun of it. Of all the properties purchased during our relationship, his favorite was my little house in Vegas. We spent a great deal of our free time there. When Lee and I had been together for a year, he said he wanted me to start investing my money. For Lee, that meant buying a house. At the time, I couldn't afford much. I bought a little tract house at 933 Laramore Street in Las Vegas. Six rooms crammed into 1,400 square feet, and Lee helped me make the down payment in exchange for my giving him a third mortgage on the property. I made all the mortgage payments from day one, 
but that proved to be a drop in the bucket compared to what we actually spent on the house. Lee insisted on redoing it in his customary opulent style. I paid $58,000 for the property, but we ran up a $40,000 bill for structural changes, $25,000 on landscaping, which included using cranes to lift huge palm trees over the roof so they could be planted by the new jacuzzi in the back, and $40,000 on furniture. When the job was done, Lee loved that house more than any of his mansions and took more satisfaction in it. When we were in Vegas, we'd go back to his mansion after a show, pick up the meal that Gladys had prepared for us, and head straight for my place. No one, other than Gladys, knew where we were, and she was the only person in Lee's entourage to have my phone number. Lee seemed to enjoy playing hooky from the demands of his fame. In my home, he played at being a housefrau. He cooked and cleaned and fussed over me like a bride. My best, happiest memories of him come from the time we spent there. Pushing a vacuum, dusting furniture, fixing lasagna. Lee and I pretended to be equals, but the pretense never lasted long. Sitting in the jacuzzi as the sun came up, he'd say, I wonder what the poor people are doing. The longer Lee and I were together, the more I understood his sense of isolation, his need to have a confidant and full-time companion. From Heller to Francis to Angie to George, he felt that everyone's motives were suspect because everyone had something to gain from their association with him. For years, his wealth had sequestered him, made him suspicious of even the best-intentioned offers of friendship. Before long, I found myself caught in the same trap. Suddenly, I was Mr. Popularity pursued by my own relatives and even some of my former foster families. They all wanted to meet Liberace, be invited to his homes, go for a ride in his limos, hit him up for a loan or a job. One afternoon, one of my sisters telephoned and in the course of our regrettable conversation, suggested that I get Lee to buy her a diamond ring. Little did she realize that Lee, who monitored many of my phone calls, was listening on another phone. After I said goodbye, he came racing into the room. Now you know what I've been going through for 30 years, he said triumphantly. See, you can't trust anyone. They all want something. Lee exercised complete control over my life. He told me what to wear, where to go, who to see once I got there. There were times when he acted more like a father than a lover. Once, when we were in Fort Lauderdale... He had the hotel manager move us to a new suite because he couldn't see the beach where I planned to sit in the sun for an hour that afternoon. Another time, Seymour Heller offered me a ride from Las Vegas to Los Angeles so I could take care of some personal business. When Lee heard about the offer, he came unglued. He didn't want me out of his sight for a minute. We did everything together. Fortunately, it was fun most of the time. There were times when I resented and rebelled against his smothering affection, when I felt low, shopping usually cheered me up. Although Lee didn't raise the salary I reported to the IRS, he was always giving me cash, a thousand dollars or more every week. I used some of it to buy him surprise presents. His favorite surprise was getting a new dog. By the time Lee and I parted, we had accumulated a grand total of 26. At first, we had a mixed pack of large and small breeds, but one horrible day they got into a fight and some of the big ones actually killed a couple of the smaller ones. Lee almost fainted. We'd never anticipated anything like that happening. After that, we kept small dogs only. Poodles, mixed breeds. Lee's favorites, seven or eight of them, slept with us every night, and Lee never complained when one of them had an accident, even though there were days when the house, and especially our bedroom, smelled like a kennel. One of Lee's favorite projects, established before I appeared on the scene, was the foundation he'd created to give college scholarships to needy music students. The foundation and St. Francis Hospital, where Lee had made his miraculous recovery from uremic poisoning, were Lee's only charities. He did one benefit show a year for St. Francis, but the scholarships were a continual project. Lee chose which colleges to endow, and the colleges chose the recipients of the scholarships, Lee, who always liked to champion underdogs, didn't give his money to well-known music schools like Juilliard. 
Instead, he chose small schools where he knew his contributions would reach students whose lives could be altered dramatically by the gift. The foundation was an ambitious project and could have been a considerable drain on Lee's resources, but he never permitted the situation to get out of hand. In Lee's 40th anniversary souvenir pamphlet, he boasted of the foundation having given $50,000 to schools across the country. Since Lee was the foundation, and he personally earned millions of dollars a year, that wasn't much to brag about. I think he would have been appalled if someone had suggested that he could afford to be as generous as Paul Newman, who gives all profits from his food company to charity. Although Lee didn't plan to equal Newman's phenomenal generosity, Lee was deeply interested in the foundation. He wanted it to be self-sustaining, so it could go on providing scholarships whether he continued to work or not. Early in our association, he got a brainstorm. He'd create a non-profit organization to open and run a Liberace museum, and the funds generated by the museum could support the scholarships. At the time, the only other entertainer to have his own museum was Roy Rogers. Lee's plan sounded audacious, but knowing the loyalty of his fans, I didn't doubt it would succeed. To those faithful followers who saw him perform year after year, Lee had an appeal that transcended ordinary star power. His charismatic quality can better be compared to the television evangelists than to his own show business peers. Lee was the Jim Baker of the nightclub circuit, with his own devoted group of fans. They gave, gave, gave. And Lee spent, spent, spent. He took full advantage of their devotion by setting up Liberace concession booths wherever he appeared. The booths sold his albums, autographed pictures, Liberace piano books, jewelry pillboxes, anything Lee and Seymour Heller thought the public would buy. If no one else in the entourage was available to man those booths, Heller would preside over them himself. Lee used to call the income produced by his concessions funny money. The only funny thing about it was that fans so willingly shelled out so much cash for those trinkets, and that Lee told me he never reported the income although he boasted of banking up to $20,000 a week in funny money. If people would stand in line to buy Liberace souvenirs, he saw no reason why they wouldn't stand in line to tour a museum where his most treasured possessions would be on display. He'd had a small prototype museum in the house on Herald Way, but the neighbors complained about it being a commercial enterprise, and in any case, Herald Way was too out of the way to attract a steady flow of tourists. Vegas, on the other hand, doesn't attract much else. Lee decided it would be the ideal place to create a monument to his own career. A six-month gestation period passed from the idea's conception to the actual opening of the museum. During that time, Lee and I devoted every free minute to turning his dream into a reality. Scotty Moore, Lee's real estate agent, found a suitable property on Tropicana Avenue, an old shopping center that held about 15 small stores. The architecture was pseudo-Spanish, the size right, the location excellent. Lee paid in the neighborhood of $3 million for the property. That sounds like a fortune, but since Lee was donating the land and building to his own nonprofit organization, he'd given himself a terrific tax write-off. Another half million went to renovating the space. In addition to the museum, it would also hold Liberace's antique store to be replaced in a few years by Liberace's restaurant, the Tivoli Gardens, and a Liberace gift shop that sold the same things as the concession booths. When the renovation was well underway, Lee and I went through all his houses systematically, picking items to put in the museum. First, of course, there were costumes he could no longer wear. Then there were paste replicas of his enormously valuable jewelry collection. Over the years, the jewelry, like the pianos and the cars, had become Liberace trademarks. I can still hear him saying, when asked how he could play the piano with so many huge rings on his fingers, very well indeed. Many of Lee's cars, including the piano key station wagon, the patriotically custom-painted red, white, and blue rolls, the auburn he used in the act, his first limousine, his 57 T-Bird, would also be on display in the museum. Many of the things Lee had been unable to part with, though they crowded even his vast homes, were slated for the museum. We stayed up three nights straight just going through the Vegas house, and the task had to be repeated in all the other homes. Rare antiques were slated for permanent exhibit 
as well as some of Lee's more unusual pianos. He had one that had reputedly belonged to Chopin, and another that was supposed to have been played by Liszt, which Lee said gave him goosebumps to play. The value of each of the items was duly noted and added to the figure to be written off Lee's taxes. Lee was in seventh heaven all the while. He'd managed to have his cake and eat it too. First, his ego got a maximum stroking by the creation of a museum devoted to him. Second, he was actually going to help a lot of gifted kids. Third, he'd finally found a place for all the stuff he'd been accumulating. Fourth, as the vans began taking major items from each of his properties, the gaping holes they left created a need to buy new things. Fifth, but far from last, Lee had the tax shelter to end all tax shelters. He asked George and his wife Dora to move down from Sacramento to manage the museum. George seemed like the natural choice. Despite their past problems, he was family, and Lee, with his Polish-Italian roots, still believed in family, even if he complained that they were an occasional pain in the neck. George had also been very closely associated with Lee's early career, and many fans still asked Lee, how's your brother George? Now when someone asked, Lee could tell them to visit George in the museum. Managing the museum was a golden opportunity for George, who was getting old for life on the road. He accepted the offer and Lee bought him a condominium in Vegas. The Liberace family was getting closer, geographically if not emotionally. Although the brothers didn't socialize often, I had a chance to get to know George better. He was a gentle, kind, considerate, unassuming man, the kind of man Lee might have been if he hadn't been so driven. The museum proved to be a smashing success from the day its doors opened. It generated an enormous income for those scholarships. At the end of the first year, Lee told me it had earned a million dollars. Although I suspect he greatly exaggerated the actual figure, no one had expected the museum to do as well as it had. From Lee's standpoint, the unexpectedly large profit should rightly have been his to control, to spend as he saw fit. Of course, he would have given a portion of the money to his foundation, but so much? Did he need to be that generous? It began to eat away at him. The thought of all that money he'd allowed to slip out of his control. Even the tax shelter he'd created failed to cheer him. He made up his mind to dismantle the nonprofit organization so he could take advantage of the money-making machine he'd created. But this time, Lee wasn't slated to have his way. He told me that disbanding the nonprofit organization proved impossible. Today, Lee's foundation appears to be a major beneficiary of a will that Lee signed just a few weeks prior to his death. In the future, dozens of students will complete their arts education because Lee miscalculated the depth and breadth of his fans' loving support. 14. When I first moved in with Lee, I was both ignorant and relatively innocent. I didn't understand his lifestyle, his need for secrecy. I'd grown up thinking being a homosexual was neither good nor bad, but simply a fact of life. By contrast, Lee was determined to keep his sexual preferences from his fans. It was only after living in the entertainment community and learning something of the history of gay performers that I began to understand Lee, to understand Lee's life and therefore my own. The listener has to know what I learned. First of all, the entertainment industry is like no other business in the world. People who work in movies or on television are often extraordinarily attractive, creative, and talented. They are also the most foul-mouthed group I know. Imagine a business where new projects are commonly referred to as a piece of shit, and you'll get the idea. In Hollywood's early days, before the Hayes Censorship Office helped the community clean up its act, the town was known as a sinkhole, fueled as much by booze, sex, and drugs, is by talent. The industry has struggled to overcome that reputation ever since, with varying degrees of success. Despite the best efforts of studios, agents, and most stars, memorable scandals have been easier to create than memorable films, and many of those scandals have involved stories of homosexuality. In a homophobic society like ours, being gay is often traumatic, but being secretly gay while burdened with public celebrity can be sheer hell. It was a hell Lee knew all too well, and he was just one of a long line of celebrity closet gays. In 1922, the first of Hollywood's homosexual scandals 
the murder of handsome, successful William Desmond Taylor rocked the film industry. The noted director's corpse was discovered by his houseboy, Henry Peavy, when Peavy came to work early one morning. Taylor had been shot to death in his Alvarado Street bungalow. Peavy, a very discreet employee, chose to call Paramount Studios, where Taylor worked, before he notified the police. The executives at Paramount had a good reason to be concerned. They knew that Taylor was gay, a fact they didn't want to have revealed in a murder trial. George Hopkins, a set director and Paramount employee who was an intimate of Taylor's, made a hurried trip to the Taylor bungalow, where he was met by people from the studio. Working in haste, they picked up photographs and letters that might have helped the police to identify the murderer, simply because the letters and photographs attested to Taylor's homosexuality. Apparently, the studio thought an unsolved murder would cause less of a scandal than public revelations about the dead man's sexual preference. Like Liberace, most of Taylor's closest associates, men such as Peavy and Hopkins, were homosexual, part of Taylor's network of friends who supplied him with a steady stream of young male bedmates. Like Liberace, Taylor also used titles such as houseboy or chauffeur for his companions. The loyal Peavy had been jailed once for soliciting boys intended for his master's bed. But when the studio applied political pressure on the newspapers and the police, these scandalous events were successfully hidden from the general public. Taylor's murder was destined to go unsolved for decades. To my surprise, after being told this story, I learned that the mystery of Taylor's death was solved in a book called A Cast of Killers. If the happenings of the 20s sound bizarre... Consider the actions of Liberace's people, who helped Lee to conceal his homosexuality from his fans. While Lee lay dying of AIDS, his personal physician announced to the press and public that Lee's illness resulted from a watermelon diet and anemia. To this day, his people cling to that story. When the end came, the same loyal doctor wrote a death certificate listing, in layman's terms, heart failure as the cause of Lee's death. Their protection continues to obscure the truth even now. On May 12, 1987, as reported in the Orange County Register, the estate of Liberace filed a claim for unspecified damages against Riverside County, California, alleging that Liberace's reputation had been damaged when the county coroner gave a nationally televised press conference at which he revealed the presence of the AIDS virus in Lee's body. Apparently, Joel Strode, Lee's attorney, is still trying to suppress information about the true cause of Lee's death. I can only assume Strote is misguided by loyalty. The homophobic society that breeds extreme behavior on the part of gays and their friends has existed for a long time. Lee once spoke of Oscar Wilde, as clever a playwright as ever wrote in the English language. Wilde, who lived in the second half of the 19th century, had a flair for drawing attention to himself a passion for flamboyant dress that bears comparison to Lee's. The public tolerated Wilde's eccentricities until he flaunted his affair with a male member of the aristocracy. Then Wilde was put on trial for breaking the law that prohibited homosexual relationships. The Wilde trial took place in the same London where Lee defended his own reputation in a court of law. And in Lee's opinion, the 50 years that had passed since Wilde's trial had done nothing to soften or temper public dislike of homosexuals. I hope that someday, one of Hollywood's super macho studs, at the peak of his career, will have the courage to step forward and say, I'm gay. If his career survives the controversy that is sure to follow, the world and the entertainment industry will be forever changed for the better. But until that someday comes... Men like Lee will pay a heavy price for a sexual preference they cannot control. Rock Hudson, who conveyed a superb sense of masculine self-assurance, would have been the ideal candidate for such a heroic deed. But Hudson was determined, up until a few weeks before his death, to keep his homosexuality a secret. Like Lee, Hudson dated starlets in public while romancing a string of male companions in private. He even married at the age of 35, when it seemed one of the tabloids was on the brink of publishing a story about his homosexuality. As his life drew to a close, he took a possible chance with the health of his friends rather than admit to having contracted AIDS. The entertainment industry has always offered a mixed blessing to homosexuals.
On the one hand, gay men and lesbians are drawn to the freedom of artistic expression they find on stage or in film, but those who achieve success feel forced to walk a tightrope of secrecy to prevent public revelations about their sexuality from ruining their careers. Lee and I used to speculate about the percentage of homosexuals in the business. We estimated that 20 to 25 percent of stage, screen, television, and nightclub performers are either gay or bisexual. That figure can safely be doubled when the estimate includes the people who work behind the scenes. From the lowliest extra on up through the ranks of dancers, chorus boys, musicians, makeup artists, set designers and decorators, writers, directors, and producers, the entertainment industry is home to gays, lesbians, and bisexuals. And even those who claim to be 100% heterosexual have often experimented just for kicks. But the still powerful studios and their co-conspirators, the radio and television networks, manage to protect the people they have under contract. Those homosexuals who are not under contract are often less fortunate. Lee sometimes wondered if all the speculation and rumors about his sexuality kept him from having the number of television specials that his obvious success and popularity should have commanded. In view of the morals clauses that used to be part of network and studio contracts, he may have been right. The entertainment industry is a two-faced business. It thrives on scandal, and yet its members fear being penalized if their private lives explode into the tabloids. Lee knew all too well the risks he ran and the price he paid for his choice of bedmates. No less an international star than Burt Reynolds saw his career take a nosedive because of completely unfounded rumors that he had AIDS. The only way Reynolds could quiet these stories was to simply outlive their credibility. But his career has yet to recover its former luster. People who are greedy to hear and believe the very worst about public figures will get all the genuine bad news they can handle in the future. AIDS is, by any measure, a new plague. And no one, gay or heterosexual, is immune to its scourge. To date, as of this writing, aside from Hudson and Liberace, two major clothing designers, one U.S. congressman, and a major Broadway choreographer-director have died from AIDS. The Hollywood Reporter's obituary column is full of the names of behind-the-scenes workers who have died from the disease. I hate to hear people speculate on who might be the next victim. Despite the dangers and risks, the modern entertainment industry has a history of employing gay-leading men. Friends in the business have told me of Ramon Novaro, a darkly handsome Latin lover of the silent screen, who was a well-known member of the homosexual community. Like William Desmond Taylor, Navarro was murdered. Rumor has it that his killer was an angry one-night stand. When the actor's body was discovered, an Art Deco sculpture had been obscenely inserted in his rectum. In view of the ugly deaths of men such as Taylor and Navarro, and the open persecution of gays, the gay bashing that is a weekly occurrence in Hollywood and other cities, it's not surprising that gay male stars go to great lengths to conceal their sexual identity. Like Liberace, many of the past superstars have been, are currently being, exposed as gay or bisexual. It's ironic that Lee, who so feared having his sexuality discovered, enjoyed gossiping about the sexuality of other stars. Errol Flynn, one of the most macho swashbucklers in the history of film, a womanizer who faced a scandalous paternity suit in his lifetime, was described as a bisexual in a recent book about him. Tyrone Power, who often competed with Flynn for roles, competes with him now for revelations about a supposedly bisexual lifestyle. There is even talk that Clark Gable, one of the most masculine men in film history, may have had a homosexual affair early in his career. The industry has also attracted a number of lesbians, some of whom went on to become famous household names. Mae West, one of Filmland's most sensuous female stars under contract at Paramount in the 1930s, was plagued by rumors and gossip relating to her sexuality. At one time, there were stories that she was actually a man. West, who built her career by flouting accepted standards, was one of Lee's few close celebrity friends. In public and in private, she surrounded herself with good-looking men. What the public has never known is that most of those handsome males were well-known members of the gay community. Why West preferred the constant company of gay men has never been explained. 
The sexual identity of a handsome young man she helped up the ladder of stardom is also a topic of current speculation. It was to Cary Grant, in one of his first screen appearances, that West uttered the memorable line, Come up and see me sometime. Revelations in a recently published tabloid expose Grant as a supposed bisexual who had affairs with multimillionaire Howard Hughes, as well as fellow actor and long-term roommate Randolph Scott. Grant was a Liberace fan who came to Lee's shows once or twice a year and always came backstage to visit. On one of these occasions, I saw Grant with a good-looking, obviously gay male companion. But there was nothing in their behavior to indicate that they were lovers. As for Grant, the secrets of his sexual identity were buried with him. If he was gay, he certainly had good reason to conceal it. Stage actress and star Tallulah Bankhead was another Paramount star in the 30s. She was that rare, rogue personality who broke all the rules and seemed to get away with it. One lady reporter, who relentlessly pressed Bankhead for sexually incriminating statements, found to her dismay that the actress could claw when cornered. After a particularly nasty interview session, Bankhead insisted on escorting the frustrated reporter to the elevator. When the doors whooshed open, in the full hearing of an elevator crowded with onlookers, she said in her unforgettable husky tones, Thank you so much for coming over, darling. But I never kiss on the first date. That biting wit served the actress well. The gossip about her sexual preference may have cost her any hope of getting the coveted female role of the 30s, that of Scarlett O'Hara, for which Bankhead was quickly rejected. Greta Garbo remains one of the greatest stars produced by MGM's efficient star machine, and one of the biggest enigmas. The personal discovery of Louis B. Mayer, the classically beautiful Garbo was the daughter of a Swedish laborer. Despite her heavily accented English, her career successfully spanned silent movies and talkies. Garbo left a brilliant career behind when she left Hollywood for good. In Grand Hotel, she uttered her most famous line, I want to be alone. Garbo, who never married, seemed to spend her life alone. But there were constant rumors about her romantic relationships, and the Hollywood gay community always regarded her as one of their own. A recently published book, written by Joan Crawford's daughter, disclosed the bisexual behavior of the screen goddess. The star is described in Mommy Dearest, written by her daughter Christina, as having a clandestine affair with one of their household maids. Fortunately, the story wasn't made public during Crawford's long reign as a leading lady. A famous English actor suffered a similar fate in the 1950s when Hollywood gossips questioned his sexuality. Michael Wilding was a distinguished-looking, mild-mannered man who had been married to Elizabeth Taylor and seemed to inherit the kind of roles earlier played by Walter Pidgeon. But rumors about Wilding's alleged affair with another actor cooled studio ardor for his services. Coincidentally, Pidgeon is also regarded by the gay community as one of their own. Perhaps the most successful homosexual in the history of Hollywood was a small, ambitious brunette whose short, straight bangs and horn-rimmed glasses became well-known trademarks. Edith Head was a costume designer with a genius for self-promotion that helped her win eight Oscars. Head's lesbianism was so well-known that for years Hollywood insiders joked, Head gives good gowns. The list of names of homosexuals and bisexuals who have found a home in the entertainment industry could go on and on. But those whose careers aren't the focus of public attention seldom suffer the trauma that plagues homosexual stars. George Hopkins, the set decorator who was given the task of getting rid of evidence in the William Desmond Taylor case, went on to work in the industry for many years, winning three Oscars along the way. Noted hairdressers and makeup artists were also able to enjoy long and lucrative employment despite being gay, free of the fears that plagued the stars. The 1950s are memorable for the number of gays who achieved stardom or became celebrities. Aside from Liberace and Rock Hudson, Sal Mineo and Montgomery Clift made their mark during that decade. But their brief careers ended tragically. Clift took his own life while Mineo was murdered in West Hollywood in a manner reminiscent of the Navarro killing. Jim Neighbors of Gomer Pyle fame is another performer who climbed the precarious path to success during the 50s.
But his brief fling with stardom didn't survive the rumors of his marriage to Rock Hudson. Rumors that had been started by a group of gay men who, as a joke, sent out invitations to the event. One of the phony invitations fell into the hands of a columnist, and from there the story took wing. Hudson was already a superstar, so handsome that women everywhere adored him, while Neighbors was a funny-looking guy whose comic talent didn't seem half so humorous in the light of his supposed sexual preference. After stories of the so-called wedding circulated nationwide, Neighbors' ratings dropped and Gomer Pyle was cancelled. But Hudson, protected by a powerful studio and his equally powerful appearance of unassailable masculinity, survived the mess. According to Lee, throughout the 50s, Henry Wilson was a prime mover on the gay scene, as well as one of the most successful agents in the business, a man with an uncanny knack for picking future stars. Wilson was also famous for giving his protégés catchy names like Rock or Tab or Troy. Many of the young men he represented were gay. But Hollywood gossip suggests that those who were not suffered because of their association with Wilson. Of all Wilson's promising young clients, Hudson alone achieved lasting success. Lee was terribly aware of the history of gay entertainers, and of the danger he faced if his private life should be exposed to intense public scrutiny. Keeping this secret placed an almost intolerable burden on him and on our relationship. It explained his need for seclusion, his almost paranoid desire to hold the entire world at arm's length. I understood what motivated Lee's behavior, but understanding it didn't make it easier to live with. At 58 or 59, Lee had done all the partying he wanted to do. He was more than content to stay home when he wasn't working. But staying home all the time doesn't cut it for an 18 or 19-year-old. When I complained, Lee called me a kvetch and said he intended to keep his private life private. The only time his reserve broke down was when he drank, and then it was Nelly bar the door, anything goes. Lee was the world's happiest, most amorous drunk. Since he almost always drank too much when we flew home at the end of a tour... I often found myself having to fend off his advances on the plane. We'd make a pact that I would treat him like a superstar in public, but that was a little hard to do when he got high and started patting my leg and calling me boober in front of some wide-eyed stewardess. It was embarrassing and humiliating. I'm not ashamed of being gay, but I hated being groped in public. At the same time, I couldn't help laughing. We must have been quite a sight. 15. When we first met, I mistakenly assumed that Lee's enormous, luxurious homes would be the sites of fabulous parties. He even boasted that the cloister's huge garages, with their finished walls and floors, could easily be converted to a ballroom. But after that first brunch where Black and I were his guests, Lee didn't entertain again for months, not until the Christmas dinner. Our socializing consisted of talking to salespeople in the various stores we frequented. When Lee wasn't working, he hated getting dressed and often spent the entire day unshaven, lounging around the house in an old terry cloth robe so worn it was full of holes. Since he demanded my constant companionship, I felt completely cut off from the rest of the world. Lee preferred living like a hermit. We might as well have been stranded on another planet instead of living just blocks from the glittering 24-hour-a-day world that is Vegas. It didn't make sense. Lee knew everyone, all the celebrities, and everyone knew him. Other stars frequently came to see his show, yet he rarely returned the courtesy. Away from the stage, the two of us existed in a vacuum. All that isolation drove me up a wall. I'm gregarious by nature, and the lack of social contact made me very unhappy. Lee and I operated by different rules. He felt compelled to keep secrets, to isolate himself from society. I'd spent my short lifetime reaching out to other people, looking for friends to replace the family I didn't have. No matter how much I cared for and about Lee, I couldn't accept the solitude of his lifestyle. Since Lee wouldn't let me go out without him, I began asking, then nagging him to go out with me. At first, Lee felt hurt. Any other boy in the world would be thrilled to be in your position, he said. No matter how much I give you, you're never satisfied. At first, Lee responded to my desire for some kind of social life by buying more presents for me in the mistaken belief that happiness 
mine or anyone else's, could be bought and paid for. Lee couldn't have been more wrong. I didn't want another fur coat or another car. I just wanted to go out at night, talk to people, and have some fun. It took a while, but Lee finally relented and agreed to go see an occasional show when he wasn't working. On one of our early outings, we went to see Jim Neighbors and Dom DeLuise, who were appearing at the Riviera. During the show, DeLuise had the maitre d' deliver a note to our table. It was an invitation to join him for dinner after the performance. Lee barely knew DeLuise, so the invitation came as a surprise, but I urged Lee to accept. When the show ended, we drove to DeLuise's rented house. Even from the outside, the noise level told me a party was in full swing. DeLuise was in rare form that night a funny, genial host who kept plying us with drinks. When we finally went to the dinner table, Lee was seated at one end, next to a very good-looking guy, and DeLuise asked me to sit next to him. That proved to be one of the most uncomfortable meals I've ever had. I kept on watching Lee at the other end of the table, wondering if he was attracted to his handsome companion and feeling a little jealous. Larry Gatlin appeared in Las Vegas once or twice a year, and Lee and I met him a number of times. One night, when one of my female cousins happened to be in town for a visit, Gatlin called and asked me if I'd like to come up to a party in his hotel suite. Lee wasn't around, and thinking I'd really impress my cousin, I accepted at once. Fifteen minutes later, we stood outside of the suite as I knocked on the door. Who's there? Gatlin called out. It's me, Scott, I replied. The door flew open, and there stood Gatlin. Over his shoulder, I could see a room full of men and women, half-clothed and partying like crazy. I think I said something stupid like, thanks, but no thanks, before pulling my cousin away from the incredible scene. I must say she was impressed. To this day, I have no idea why Gatlin called me that particular night, unless it was because he assumed that my being gay ensured my participation in such a party. Years later, I felt sorry after I was told that Gatlin had been going through a difficult period in his life that drugs and liquor had been in control of his behavior. I soon learned that it's a common show business problem. Sudden stardom can be hard to handle. Once people can afford anything they want, they tend to think they can do anything they want. Their confusion is aggravated by the fact that fans tend to put them up on pedestals. A few celebrities begin to believe that they can do no wrong, and so they start experimenting with sex, booze, drugs, whatever turns them on. Fortunately, most stars manage to keep their feet firmly planted on the ground. One of the nicest, and a regular on the Vegas scene, is the flamboyant performer Charo. Despite her image as a sexy Latin bombshell, Charo is a real earth mother. Her accent is real, her figure mind-blowing. The rest of her off-the-wall image is carefully cultivated. In private, Charo loves animals, children, cooking, taking care of her family. The first time she came to the house, she got down on the floor while our dog stumbled around her, and there she remained for the rest of her visit. Charo, who is happily married to a man as nice as she, became a regular guest in our home and never failed to attend my birthday parties. Her first husband, Xavier Cougat, also visited with us when he was in town. Lee and Cougat were close in age and enjoyed reminiscing about their early struggles. Unfortunately, their talks about a past I wasn't old enough to remember always reminded me of the age difference separating Lee and me. Although it took a considerable shove to get Lee out of the house and into a social setting, he seemed to have a good time once a party was underway. But he always worked at being Liberace when we were out. He never relaxed, not even at informal gatherings with other celebrities. I think that's why I like Charo so much. She was a very genuine person. Debbie Reynolds is another down-to-earth, warm, funny lady. She often worked the same hotel as Lee, and we came to know her quite well. Although Debbie was several years my senior, she had a vitality and sense of the ridiculous that made her seem more like my peer. Reynolds had used Seymour Heller as her agent in the past, and I could feel the ice in the air whenever the two of them were in the same room. According to Lee, she'd had a disagreement with Heller, and the one thing she didn't like about working in the same hotel with Lee was the fact that it meant seeing so much of Heller. One night after the show, she flew into Lee's dressing room in a rage over a recent encounter with Heller, insisting that Lee tell Heller to stay away from her. Debbie's open emotion was refreshing compared to the behind-the-scenes maneuvering Lee employed when he was upset or angry with one of his people.
I wasn't particularly fond of Heller myself, so I sympathized with her. I didn't blame her for being upset. Poor Lee felt torn between the two of them. Since Heller was present at almost all of Lee's performances, there seemed to be no way to keep Debbie from running into him. Lee, who avoided confrontations, had no intention of discussing Debbie's problems with Heller. But he liked Debbie and didn't want to lose her friendship. So he decided to play peacemaker and invited Debbie to come home with us to talk things over. The Shirley Street house was lit like a Christmas tree when we arrived and looking its glittering best. As Debbie walked through the mammoth front door, she threw her arms wide, turned to us and said, I used to live like this before my husbands took all my money. From what she told us of her unhappy marriages, she had every reason to be bitter. But Debbie is the kind of person who will always triumph over adversity by laughing. That night, after her initial anger cooled, she kicked off her shoes, sat on the kitchen floor, and drank wine with us until sunrise. It turned out to be one of those rare evenings when Lee forgot about being Liberace the legend and allowed himself to be Lee the man. Tony Orlando was another of my favorite Vegas entertainers. Tony was battling drug addiction in those days, a problem he has since conquered. He also suffered from manic depression, a disease I knew firsthand from my experiences with my mother. Nevertheless, we spent most of our time laughing. Everything seemed funny when we were together. After seeing Tony's act a couple of times, I told him he looked very pale on stage. Since his mental and physical problems were well known, the last thing he wanted to do was look sick on stage. It made a terrible impression on his audiences. Tony asked me to come over to his house one night to show him how I did my stage makeup. We laughed through the entire process. But Tony reluctantly agreed that the pancake base and blusher I used on him improved his appearance. When I began putting on eyeliner, he got hysterical and made me stop. That's where I draw the line, he said. Tony made no bones about being heterosexual, but that didn't stop us from being friends. Lee was jealous at first, as he would have been jealous of anyone I was close to. But he came to enjoy having Tony and his wife Elaine visit the house. They were our guests one Christmas, along with their son. Having a little kid around made that a special holiday. Show business is full of nice people like Tony, Debbie, and Charo. And once Lee got used to the idea, he began to enjoy mingling with them on a social basis. One night, when we were working the Sahara Tahoe and living at the Tahoe house, we had two of our most memorable dinner guests. Ray Arnett, who'd been a Broadway hoofer in his youth, had a wide show business acquaintanceship. Shirley McLean had worked with Ray, and when she brought her act to Tahoe, Ray suggested that Lee invite her to dinner. Bella Obzug, who was visiting Shirley, came too. There were six of us at the table that night. Lee, Bella, Ray, me, Shirley, and her current lover. Since Shirley chose not to name her lover in her book Dancing in the Light, I'll just say he was a well-known director, born and raised in Russia, but successful in the States too. As it happened so often before, people we barely knew, like Shirley and her lover, seemed to have no qualms about being upfront about their relationship with us. The two of them were obviously crazy about each other. In fact, they could hardly keep their hands off one another. At first, Shirley and Ray dominated the conversation, reminiscing about their early days on Broadway. But then, as it was bound to with Bella at the table, the talk turned to politics. Bella was an outspoken activist, an articulate liberal devoted to causes like women's liberation. She and Shirley expressed their views enthusiastically, talking on and on while Lee got quieter and quieter until his eyes began to glaze. I remember that Shirley and Bella were quite agitated about a recent incident involving police brutality, but by then I was so afraid that Lee might actually fall asleep at the table that I don't recall where or when the police brutality was supposed to have taken place. Politics, world affairs, local problems meant nothing to Lee. At the time, there was a musician strike at the Sahara Tahoe that he had completely ignored. I don't think Lee would have noticed it unless a picketing musician had thrown himself under our car. Lee was amazed when Bella refused to be his guest at our show because she didn't want to cross a picket line. Bella and her concerns were totally alien to him, a part of the wider world that Lee chose to ignore. But later, he enjoyed telling other celebrities about having his good friend, the fabulous Shirley MacLaine, as his dinner guest.
Loretta Lynn, the legendary star of country music, was the exact opposite of outspoken McLean and Obzug. Lynn was quiet, soft-spoken. In person, she seemed like a shadow of the vibrant performer she became on stage. I first met Lynn in Gary, Indiana, while we were doing a talk show, and we hit it off immediately. From then on, Loretta and I made a point of getting together whenever we happened to be in the same city. I liked her a lot, but she concealed a great deal of unhappiness beneath her public facade. Shortly after the release of the hit film Coal Miner's Daughter, based on Loretta's life, she returned to Las Vegas, where she was to appear at the Riviera. The night I planned to see her show, she came down with Vegas throat, caused by working in the smoke-filled showrooms, and had to cancel her appearance. But she invited me up to her suite for a visit. Her secretary let me in and showed me to the bedroom, where Loretta lay propped up on a pile of pillows. We talked for a while, and then I brought up the film, for which Sissy Spacek was to win an Academy Award. Don't believe everything you see in that picture, Loretta told me. When I asked her what she meant, she put a finger over her mouth, hushing me. I don't want anyone to hear what we're saying, she whispered, although the only other person in the suite was her secretary. You see, she added, I can't trust anyone. There are spies everywhere. Loretta looked and sounded like a frightened woman as she talked about her life, her real life, rather than the fable dished up on the screen. According to Loretta, she had an unhappy marriage and was actually afraid of her husband. She sounded very sad as she ended our conversation by saying, I'm an old-fashioned country girl, and I believe a woman should stay with her man until she dies. At one time or other, every major star seemed to show up in Vegas. Lee introduced me to another living legend, Lena Horne, when she appeared there. If ever Lee looked up to a woman, it was Lena. She's been through so much adversity and prejudice and triumphed over it all, he said. That every time I see her up on stage wowing an audience, I get goosebumps. Before we went to see her perform, he bought her a magnificent Japanese kimono as a welcoming gift. Then he was so anxious to see her that he decided to visit her dressing room before the first show. That's considered a taboo in Vegas. Most stars don't want to be forced into sociability when they're getting ready to go on stage. Not Lena. When Lee knocked on her dressing room door, she opened it herself. I barely recognized her without makeup. What the hell are you two guys doing here? She asked, smiling warmly, as she invited us into the room. She seemed serenely unconcerned about her appearance, adding, You all come in here and keep me company, and you can see how gorgeous I'm going to make myself. I couldn't have been more surprised. The stars I knew, including Lee had too much ego to let anyone watch them apply their stage makeup. Lena made a terrific impression on me. She was a real sweetheart. Lee's gift delighted her. I just love things like this, she said, promising to wear the kimono during her performance that night. Lena began to get ready for the show, chatting easily with Lee and me the entire time. I remember thinking how lucky I was to have met her, and I owed it all to Lee. He'd given me everything except friends my own age, a gap that would soon be filled by Andrea McArdle and Michael Jackson. 16. I always thought of Gladys Lucky as more than a housekeeper. She became a friend, a good one. On the days when Lee and I were home, I used to enjoy watching television with her in her room. Her comments on the programs were down-to-earth and often perceptive, it was in Gladys's room one evening in 1979 that I first saw Andrea McArdle on a variety show. Gladys and I were immediately impressed by the young Broadway star. The minute I heard McArdle sing, I knew she'd be right for Lee's act. Fortunately, he was nearby and I managed to get him to Gladys's room while McArdle was still on the screen. Lee, with that big voice, she'd be perfect for Vegas, I said enthusiastically. He was putting together a new act, and that meant finding new talent. I was eager to help. A few weeks earlier, I'd watched the Radio City Music Hall Rockettes and suggested they might be a terrific addition to the new act. There'd been talk about disbanding the Rockettes, and their many outraged fans had risen up in their defense. The Rockettes, famous for their high-kicking precision dance numbers, were an American institution, like apple pie and baseball. Lee had instantly agreed with the idea of making them a part of his Vegas show. 
By employing the Rockettes, he'd have a chance to help preserve the act, and at the same time, benefit from all the publicity generated by their proposed disbanding. Lee couldn't resist the combination. Terrific idea, Scott, he complimented me. We'll bring New York to Las Vegas. It was the kind of high concept he favored. After he heard McArdle sing, his response was equally enthusiastic. I think we should audition her as soon as possible, he said. Seymour Heller was given the job of making all the arrangements. Lee worked with young people whenever he could, in part because audiences were always sympathetic and predisposed to like young performers. In the early days, he'd done his chopsticks routine with children from the audience. After the act got too big and too elaborate to keep that up, Lee started to feature young performers instead. McArdle would be part of a long line that included such acts as the Little Angels of Korea, the Young Americans, the teenage banjo-playing Scotty Plummer, and the amazing under-ten-year-old acrobat David Lee. They were a formidably talented group of young people and very popular with the Vegas audiences. In the future, he would pluck his next protege from their midst. McArdle flew to Vegas for her audition, and she was even more impressive on stage, in person, than she'd been on television. She'd learned her craft on Broadway, where she was an enormous hit in the long-running Annie before growing too old for the part. Those months in a hit show had given her tremendous confidence, a sure knowledge of stagecraft, the ability to project. Her big voice easily filled the cavernous Hilton showroom and barely needed amplification. She seemed completely at ease, both on stage and in the adult world of Vegas. Lee took to her immediately, but at first I had reservations about Miss McArdle. She was too self-assured to suit me. Confident, almost arrogant, she came on like a superstar instead of the 16-year-old girl she really was. In the case of many performers, that cocky attitude covers the real fear that success and fame are all too fleeting. The next year, someone else will be the public's darling. Many big stars suffer painful feelings of inferiority and prolonged bouts of self-doubt. McArdle was not among that group. She was good, and she knew it. But I soon discovered that a very sweet girl hid behind the confident performer. A girl who was as normal a 16-year-old as anyone could have been under the circumstances. Andrea McArdle appeared with Liberace in both our Vegas and Tahoe shows for the next year and a half. No longer a child, and not yet a woman, she was at an awkward stage when it came to being cast in movies or stage plays. But she was the perfect foil for Lee's act. Over the months, Andrea and I became good friends. Lee was very fond of her, and got along well with her mother, who proved to be a watchful guardian and chaperone. They spent quite a bit of time at our homes in both Vegas and Tahoe. Andrea and I were thrown together constantly. I guess it was inevitable that we'd get crushes on each other. But Lee and Mrs. McArdle seemed oblivious of our growing attraction. I guess Andrea's mother thought she was safe with me because I was involved with Lee. As for Lee, he was so thoroughly homosexual that it simply never occurred to him that I might be attracted to a girl. Not even one as lively, talented, and dynamic as Andrea. Occasionally, we managed to escape our elders' watchful eyes and have a wonderful time together. One crazy, fun-filled day, Andrea and I, along with a few of the young Americans, a singing group composed of talented youngsters, Christy McNichol and Lee's niece, Ina Liberace, decided to go skiing in the nearby mountains. At the time, Christy was starring in Family, a successful television series. She and Ina, the daughter of Liberace's deceased brother, Rudolph, were good friends. I was chosen as the chauffeur for our skiing expedition. Everyone piled into my van early in the morning, laughing and carrying on like kids playing hooky. Andrea sat next to me. Christy, Ina, and the young Americans filled up the rest of the seats. We talked and listened to music, our kind of music, rock and roll, all the way up the mountain. It was a rare chance for me to feel and act as young as I really was. When we reached our destination and tumbled from the van, a wild snowball fight broke out. As it turned out, everyone could ski but me. I watched, thoroughly impressed, as Christy, Andrea, and the rest shushed down the slopes, while I could barely stand upright on the flats.
Then it didn't matter how many times I fell or how much my friends laughed at me. I felt free for the first time in years. That one carefree day made me realize that no matter how much Lee meant to me, I was constantly on guard around him, measuring every word, every gesture, for its potential effect on him. I lived and worked not in an adult world, but in a completely middle-aged one, with a man who could swiftly change from indulgent parent to ardent lover to outraged tyrant. In the mountains on that one day, I was able to forget everything except enjoying myself. But the real world intruded soon enough. My van broke down on the way home, and I had to call Lee's driver to pick us up in the limousine. The group's laughter was a great deal more subdued as we returned to Vegas and our adult responsibilities. Stardom can be very hard on youngsters. Andrea, who'd cut her eye teeth in the theater, handled it very well. The next performer I met seemed oppressed and burdened by a career that had begun during his childhood and grown to mammoth proportions. By the time Michael Jackson called the house one day in 1979... I'd grown used to stars appearing on our doorstep, but no young adult could be blasé about talking to Michael Jackson. Strangely enough, Michael Jackson and I had attended the same elementary school for a brief time. I attended Gardner Elementary during a period in my life when I was being shuffled from one foster home to another so fast that I don't recall the name of the family I lived with. But I do remember Michael, who was already famous, in the class just ahead of mine. I'd been his fan ever since. When Michael telephoned, he told Lee how much he'd always admired his work. Lee was very flattered and invited Michael out to the house for lunch. He told Gladys to fix something special, and she decided Kentucky Fried Chicken would be an appropriate dish to serve rock and roll superstar. Michael wasn't in the house more than a few minutes when he said, Oh, by the way, I guess I should have warned you that I'm a vegetarian. I wish I'd had a camera because the look on Lee's face was priceless as the delicious aroma of fried chicken wafted throughout the house. He jumped up and fled to the kitchen, leaving me to entertain a somewhat startled Michael. When Lee returned a few minutes later, he had regained control, both over the menu and himself. Then, playing the good host, he offered Michael a drink. Do you have any fruit juice? Michael asked. I never touch liquor. Lee's eyebrows rose. A rock and roll star who didn't eat meat or drink liquor? At that point, I don't think he could have been more surprised if Michael had announced that he was a practicing celibate, which we later learned he was, because his religion forbade premarital sex. Lee, who gloried in all the pleasures of the flesh, eating, drinking, and lots of sex, thought Michael was a very weird guy. But from then on, Lee enjoyed referring to Michael, who was one of the biggest superstars in the world, as my very dear friend. In reality, it was Michael and I who became dear friends. At the time of his first visit, Michael was redoing his home in Encino, so Lee gave him the grand tour of the Shirley Street house. At last, the two entertainers had found an interest in common, decorating. Michael fell in love with some bronzes we had and wanted to know where he could get them. Like many of Lee's most treasured possessions, Lee loved those bronzes as much for the bargain price he'd paid for them as for their beauty. They'd come from a place in Los Angeles on Robertson Boulevard, a shop where Lee and I were well known and got a substantial discount. You'll get them cheaper if I send Scott with you to buy them, he told Michael. I was always annoyed when Lee, who made millions of dollars a year, went to great lengths to save a few hundred. But I never learned if saving a buck was important to Michael, too. That afternoon, Lee was so determined to do Michael a favor that he arranged to have me drive into L.A., pick up Michael, and buy the bronzes with a check written by Liberace so that Michael would get the biggest possible break on the price. It seemed like a tremendously elaborate scheme to save a few hundred dollars, since Michael undoubtedly considered that kind of money to be petty change. But I didn't object because it meant I would have a chance to get to know Michael better. It wasn't easy. He turned out to be the shyest person I'd ever met. I had a hard time reconciling the soft-spoken, almost withdrawn young man wearing his habitual faded blue jeans, baseball cap, and $2 t-shirt 
with the gyrating, sequin-gloved performer the world knew. Offstage, Michael was often forced to hide within a protective cocoon created by his security people. His undistinguished dress and dark glasses were a poor disguise that failed to fool the avid Jackson fans who pursued him everywhere. He never went anywhere without Bill Bray, his head of security, by his side. But it would have taken a full-time army to give Michael the kind of protection he needed. He bore the burden of his fame quietly, but anyone could see that it was almost intolerable. Lee and I saw Michael and his sister Janet off and on over the next few months. When they were in Vegas, they came over to our house to swim because they couldn't relax around a pool in public, not even at a posh Vegas hotel, without being mobbed. But it was in London, where Lee was making another appearance at the Palladium, that I came to know Michael well. Before every show, Lee had me walk the house to get an idea of the size and mood of the audience. One afternoon, as I walked the Palladium's aisles before a matinee, I saw a single darker face in the midst of all those pale English complexions. The owner of the face jumped up from his front row center seat and calling my name waved at me frantically. It was Michael. Neither Lee nor I had had any idea that he was in town, let alone that he would be in the audience that day. Michael, who had come to England to do an album with Paul McCartney, was feeling lonely and anxious to see a familiar face from home. For the next few weeks, we saw each other every day. We talked about music, show business, his passion for cars, which I shared, as well as his love for animals. Just a year apart in age, we seemed to have a great deal in common. To my surprise, Lee didn't object to the many hours I spent away from him and Michael's company. I think even he was in awe of Michael's giant fame. I still spent my evenings with Lee, but during the daylight hours, Michael and I roamed through London. I went to the recording studio to watch him work, and when he was finished, we went to all the usual tourist places. At Buckingham Palace, we decided to try to shatter the impressively uniformed guard's perfect composure. Those guards are supposed to stand in front of the gates hour after hour without giving any indication that they are aware of the steady stream of tourists who come to stare at them and take their pictures. Considering his fame, Michael didn't think he'd have any trouble getting their attention. When they failed to respond to his overtures, he approached one of the guards and put a pound note on the end of his bayonet. The guard didn't even blink. So Michael put another pound note on the bayonet and stepped back to see if he would get any reaction. Again, the guard didn't blink. Then, with increasingly frenzied glee, Michael put more and more pound notes on the bayonet until it was completely covered with money. I was laughing so hard by then that I almost fell down. Several hundred pounds later, I managed to tell the guard that all Michael wanted was to have his picture taken with. Although it is against all the regulations, the guard finally obliged, stripping his bayonet of the hundreds of pounds he'd collected at the same time. The rest of the day was equally crazy. Thinking he'd be safe from being mobbed in laid-back London, Michael had gone out with just one bodyguard, Bill Bray. We'd toured Buckingham Palace and gone to the Tower of London to see the crown jewels without having any trouble. But our luck came to an end when we got to Piccadilly Circus, where we planned to do a little shopping. Michael was recognized, and a few fans began to follow us. At first, it wasn't too bad. They jostled and pressed close, and Bray and I managed to keep our bodies between Michael and the young people who seemed to want nothing more in this world than to touch him. But then the teenagers were joined by a noisy, aggressive group of punk rockers and all hell broke loose. We were desperately trying to flag down a cab as the crowd grew larger and more unruly. By then, all three of us were running, and it was obvious Michael would be in real danger if we didn't get him away quickly. It was a terrifying experience. The fans, who'd seemed merely curious minutes before, were now pursuing us frantically, breathing down our necks and shouting at us. Bray finally got a cab and we jumped in and pulled away, with desperate teenagers still clinging to the door handles. Three cab changes later, we'd finally shaken the last of our determined pursuers. After that ordeal, I better understood Michael's fear of people. His fame cut him off from the world, as surely as if he'd been marooned on a desert island. I'd been somewhat envious of his position, but the events in Piccadilly Circus convinced me that I wouldn't change places with Michael for anything in the world. For me, it had been a once-in-a-lifetime experience. But he faced danger from that kind of manic adoration every time he went out. 
Our final experience in London proved to be equally unpleasant and served to ring down the curtain on our friendship. Lee, Michael, and I had been invited to dine at Lord Montague's palatial mansion on the outskirts of London. Neither Michael nor I knew the nobleman, but Lee had met him several times, and we had all heard stories about him and his opulent lifestyle. As we drove out of London, all three of us were excited over the prospect of seeing Lord Montague's internationally famous collection of cars, which now boasted the addition of the great Hera collection. His home proved to be an incredible display of inherited wealth and privilege, far surpassing even the largest mansions in the United States. Lee practically drooled over the antiques, all of them authentic pieces that had been in the Montague family for generations, rather than bargains carefully purchased at flea markets, the way so many of Lee's had been. Lee's taste may not have been flawless, but he knew the real thing when he saw it. Six of us sat down to eat in the main dining hall that night at a table that would have comfortably seated 40. What the room lacked in intimacy, it more than made up for in grandeur. I was relieved when the main course turned out to be fish. Thank God, I thought to myself, Michael will be able to eat. That night, Lord Montague's companion was a young woman, the blonde, flashy, trashy type that manages to insinuate herself into high places because of her looks rather than breeding or brains. We were all seated at one end of the table, our voices echoing in the huge room, when the young woman gave Michael and me a long, appraising look. Tell me, she said in an accent that sounded more like Piccadilly than Mayfair, do you and Michael get it on? You're always together. Lee and Montague pretended not to hear. They continued talking about cars, but I could feel myself turning beet red from embarrassment and rage. Next to me, Michael shifted uncomfortably in his chair. Somehow I knew our friendship would be ruined from then on. Rumors about Michael's publicly acknowledged virginity and apparent lack of masculinity were already circulating. He couldn't take a chance on being branded as gay because of his association with gay men, no matter how innocent that association might be. I saw him a few more times after we returned to the States, but the carefree quality of our friendship had been irreparably damaged by that one thoughtless remark. I've heard that Michael is a virtual recluse today, and I can't say I blame him. 17. Lee said that age is just a state of mind. You're as old as you feel, he'd boast. And he felt very good as he began his sixth decade. When he was involved in one of his pet projects, decorating a new house, buying a car, planning a new act, playing with a new puppy. His enthusiasm and energy were absolutely contagious. He had a childlike quality that his advancing years didn't diminish. Less charming was his ability to shut out everything that displeased him. He mercilessly erased unpleasant realities from the slate of his life. If they had to be dealt with, he delegated that responsibility to Seymour Heller. One of the unpleasant realities Lee chose to ignore was the fact that he was growing older. You make me feel young, he'd say, as if he could pay me no higher compliment. Feeling young had a very high priority in his life. Looking young was equally important. One night, after taping The Tonight Show, Lee unexpectedly found himself face to face with the reality of how much he'd aged. He hadn't done television or movie work in a while, hadn't subjected himself to the camera's harsh scrutiny. That night, we were in the Carson Show green room, watching the tape of Lee's interview. Lee had done his own makeup prior to the taping, doing it exactly the way he'd been doing it for years. But the lighting on the Carson Show was not flattering. Lee looked lousy on screen, old and tired, every sag, every age line exposed by the camera's inquiring eye. I could see that it really bothered him even before he turned to me, whispering, I look like hell. Why hasn't anyone told me how old I look? I couldn't answer. Lee was Lee, so close and familiar to me that I'd long since stopped seeing him objectively. From then on, he became obsessed with his appearance and the need to repair the age lines and bags under his eyes. If Lee could have arranged for a facelift the next day, I'm sure he would have. I'd grown so used to seeing him morning, noon, and night 
and stage makeup were scrubbed clean after a shower, that I'd paid no attention to the deepening grooves on either side of his mouth or the fact that his eyelids sagged. Sure, he was jowly, but Lee had ballooned up to 250 pounds during the years we'd been together. I weighed 240 myself, the result of Lee's and Gladys's good cooking and very little exercise. It had happened so gradually that I hadn't paid attention to the way either of us looked. And after the Carson show, Lee couldn't think about anything else. I need a complete facelift, he moaned, after seeing himself on tape. Lee had already been through at least one facelift, but he chose not to use the doctor who had operated on him in the past. He couldn't seek out a new plastic surgeon the way anyone else would, by talking to a number of physicians and choosing the best doctors from a list of candidates. He didn't want anyone to know that he was about to go under the knife. It had to be kept secret, so that his public image of vitality and agelessness, so important to what he called the legend of Liberace, would remain untarnished. I didn't agree with the need for secrecy, but I knew Lee too well to argue with him. One of my best friends, a man who made all of Lee's wigs, had recently had a successful facelift, and I told Lee about it. He knew the man well and invited him to visit us in Vegas so he could see the results of the plastic surgery for himself. When my friend arrived at the house, Lee and I were impressed. The man had seemingly shed a decade or more in the months since we'd last seen him. Lee decided he need search no further for a doctor. The man who'd operated so masterly on our friend would be asked to do the surgery on Lee as well. Jack Starts was a Beverly Hills plastic surgeon with an impressive address. Lee wasted no time calling and asking Starts to fly out to Las Vegas to discuss what Lee wanted done. My first impression of Starts wasn't very good. He was a poor advertisement for his profession. His face had so many silicone implants that he looked more like a Cupid doll than a living, breathing human. He also seemed very fond of booze. Lee had offered him a drink, and the doctor had taken several in quick succession. Tragically, in view of what happened as a result of my association with Starts, I failed to see that as a potential sign of danger. We were all drinking that afternoon, and the fact that Starts had more than anyone else didn't seem worth worrying about. I would later learn that the doctor was addicted to both alcohol and drugs, but by then it would be too late. Lee told Starts that he wanted to be rid of his drooping eyelids, the heavy lines on either side of his mouth, the spider web of wrinkles that were slowly turning his face into a road map. Starts checked him over and then recommended a complete facelift with silicone implants to prevent the return of the lines around Lee's mouth. He also recommended that the facelift be followed in a few days by a deep skin peel, the doctor assured Lee that the results would be fabulous. You look younger than Scott here. Lee was thrilled by the prospect. Starts had promised that the operation would remove all the lines, sags, and wrinkles that spoiled his appearance. In addition, he said the deep skin peel would give Lee the skin of a 30-year-old. It sounded like a dream come true. Starts did quite a selling job. He'd found Lee's weakness, his fear of aging, and played on it. Both of us were impressed by the man's self-assurance, his firm conviction that he could give Lee whatever he wanted. When they finished discussing the surgery, Lee suddenly said, I want to talk to you about doing some surgery on Scott. It really took me by surprise. No way at the age of 20 did I need a facelift. Nor had Lee ever voiced any unhappiness with my appearance, other than to suggest I try to lose a little weight, a suggestion I intended to take very seriously. I'd always been Lee's blonde Adonis. His words, not mine. So the mention of plastic surgery for me came as a complete surprise. Starts turned and began to study my face. What would you like me to do with Scott? He asked. Lee jumped up and ran into another room, returning with a large oil portrait of himself. I want you to make Scott look like this, he said, propping the painting up in front of the doctor. I was so stunned that I didn't say a word. Meanwhile, Starts looked at the painting and then back at me, studying my face and then the painting with intense concentration. It was a full-face portrait of Lee and one of his favorite paintings of himself, clearly showing his prominent cheekbones, slightly arched nose, and pointy chin in the most flattering way. If anything, it also emphasized the differences between my face and his, even the most casual observer could see that Lee had a heart-shaped face, while mine was round, 
we had completely different bone structure. Yes, Start said into the room's silence. I think I can do what you want. He'll need to have a nose job, and I'll have to restructure his cheekbones and chin with silicone, but it's possible. I can make Scott look a lot like you, if that's what you want. The two of them were discussing me as if I wasn't in the room, but it didn't occur to me to object. I'd never been crazy about the way I looked and felt flattered, touched by Lee's desire to have me look like him. I didn't think he was handsome in the conventional sense, but he had an interesting face, whereas I always thought mine looked as if it had been made from Play-Doh. If Dr. Starts could give me a clearly defined bone structure like Lee's, I wasn't going to object. In any case, I knew it would do no good. Once Lee made up his mind to do something, it would take an act of Congress to prevent him from doing it. If he wanted me to have a new face, I could either go along with it or get out of his life. The choice was that simple. No one defied Lee. Not ever. Starts advised Lee that he would need to plan on spending two months at home after his facelift, but he also promised that Lee would return to work looking like a new, much younger man. They agreed to schedule the surgery in six months when Lee had a large block of free time. The whole thing had to be planned like a covert military operation because of Lee's desire to keep the entire procedure a secret from his fans. Lee and I never discussed the surgery he wanted me to have, either before or after the doctor's visit. I knew how pointless any discussion would have been, even if I had any real objections. The truth is, it never occurred to me to oppose Lee. My future was completely in his hands, as it had been from the day I accepted his offer of employment. Lee was much more than my lover, from the beginning. If he wanted me to spend the rest of my life with a new face, one that looked like his, that's exactly what I would do. The six months between our first meeting with Starts and the scheduled surgery passed quickly. Lee was busy, working very hard, and we were happy together. Occasionally, I'd be swept by waves of restlessness, concern about where my life was headed. I'd remember my dreams of being a vet and working with animals. Look at the life I had instead, however rich and luxurious, and wind up feeling disgusted with myself. My youthful dreams and plans hadn't included being a gigolo for men. When I tried to discuss my doubts and concerns about my future and where I was headed with Lee, he'd act withdrawn and hostile. Don't be a goddamn fetch, he'd say. There are thousands of boys who'd love to be in your position. Of course, he was right. Sections of Vegas and L.A. teemed with hungry-looking runaway kids. Guys who would do anything to make a connection with someone like Lee. The entertainment industry was full of struggling young performers who would give their souls to be in my place. Lee's eyes were constantly straying towards such men, and he often flirted with them outrageously. I felt threatened and insecure every time he behaved that way, and we would wind up having a fight about it. Then Lee would sulk. It wasn't easy to live with him day in and day out, but I could no longer imagine my life without him. My family and friends all told me how lucky I was, one former foster mother even said she'd never speak to me again if I screwed things up by alienating Lee in any way. There are far worse things, she told me, than being Liberace's shadow. The Scott Thorson I liked, who had initiative. The kid who'd found his own foster home with the Brummets so that he'd have a home for his own animals. That kid was getting lost as I followed wherever Lee led. Life in the fast lane had changed me, and not necessarily for the better. I'd become dependent, unable to make a major decision on my own, and admittedly spoiled. I'd met Lee at a time when other young men my age were getting out on their own. But Lee didn't want me to take responsibility for myself. He wanted unquestioning loyalty and slavish devotion, and he was willing to pay for it. All I had to do was admire something once, and it was mine. I had a closet full of clothes and furs a jewel case loaded with rings and necklaces, a Rolls Royce, a Camaro, a van, a Cadillac, an Auburn, my three dogs, a couple of horses, and my own house. And in addition, my salary had been increased. I lived in the average man's idea of paradise. But in the end, I'd pay a high price for the years I spent loving Lee.
On the day before Lee's surgery, I drove him into Los Angeles and we stayed at the penthouse overnight. The plan was for him to have his operations first because he wanted me to help with his post-operative care. Once he was on the road to full recovery, it would be my turn. The actual operations would be done in Dr. Starts' own operating room, adjacent to his offices on San Vicente Boulevard. Lee wanted his wig to remain on during the procedure and had relented only when Starts said he'd have to resign from the case if Lee forced him to operate under those circumstances. Strangely enough... Lee seemed more apprehensive about the fact that the doctor and his assistants would see his bald head than he was about going under the knife. Although I wasn't crazy about the idea, Lee insisted I be by his side during the entire procedure. Thank God the doctor had vetoed that idea, too. No way did I want to see Lee cut up, his skin sliced and stitched. However, I was permitted to stay with him while he was prepped and sedated. I even accompanied him into the operating room. Not until he was completely unconscious did I leave his side. In those days, Lee didn't like me to have large blocks of free time. He wanted to know where I was and who I was with every minute. Since he'd been told he'd be unconscious for hours, he'd arranged to have Seymour Heller keep me company. According to Lee's previous instructions, I drove to Seymour Heller's house to wait out the operation. My relationship with Heller had improved from the early days, when he'd been obviously antagonistic toward me. Heller had grudgingly accepted my place in Lee's life and now treated me with a forced friendliness that was endurable, if not enjoyable. All these people had started treating me that way after he'd insisted on it. I picked Heller up and we went to a delicatessen to eat before returning to Starts' offices. Lee's operation took seven hours, the longest seven hours of my life. By the time the doctor came into the waiting room to tell us that everything had gone well, I was convinced Lee had died. Although Starts explained that he'd just finished stitching Lee and hadn't yet bandaged him, I demanded to see him. The doctor agreed and escorted me to the room where Lee lay on the operating table, his bruised face covered with blood and tiny black sutures, looking like an accident victim. Oh my God, I said, turning to Starts. Are you sure he's all right? Positive, Starts replied. Why don't you talk to him? I walked up to Lee and bent over him. Boober Luber, I said, using my most loving nickname for him. Are you okay? Yeah, Boober, I'm fine, he responded, sounding relatively normal despite the way he looked. My stomach churned and I could feel that deli sandwich threatening to come up as I squeezed Lee's hand, trying to smile reassuringly. Hell, if this was what plastic surgery did to you, I didn't want any part of it. Lee looked like he'd been hit by a truck. Once I'd made certain he was still alive, nothing in the world could have persuaded me to stay in that room. I totally freaked out. Lee looked like a piece of bloody meat. I just couldn't imagine that anything good would result from that surgery. Starts had rented a fully furnished apartment for us under an assumed name, part of the covert operation. A couple of hours later, Lee had been bandaged and was ready to leave. The doctor had canceled all his other appointments in order to be with us during Lee's post-operation recovery period. As I pushed Lee's wheelchair across the busy street, I couldn't help thinking that Lee needn't have been so worried about his secrecy. He looked like he'd dressed up to play the invisible man, with his entire face swathed in bandages and just tiny slits to permit him to see, breathe, and eat. At that moment, he looked more like a mummy in a cheap horror film than a world-renowned entertainer. Five days after the facelift, we wheeled Lee back across the street to Starts' office for the deep skin peel. Once again, Lee emerged swathed in mummy-like bandages. After spending a final night in the apartment, we drove to Palm Springs, still accompanied by the doctor. Lee was in great pain, but even worse, those bandages made him feel horribly claustrophobic. In fact, they almost drove him out of his mind. Starts had the solution to the problem. He kept on shooting Lee full of Demerol. Meanwhile, he revealed his plan for my transformation. First, he wanted me to slim down and put me on what he euphemistically called the California diet. The diet consisted of a prescribed course of oral medication that would completely kill my desire to eat. Starts guaranteed a loss of at least 15 pounds in the four weeks preceding my own surgery. I didn't know it at the time, but the medications he gave me included pharmaceutical cocaine, 
amphetamines, and quaaludes. Before then, my drug intake had been limited to the nicotine and cigarettes, the alcohol and liquor, and an occasional aspirin. Unlike many kids of my generation, I'd never turned on to drugs. I'd tried marijuana and hadn't enjoyed it. And I'd tried Lee's amyl nitrite and hadn't liked that any better. And I had no hesitation about taking the pills that Starts described, never realizing that a medical doctor would be handing out highly addictive drugs as if they were no more than placebos. My first day on the California diet, I was in a total fog, often a little world of my own. I had a mild case of the shakes and a massive case of unreality. It seemed like a powerful effect from what I'd been told were just diet pills. As promised, I had no appetite at all. Starts spent the next few weeks drinking heavily, feeding me pills, and shooting Lee full of Demerol. The only sane person in the house, aside from the help, was Angie. She had volunteered to come and stay throughout Lee's recuperation. During the years, a few alterations had occurred in the way Lee treated his family. When I discovered that he preferred to put them up at hotels rather than let them stay with him during their visits to Vegas or Palm Springs, I'd become very upset. For God's sake, Lee, I had argued. They're your family. How can you ask them to stay in a hotel when we have so much room? I don't know if I changed Lee's way of thinking or if he was simply growing older and mellower. But he now permitted members of his family to stay in his homes. The tensions that kept the family divided for so many years had slowly dissipated. I was genuinely fond of Angie, George, and Mama Liberace, and delighted to see the Liberacis draw closer together. It made me very happy to think that I'd played some small part in making that happen. So, Angie was with us during Lee's recovery. She would play an even greater role in his life in the years to come. A few days after we arrived at the cloisters, Lee's dressings were removed. He looked awful. His face was badly swollen, the skin mottled with black and blue marks and covered with scabs from the peel. Lee refused to have anyone see him in that condition. His closest associates, Heller and Arnett, were barred from the house. For the next few weeks, while Lee healed, he and I and Angie and Starts were holed up in the cloisters. Seeing how bad Lee looked sure gave me second thoughts about my own impending operation. But in view of the fact that Lee had his heart set on having me transformed into a Liberace lookalike, it was too late to back out. The Hollywood diet was working. Although I couldn't eat at all, Starts encouraged me to drink with him. We partied all day. I was in a complete fog from the time I took my first pill in the morning until I fell into bed at night. The old Scott Thorson was beginning to emerge from the blubber I'd acquired over the last few years. I could see the growing approval in Lee's eyes every time he looked at me, and that encouraged me to continue with the regimen. Ultimately, I dropped more than the promised 15 pounds in the weeks between his surgery and mine. My goal was to lose 60. Meanwhile, Lee felt and looked better every day. First, the swelling and discoloration receded. Then, one day, he came out of the shower and all his scabs had washed away. His skin looked pink, shiny, new, and unlined. Lee could easily be taken for a man in his late 40s, rather than a 60-year-old. As far as he was concerned, Starts had worked a miracle. For the first time in years, Lee looked as good as he felt. He wasted no time ordering several new wigs, with dark hair instead of gray, to match his youthful appearance. He began seeing people again, and everyone complimented him on the way he looked. One unfortunate problem resulted from his operation. Lee's eyes had changed, in appearance and function. He couldn't close his lids completely. They remained slitted open even when he struggled to keep them shut. At night, when he slept, his eyes would open slowly, and that's the way they would stay. Even worse, they had always been one of his nicest features, but now they had a slightly sinister appearance. Lee feared that Starts had cut out too much skin while attempting to remove all the sags and bags around Lee's eyes. But Starts assured Lee the problem was temporary. He prescribed drops to keep Lee's eyes from drying out at night and told him time would take care of the rest. The drops made Lee more comfortable, and he stopped worrying. But it was odd to wake up at night and see him in bed beside me, sleeping soundly, 
his eyes half open. Odd and a little frightening. My face would soon be entrusted to the man who had done that to Lee. I'd get up in the morning determined to tell Lee that I'd changed my mind, that I didn't want to have an operation. But then I'd take that first pill and nothing seemed important afterward. I was cocooned in a dream world, all cares erased by the drugs, suspended in an exotic, pleasurable dreamland. While using drugs, I didn't think of myself as a prisoner in paradise or as Lee's shadow. In fact, I didn't think at all. When it was my turn to be driven to the doctor's office in Beverly Hills, I went happily, like the proverbial lamb to the slaughter. 18. My surgery took place about a month after Lee's. The day before... We drove back to Beverly Hills and checked into a luxurious suite at L'Hermitage, a posh hotel that caters to the super rich. That night, we went out for a fabulous dinner, Lee's first public appearance after his operation, to celebrate the way he now looked. He was equally excited about the prospect of my becoming a Liberace lookalike. Oh, Scott, he said, bubbling with enthusiasm. I can't wait to see what Starts is going to do with you. The next morning, he accompanied me to the doctor's now familiar San Vicente office. My surgery was slated to be a two-step procedure. First, starts would work on my cheekbones and chin, using silicone implants to reshape my round face into a reasonable facsimile of Lee's heart-shaped one. Five days later, I'd have the more traumatic procedure, a nose job to narrow and lengthen my nose. At the last minute, in a brief rebellious moment, I asserted myself enough to ask Starts to give me a dimple in my chin, even though Lee didn't have one. After all, it was my face. The first surgery didn't take more than an hour and a half. Lee stayed with me until the anesthetic took effect. When I woke up a few hours later, my face, with its silicone implants, looked and felt like it belonged to someone else. Late that afternoon, I returned to the hotel, where my steady intake of drugs, all prescribed by Starts, ensured I would feel no pain before the second surgery. The drugs were so powerful that I floated through the next few days, as compliant as an aging lap dog. Then back we went to Starts' office for my nose job. When it was over, I had difficulty breathing and felt horrible in general. The doctor assured me that this was perfectly normal and gave me some new pills to alleviate my anxiety. The first time I saw myself in a mirror all swollen and black and blue with horribly bloodshot eyes, I felt certain I'd made the mistake of my life. We stayed in the hotel for another week, and Starts casually doled out pain pills and his own special brand of diet pills every day, as if they were nothing more than aspirin, instead of a dangerous combination of highly addictive drugs. Several years would pass before I learned from some of his other patients that Starts was responsible for addicting many of his own clients. Before, during, and after my surgery, I took my medications without asking a single question about what they were and why he'd prescribed them. I floated in and out of reality until it was time to leave for an engagement at John Esquaga's Nugget in Sparks, Nevada. All these acquaintances had been told that he had been on vacation. Lee was elated at the prospect of appearing on stage for the first time in two months with his new youthful look. He couldn't wait to get John Asquaga's reaction. His old friend didn't disappoint him. You look terrific, Asquaga told Lee. The rest must have been just what you needed. The Nuggets stage couldn't accommodate the roles or the other elaborate props that were part of Lee's Vegas act. Basically, it was just Lee, the piano, the candelabra, and a series of costume changes. Although the Nuggets audiences didn't know anything about Lee's surgery... They reacted enthusiastically to his buoyant, vigorous performances. I didn't have to appear with him. A good thing, considering how lousy I looked. While I continued recuperating, Lee was at the top of his form, off and on stage. Exuberant, full of energy and enthusiasm. His new look had given him a new lease on life. Birthdays didn't count. Looking young was the same as being young. He couldn't have been happier. By the time the Sparks booking drew to a close, the swelling and discoloration that marred my face had faded. A totally new Scott Thorson was emerging from the postoperative trauma.
As Starts had promised, I looked like a younger Nordic version of Liberace, with high cheekbones, a narrower nose, and a pointed chin. Often, when I caught a glimpse of myself in a mirror, I'd find myself wondering who that stranger was. I literally didn't recognize myself. I remember taking time to stop and stare in fascination at the Liberace lookalike I'd become. Anyone who has ever colored their hair, worn new glasses, or transformed their appearance in any way will know what I mean when I say it takes time to get used to the change. Lee loved my metamorphosis. He'd look at me and say, A beauty, a star is born. When I looked well enough to work in the concession booths at the end of his shows, it wasn't unusual to have women come up to me and ask if I was Lee's son. Not exactly, I thought to myself. But those remarks did get us to thinking. Lee was thrilled every time someone suggested a blood kinship between us. Over the years, I'd changed from being his lover or companion to become a perfect reflection of Lee himself. Flamboyant, a little crazy. Lee had often talked about how much he would have liked to have a son. Even before my surgery, it wasn't unusual for him to say that in many ways I'd become a son to him. We felt psychically connected to each other in ways that had nothing to do with sex. When we established our relationship, Lee had talked about adopting me, but we'd never taken the trouble to find out what it would take legally. Now, the constant comments about how much I looked like Lee made him seriously consider the idea. You know, Scott, he said, no one's ever been closer to me than you. I want to make sure that you're cared for forever, no matter what happens to me. In the past, Lee had discussed giving me one of his homes, making sure that I'd always have sufficient funds to take care of myself and all the dogs in case anything happened to him. And ultimately, we signed a document guaranteeing it. He'd also named me a beneficiary in his will, but those were just pieces of paper tucked away in a file. They didn't reflect the deep emotional bond between us. Adoption would. We both recognized that other people, even those in Lee's organization, wouldn't understand our motives for wanting to formalize our status. I warned Lee that Heller and Strote would probably tell him he was making a terrible mistake, that I was after his money. It was their standard complaint when it came to me. But they would have been wrong. Dead wrong. Sure, I enjoyed Lee's money. Anyone would. Everyone associated with him benefited from his earnings in one way or another. The more Lee made, the more Heller and Strode and Trowman and Cunningham all made. They were all tied to Lee financially. He used it to control them just as he used it to control me. But his wealth was not the prime motivation in my wanting to be adopted. All through my childhood, I'd been tormented by the feelings that I didn't belong to anyone. Except maybe state welfare agencies. I wanted to be loved, to be cared for, and to give all those things in return. To belong. Adoption would have accomplished all of that and more. Fulfilling both Lee's needs and mine. Lee had a deep desire to pass his name on to someone else, while I wanted us to be legally bound so that Lee would always be part of my life. More than my lover, he was my mentor, the rock on which I built my entire existence. I was wet behind the ears when we met, untutored and unsophisticated, and I'd grown up under his guidance. My view of the world had been shaped by his interests, my opinions formed by things he'd told me. I shared his love of animals, of cooking, of decorating. Mentally and physically, following the plastic surgery, I was Lee's creature. He'd been my Pygmalion. Although it sounds crazy now, I'd begun to think of myself as an extension of Liberace, a part of him rather than a full-fledged individual. Even now, looking back, I sometimes feel that my life began the day Lee and I met and ended the day we parted. Adoption sounded like the logical culmination of everything we'd been to each other. We agreed not to tell anyone what we were contemplating. None of them, from Heller to Strode to Cunningham, had ever shown a genuine liking for me. As long as Lee loved me, they had no choice but to treat me well, but that's as far as it went. I didn't think they had my interests in mind. When it came to my possible adoption, Lee didn't think so either. We decided to consult John Mowbray, a Las Vegas attorney, about the paperwork,
Lee invited Mowbray out to the house, explaining that he wanted to keep the adoption proceedings quiet until it would have to be a matter of public record. Mowbray discussed the legal ramifications and said he'd be back in touch after drawing up the preliminary papers. I was on cloud nine after he left. Once Lee formally adopted me, I'd finally belonged to someone. In all the years of living in foster homes, no one had ever loved me the way Lee loved me. No one had offered to make me a part of their family. I wanted to belong to Lee in the eyes of the whole world and know that he belonged to me. About the time that Lee and I were looking into adoption, I asked Joel Strode, Lee's attorney and mine, to draw up my will, naming Lee as my beneficiary. Lee seemed more like family to me than my half-brothers and sisters or my mother and father. I wanted to be sure that in the event of my death, all the things I owned as a result of Lee's extraordinary generosity, my house, my cars, my furniture, my dogs, the things I'd bought with my salary, would be his. Although the will, the proposed adoption, the promises of lifetime support would all loom large in the future when Lee and I broke up, back in 1980, they seemed like nothing more than small pieces of the wonderful future we would share. Lee seemed to love the new me even more than he had the old. By the time I recovered from my surgery, I dropped over 20 pounds, a satisfying weight loss for so short a time. But I had gained more than 60 in the years Lee and I had been together. His favorite foods, pasta, fried chicken, meatloaf, gravies and sauces and breads, had turned me into a tank. Lee wanted me to really slim down, and I was only too happy to try. So I stayed on the Hollywood diet. It proved to be the mistake of a lifetime. Slowly but surely, I became addicted to the drugs starts prescribed. They helped me lose weight, alleviated my post-operative pain. But more important, they made me feel relaxed and confident. Starts renewed my prescriptions on request. Addicted to drugs himself, he seemed to have no compunctions about prescribing addictive drugs for his patients. Who knows, maybe misery loves company. There's certainly no more miserable human being than a doctor like Starts. I blame him for an addiction that would eventually make my life a hell on earth. It is absolutely no consolation that Starts was in that hell with me, and that he ultimately blew his own brains out. By the time I'd been on the California diet for six months and lost 50 pounds, I was hooked on pharmaceutical cocaine. At that time, Lee began to voice some concern about my health. You're getting too thin, he said, adding that some of his people were saying I was anorexic and emotionally unstable. I want you off that diet, he insisted. How I wish it had been that easy. I was beginning to realize how dangerous Starts' drugs were, and I wanted to stop taking them. God knows I tried hard. I could go days, sometimes weeks, without taking anything. But every time I felt unhappy or unsettled, every time Lee and I had a disagreement, every time some of his people made me aware of how much they disliked me, I'd soothe myself, help myself over the rough spots by taking drugs. And Starts didn't hesitate to go right on supplying them. Since I seldom had the cash to pay for them, I'd buy jewelry on a credit card that Lee and I shared and then turn the jewelry over to the doctor in return for prescription bottles full of pills. Lee, who had an almost uncontrollable passion for jewelry himself, never questioned those purchases the way he would have questioned me if I needed large amounts of cash. Taking pharmaceutical cocaine had one other obvious advantage. It was perfectly legal. I could take it with me when we toured and not have to worry. Starts kept me supplied for six months after I formally went off the diet. During that time, I made every effort to control my cocaine usage and to gain back a little weight. And to a great extent, I succeeded. By the time that Starts, fearing discovery, cut me off completely, my small drug need could easily be supplied by casual friends. In those days, cocaine was the drug of choice in the entertainment industry. I could purchase it from the stagehands, or even have some given to me gratis at parties where it was used openly. By now, most people are familiar with the stars who have admitted to a drug problem. Boy George, Stacy Keach, Richard Pryor, Larry Gatlin, Tony Orlando, Richard Dreyfus, Liza Minnelli, have all been courageous enough to talk about their addiction. But they are just the tip of the iceberg. 
Coke was everywhere early in the 80s. Even today, after all the negative publicity, anyone who wants cocaine can find it. And it is cheaper than ever. For two years following my first meeting with Starts, I kept my cocaine habit on a manageable level. Most of the time I could take it or leave it. Then my drug usage came to the attention of a man I shall call Mr. Y, someone I met through Lee. Y was an Easterner from the Boston area. He and Lee went way back. They'd tricked around when Lee was scrounging a living playing small East Coast clubs. Mr. Y was one of the more unsavory characters in Lee's life. He ran a gay nightclub in Hollywood and openly boasted of his underworld connections. At one time, after a much publicized gangland-style killing, Y even hid out in one of Lee's properties. One of Mr. Y's close friends, I'll call him Joe because it wouldn't be smart to use his name either, was accused of equally serious crimes. In a totally ironic twist of fate, today Joe has become a sort of mentor to me and has more than made up for things that happened in the past. But that's a whole other book. Back in the early 80s, Mr. Y and Joe must have thought of me as the perfect mark, a guy with a drug problem, and, through Lee, the means to support it. For the next year, Y, while pretending to be my friend, served as my supplier. He and Joe systematically stripped me of my savings and some of my cars, and Y introduced me to freebasing, the most dangerous form of cocaine addiction. But I'm getting ahead of my story. 19. Lee went to Europe every few years after his first appearance at the Palladium in 1956. He boasted of his enormous popularity abroad, talked of people in England standing in line to buy tickets to see his show. Despite the British critics' ongoing antipathy toward him, he told me that the Queen Mother could be listed among his most ardent fans. But I didn't pay too much attention to his bragging. Lee often exaggerated, stretching the truth to make himself look good. It was a harmless fault, one I ignored. I can still see him holding up his be-ringed hands and telling an audience that one of the rings had been a gift from Baron Hilton and one of the others a present from Queen Elizabeth. In fact, no one bought Lee jewelry. It was all custom-made for him by Bob Lindner, a Vegas jeweler who gave Lee a real deal. In exchange for the right to call himself Lee's exclusive jeweler, Lindner cut prices drastically on everything Lee ordered. So much of what Lee said and did was carefully calculated to build up his image that I think even he had trouble separating truth from fiction at times. But when we toured Europe, I learned that Lee had given an accurate description of his popularity abroad. A huge crowd waited for his arrival at Heathrow Airport outside London the day we flew in on the first leg of our journey. I can't imagine any movie or rock star getting a more tumultuous welcome. Huge banners that read, Welcome Liberace, decorated the double-decker buses that had brought hundreds of his fans to the airport. The British bobbies were out in force to control the excited crowd. A phalanx of security people met us as we deplaned, rushed us through customs and out into the airport itself. Then all hell broke loose. An immense crowd of aggressive fans streamed forward, eager to see Liberace, or better still, to touch him. I'd talked to stars who'd had their hair pulled, their clothing ripped off their backs when crowds reacted like that. The security force formed a flying wedge around Lee's body, and in so doing pushed me aside. Suddenly, dozens of people filled the growing space between Lee and me. I could see him moving toward the airport exit, his entourage churning their way through a human sea. Seymour Heller and his wife, Billy, Ray Arnett, and the three traveling members of Lee's band were somewhere in the mob but I didn't see a single familiar face around me. I'd almost resigned myself to a long, lonely trip into London when the crowd of security people around Lee ground to a sudden stop. Where's Scott? I could hear Lee shouting over the sounds of the crowd, and then more frantically, I'm not going anywhere until I find Scott. Although I could see people urging Lee to leave that madhouse as quickly as possible, I knew he'd be immovable until I joined him. Over here, Lee, I shouted jumping up above the heads of the crowd so I'd be seen. A couple of policemen came to my rescue at once. When I caught up with Lee, he reached for my hand and held it tight. And later, when the tour promoters wanted me to ride in another car so they could ride with Lee, he said, You fellows can take a cab. Scott goes with me. In many ways, 
fat European tour was the highlight of our life together. We'd never been closer or happier. Lee was thrilled with my new face, and I was relaxed enough personally to have no need for cocaine. During Lee's three-week appearance at the Palladium, he'd made arrangements to stay at the home of an old friend, the great British female impersonator, Danny LaRue. Meanwhile, Danny was appearing in Hollywood and staying at Lee's penthouse. The arrangement was ideal. We'd have the privacy of a large and comfortable house, complete with a butler and a chauffeured limousine, while LaRue enjoyed the luxury and convenience of the penthouse. Danny's home at Henley-on-Thames was everything we could have wished for, beautifully decorated and well-staffed by Danny's own brother and sister. Opening night at the Palladium, we did a command performance in front of the Queen Mother, Afterward, we were to be presented to her. As we dressed for the show, I kept on thinking, what a long way I'd come from the foster kid nobody wanted. Lee had met British royalty in the past and knew the protocol, but I had to be coached on the proper etiquette of going through a receiving line and meeting royalty. Above all, I was told not to attempt to shake the Queen Mother's hand. If she wanted to shake mine, she would reach for it. I was very nervous about meeting a queen. But Lee loved the pomp and circumstance the occasion demanded. He hadn't exaggerated one iota about how much the Queen Mother liked his performances. She applauded enthusiastically throughout the show and was positively beaming afterward as we came through the receiving line. Greeting Lee like an old friend, she told him how nice it was to see him again. He beamed back, giving her the full-voltage Liberace grin. While they had a brief chat... I kept on reminding myself to keep my hands at my side when it was my turn to meet her. Then there she was, standing in front of me. A little chubby woman who looked more like your average grandmother than a member of the royal family. Like any reasonably well-mannered American male, I automatically stuck my hand out to shake hers. As soon as I did, I realized I'd made a mistake. Thorson, you dumbass, I thought. This lady is not going to be pleased. But the Queen Mother looked at me and began to smile. Not the pasted-on smile people have going through a receiving line, but a genuine grin. That's really quite all right, young man, she said, reaching for my hand and shaking it heartily. I guess you call that noblesse oblige. Later, after the royal party had gone, we were shown up to the royal box. Luxurious and private, with gilt furniture and heavy velvet portieres, the whole place looked like something out of a fairy tale. This is where the queen and king sit, I thought, trying out their chairs. The one modern touch was a private bathroom, which Lee and I christened. From now on, Lee said, you can tell people you really did sit on a throne. As Lee expected, the British critics were less than enthusiastic about his reappearance in their midst. His weight was at an all-time high, and that, coupled with the silicone implants that smoothed out the lines around his mouth, made him look like a round-faced, overaged cherub. The press called him a blimp. But Lee had no trouble ignoring them because he was playing to full houses. Night after night, Seymour Heller walked the house to count the size of the crowd, and then came into our dressing room to tell Lee, as Heller always did when attendance was high, we're doing great. Conversely, in the past, when Lee played to less than full houses, Heller would walk into the dressing room, gloom written all over his face, and say, Lee, you're doing terrible. Heller's selective use of pronouns had become a standing joke between Lee and me. Fortunately, Heller had no reason to do anything other than smile during that entire European trip. We were doing great. From London, we flew to Berlin, where Lee played to a mixed German and American audience. Again, I was surprised at the size of the crowd that waited to welcome Lee. The German audiences didn't seem to mind that Lee did his show in English. He performed without the benefit of props, just using the piano, the candelabra, and a wild assortment of costumes to entertain them. His patter was all in English, except for a few lines in badly accented German that he struggled through. Strangely enough, every time he said anything in German, the audience gave him an ovation, but his music proved to be a universal language. His rollicking, bouncing rendition of American classics reached straight to the heart of those Germans. The trip certainly proved one thing to me. Lee was a star with international appeal. I'd been thinking of him as a strictly American phenomenon, 
but they loved him all over the world. While we were in Berlin, we took the obligatory trip to see the wall, stopping at Checkpoint Charlie. Lee wasn't at all political. However, this place really seemed to get to him. Freedom lay on one side, the right to be whatever you dreamed you could be, while a life of severely limited possibilities was on the other. Lee, who had dreamed big and seen those dreams come true, shuddered as he looked through that opening in the wall. After leaving Berlin, we played tourist for a while, going to Munich to sample the beer, and then out into the countryside to look at castles. Lee really turned on to Nuschwanstein, the fairy tale castle of Mad King Ludwig II. That castle, with its fantastic turreted architecture, was the classic example of Lee's favorite saying. Too much of a good thing is wonderful. He claimed to feel a deep psychic connection with Ludwig, just as he claimed to feel a deep psychic connection to Liszt. Lee had an interest in the occult, in the possibility that he'd lived past lives, that the trip stimulated. Old things, houses, antiques, castles turned him on. But there was another aspect of German life that turned him on even more. We'd been told that Hamburg had the most outrageous nightlife, porno palaces, and Lee was determined to see them for himself. Hamburg more than lived up to his expectations. One night, Lee and I, accompanied by Ray Arnett and Seymour and Billy Heller, went to a nightclub where the entertainment consisted of a variety of sex acts performed on stage. As a visiting celebrity, Lee was given a large front row table. He sat, riveted by the action, as a series of acts, homosexual and heterosexual, unfolded in front of us. It was the one sour note of the entire trip, the only time when Lee and I weren't on the same wavelength. I was embarrassed, especially with Billy Heller and other ladies sitting nearby, but Lee seemed oblivious of everything except the entwined bodies. He watched with an eagerness that was as unpleasant to me as the performances themselves. By then, Lee's fascination with pornography had become a major issue between us. I became furious when the maitre d' approached to suggest that Lee could enjoy the sexual favors of any of the performers who interested him, in the privacy of the small rooms that ringed the club. Lee refused but I suspect he would have accepted at once if he'd been on his own. Sex fascinated him. The kinkier, the better. When we left for Paris a day or two later, I was happy to leave Hamburg after dark, far behind. Although Paris is justifiably proud of its nightlife, there would be no repeats of what we had seen in Germany. Lee was relatively unknown in France and had no performances scheduled. He took a suite at the Paris Hilton, and spent the next few days playing tourist instead of piano. We went to places like the Louvre, the Eiffel Tower, and Versailles, where the Hall of Mirrors reminded Lee of his own Hall of Mirrors in the glittering Vegas house. Again, he talked of feeling connected to the past and the man who had built Versailles. Lee loved the French restaurants, but detested the rude French waiters, who didn't seem to realize he was a star. Although he claimed to enjoy going out in public without being approached for his autograph, it was soon apparent that Lee could go only so long without public recognition. After a few days in France, his anonymity began to annoy him. He'd smile expectantly at passing strangers, trying to elicit a response, and then frown angrily when he failed to get one. Lee was one of the few stars I ever met who liked being hassled by autograph seekers. I think it reassured him. Next, we went to Monte Carlo, where there are always lots of Americans and Lee was treated like visiting royalty. He taped an appearance on a variety show hosted by Patrick Wayne, John Wayne's son. The made-for-television series was supposed to showcase international stars, but we later learned that it failed in the ratings. Chris Christopherson and Anne Murray appeared with Lee, but we saw very little of them socially. Lee and I spent our time on gambling in the casino and getting a little sun. From there, it was on to Holland and more performances in front of large and enthusiastic crowds. After one of the shows, the fans actually tried to break down the dressing room doors to get at Lee. Our last stop was Oslo, Norway, and Lee was as popular there as he had been in London. When we returned home after eight weeks of traveling, I had a new understanding of the size and scope of Lee's fame, and a new respect for his talent.
He reached across the barriers of language and culture to make people smile and give them pleasure. That year, we also went to Mexico, where El Presidente actually went to the trouble of meeting us at the airport. The welcoming ceremony began with a walk down a red carpet past an honor guard. Lee had earned Mexico's gratitude by featuring the ballet folklorico in his act, and as a consequence, he was treated more like a visiting head of state than a nightclub performer. We stayed at the Mexican White House, an incredible palace with the world's best trained servants. Few screen stars ever achieved Lee's international acclaim. At the beginning of the 1980s, he stood at the pinnacle of his profession. He'd become the highest paid, best known entertainer in the world. Truly the greatest showman on earth. An outsider might have concluded that he'd long since fulfilled all his dreams. In fact, Lee still had two unfulfilled ambitions. He wanted to play Radio City Music Hall. His desire had been born in his youth and fueled by the year and a half of performances when the Rockettes had been part of his own act. In 1979, when I first suggested using them, we'd flown to New York to discuss the idea with the Rockettes' management at the music hall. During the negotiations, we were given a tour of the stage, one of the biggest and most elaborate in Lee's experience. It fired his imagination. There were elevators to lift or lower props or pieces of the set from stage level. The most fantastic lighting, a pit that held a full orchestra. Lee's face glowed with barely contained excitement, as it did whenever he got a new and exciting idea for his act. It was there that he and Michael Travis got the idea of having Lee make an entrance wearing an enormous cape that could later serve as the stage's back curtain, the costume he would eventually plan to wear in 1987. Lee could picture himself doing the show of his lifetime in that historic theater in the future. It would be totally outrageous, he said, giving the place the highest praise he could imagine. Lee met with Radio City Music Hall's management, talking at length to choreographer Violet Holmes about his ideas. But back in 1979, with the European tour and the Mexican trips in the offing, plus his usual calendar of American bookings, Lee had to set aside the idea of working the music hall. Most of his people breathed a sigh of relief. Lee's act was dynamite in front of the relatively unsophisticated audiences he encountered in places like Vegas or Sparks or Hershey. But not even his most ardent admirer believed he had what it took to conquer New York. No one seemed more anxious to see Lee abandon the dream of a Radio City appearance than Seymour Heller, who remained convinced that cosmopolitan Broadway theatergoers wouldn't appreciate Lee, even Ray Arnett ordinarily one of Lee's staunchest supporters, thought Lee would be running a risk if he chose to go through with his plan. Their objections seemed unfounded in view of the fact that Lee had played to standing room audiences at Carnegie Hall early in his career and had set an attendance record of 16,000 back in 1954 when he appeared at Madison Square Garden. Lee's second unfulfilled ambition was to be an actor, a movie star. That desire had been reinforced by the years he'd lived in Hollywood, years when he failed to get the film industry to take him seriously. Deep down inside, he felt he'd be a standout playing character roles. Lee made his screen debut in the 1950s, playing a honky-tonk pianist in South Seas Sinner, starring Shelley Winters. Then, in 1955, in the midst of the White Heat period, he'd played the romantic lead in Sincerely Yours, a film created solely to showcase his talents. In 1965, in The Loved One, he played a coffin salesman with oily charm. Lee was wonderful in the part and hoped it would lead to others. His pride was injured when he continued to be ignored by producers and directors. He hated feeling like a failure in films. When his movies played on late-night television, we would perform a silly ritual. The moment the credits appeared, I'd say, Dim the lights. Low-key lighting, please. Lee would grin happily as his image appeared on screen. He'd make an expansive gesture and say, Oh, look, a star. That, he confessed, was what he really wanted to be. A movie star. He enjoyed great triumphs as a live entertainer, earning a series of prestigious awards, including six gold albums and two Emmys, as well as mention in the Guinness Book of Records for being the world's highest-paid pianist. But Hollywood had denied him the recognition he craved.
least still hope to appear at the Academy Awards someday, as a presenter or performer, if not as a nominee. Now that Lee is gone, I have one last dream for him myself. Today I live in West Hollywood, just blocks from Lee's former house on Herald Way. Hollywood Boulevard and the Walk of Fame are an easy stroll from my front door. Not a week goes by without some performer being immortalized by placement of a star bearing his or her name on the Walk of Fame. Many of the recipients are famous for their music or their stage work rather than their films, and many of them are less than household names. In view of Lee's long reign as the leading showman of his day, of the fact that millions of fans throughout the world recognized his unique talent, it would be appropriate to have him recognized by Hollywood, too. Surely, on all those blocks of Hollywood Boulevard, there is a place for a star bearing the name Liberace. 20. Lee's relationship with his family, and particularly his mother, played counterpoint to the life he and I shared. Francis was always there, a source of worry, occasional aggravation, and financial drain for Lee. With his staunch belief in duty to his mother, he couldn't ignore her, no matter how much he might have wanted to from time to time. During our early years, he had her safely tucked away in Palm Springs, and we saw her only during our stays at the Cloisters. I never understood his reluctance to spend time with his mother. In my opinion, she was a beautiful old lady with twinkling blue eyes that lit up whenever she saw her son. I would have been proud to call her grandmother. Frances Liberace seemed to come alive in Lee's presence, and according to her nurse's reports, really faded away when he wasn't around. Although Lee didn't give Frances as much time as she would have liked, she never lacked for any material comfort, including a luxurious home, furs and jewels, and round-the-clock care as her health began to fail. Lee took great pains to ensure that his mother had the best of everything. But his mother didn't see it that way. In her book, The Best of Everything, was Lee himself. She wanted to live near him, to see him daily instead of occasionally. Even in her late eighties, Frances was still a sharp, determined woman who knew how to get what she wanted. In this case, to spend her final years with her favorite child. Sometime in late 1979, Lee began to get reports that his mother did not have long to live. During our visits, Frances made it apparent that she felt lonely, forgotten, ignored by the only person she really cared about. All I need, she told Lee emphatically, is to be near you, and I know I'll feel better. In her sweet way, Frances Liberace managed to maneuver her son between a rock and a hard place. What can I do? He asked me. Tell my mother that I don't want her living any place near me. She'd raised him to respect his elders, to honor their wishes. The habit was deeply ingrained. Although Lee was 60, his mother was still capable of getting him to do what she wanted. She knew exactly how to manipulate him. In her own quiet way, Frances made Lee feel he'd condemned her to a slow decline by leaving her in Palm Springs. He felt he'd had no choice but to move her to Vegas, the city that served as his home base. I sat in on all the discussions and arrangements, wishing that I could handle Lee as skillfully as his mother did. She played him even better than he played the piano. It didn't take her long to get what she wanted. I'm not denying that Frances was frail, but she used her frailty. When our visit ended, I knew I'd witnessed a masterly performance. Apparently, Lee had inherited his acting skills and his ability to manipulate people from his mother. They both loved to play Camille. Before we left Palm Springs... Lee arranged to move his mother to the White House, the home he still owned in Vegas. In the past, he'd rented it to people such as Diana Ross or heavyweight champion Larry Holmes. For the next few months, it would be occupied by Frances and her nurses. The house was always kept immaculate and ready for immediate occupancy. Best of all, from Frances's viewpoint, it was only five minutes away from Lee's own home. Frances made a trip to Vegas in a limousine, accompanied by her own nurses and a doctor. Predictably, after a couple of weeks in Vegas, Frances declared that she felt much better. Being near her beloved son was the tonic she needed to make the rest of her life worth living. It was obvious to me that he was her whole world, that seeing him daily really did make her feel better. We began a routine of stopping by her home for 15 minutes every evening on our way to do the show.
Francis would light up like a neon sign the minute Lee walked in. She would loved Lee so much. It was sad that he couldn't love her back with the same intensity. Lee had a habit of fluttering his fingers against any available surface, as if he was playing the piano when he got nervous. He'd no sooner sit down with his mother than his fingers would start fluttering, and they'd be in constant motion throughout the visit. Their conversations went by rote. How you doing, Ma? Lee would ask. Are you feeling good? Are the nurses treating you well? Do you need anything? Day after day, he always asked her the same questions. And when he'd finished and she'd answered, they didn't seem to have anything more to say to each other. It was kind of pathetic. They were mother and son in the final years of their lives together. But they didn't know how to communicate. Strangely enough, Frances seemed utterly unconcerned by my presence in her son's life. She knew we lived together, went everywhere together. She may have even suspected that we shared a bed. But, like Lee, she had an extraordinary ability to close her mind to anything that might have been unpleasant. She always greeted me warmly with the same welcoming embrace she gave her son. It was impossible not to return her affection. If Frances liked you, she could be the warmest, sweetest person. Frances never made a secret of her feelings. She complained bitterly about her nurses, who never seemed to be able to please her no matter how hard they tried. If she didn't like someone, she had a habit of hissing at them through closed lips while throwing up her arms in an almost defensive gesture. Much to my embarrassment, Joel Strode, who had known her for years, used to walk up to her to give her a hug, only to be greeted with that funny hiss and her upthrown arms. Gladys was one of Francis' favorite people. But even Gladys felt the sting of the old lady's tongue. One night, when Francis had joined us at the Shirley Street house for dinner, Gladys made one of Lee's favorite meatloaves. When Francis saw what her son was being served, she turned to Gladys in outraged fury, saying, I can't believe my son is going to have to eat meatloaf when the blacks in Watts are eating steak. It was an outrageous remark especially when directed at someone as loyal and devoted as Gladys. But then, Francis Liberace could be a completely outrageous person. Gladys, who was often left in charge of caring for her when Lee and I were out of town, was clearly upset. Fortunately, she was a wonderful woman with a tremendous capacity for forgiving and forgetting. While Francis lived in Vegas, Lee often asked me to take her to the Hilton so she could gamble. How she loved the slot machines... She may have been frail and old, but she could spend five or six hours playing the slots. When she was feeling well, I'd pick her up in the piano key station wagon and drive her down to the Hilton. According to Lee, Baron Hilton was kind enough to have his staff rig certain machines for her, so she had the pleasure of winning more than the average tourist. She also spent a lot of time playing the slots in Lee's private casino in our house. On those occasions, I'd be given the job of rigging them for her. I'll never forget the day she won so big that there wasn't enough money in the machines to pay her off. Frances was adamant. She wanted her winnings, all her winnings, then and there. Lee and I ran through the house collecting change from everyone, but we still didn't have enough for a full payoff. When we went to Frances and explained the problem, she looked at Lee, smiled her sweetest and said, That's all right, son. I'll take a check. It was indicative of their relationship that Lee got out his checkbook immediately. That was the kind of control she still exerted over him. We spent half the year in Vegas doing shows and resting between tours. And while we were there, Lee saw his mother briefly every day. He was the world's most dutiful, if not the most loving, son. Willing to do anything he could to make her happy. Provided it didn't intrude too deeply into his private life. When it became obvious that the stairs in the White House were too much for her, Frances spent a lot of time in a wheelchair when she wasn't playing the slots. Lee bought her a single-story condominium in the same building where he'd previously purchased a home for George and Dora. The new arrangement seemed to suit Mama Liberace and her hard-pressed nursing staff better. At least we heard fewer complaints in response to Lee's How are you doing? Do you need anything? Litany. Strangely enough, Although George and Dora now live just doors away from Mama, I got the definite impression that I saw more of her than anyone else did. Angie, who was living in California, flew in to visit her mother occasionally. But it always seemed to me that Frances was cold and standoffish toward her other children. 
It was Lee that she loved, and he came first right to the end. I escorted her to see Lee's shows once or twice a week during a three- or four-week Vegas engagement. When she was sitting front row center in the showroom, Lee always made a point of introducing her to the audience. I always joined her after driving Lee on stage. The minute the spotlight headed toward our table, Frances would perk up. No matter how poorly she felt, she'd sit up straight, looking her regal best by the time the spotlight reached our table. Then she'd wave to the crowd with the royal aplomb of a queen. Clearly, she loved her moments in the limelight, loved being recognized as Liberace's mother. And I know he valued the opportunity to show her off. She'd become an intrinsic part of his image. How could anyone say or think anything bad about a grown man who took such devoted care of his mother? Who would suspect that the young man sitting next to her, in this case me, was really Liberace's lover? Francis was the perfect cover for our true relationship. Francis rarely came backstage to visit, and she never commented on Lee's performance, although we sat through many of them together. In fact, during her final years, she was a somewhat silent lady who seemed to have a problem communicating verbally. But she effectively used gestures and facial expressions to convey her mood. A lot of things may have displeased her, but never Lee. Being in Vegas and seeing her son every day did give Francis Liberace a new lease on life, but it proved to be a short one. By 1980, her stamina had decreased markedly. Clearly, her days were numbered. Lee, who'd always been uncomfortable during their visits, became even more nervous around her. He'd walk into her room, give her an obligatory hug, and spend the rest of the visit looking any place but at Francis. I think it was his way of blocking out the reality of her imminent death. He'd gotten used to having his wealth and power shield him from life's unpleasant realities. If he couldn't buy his way out of a problem, he used someone on the payroll, usually Seymour Heller, to deal with it. But no amount of money could prevent 89-year-old Francis Liberace from dying. In view of his emotional distance from his mother, I thought Lee would have no trouble dealing with her imminent death. But he couldn't handle it at all. Instead, he ignored the situation. He didn't change his schedule to reflect his mother's now seriously declining physical condition. In fact, we were in Hollywood on vacation, staying in the penthouse, when we received word that Francis had died. Let me talk to my brother, Angie said abruptly when she called to give Lee the news. Angie was often abrupt with me, so I didn't think anything of it. As Lee spoke to his sister, he gasped and shrank back as though he were trying to avoid an unexpected blow. When did it happen, he asked. Within seconds, he'd regained full control of himself. After hanging up, Lee turned to me and told me Francis was gone. Tears filled my eyes, but Lee, although he looked shaken, remained dry-eyed. The first thing he did was to pick up the phone and call Seymour Heller to ask him to put an obituary in the appropriate newspapers. He returned to Vegas early the next day to make the funeral arrangements. Lee played the dutiful son to the end. He picked out his mother's coffin, pink because it was her favorite color, had her properly laid out and prepared for burial, called Forest Lawn in Los Angeles where he'd purchased what was to be the family mausoleum and made all the plans for the interment. It was a busy day, and he wanted me by his side, giving what little support I had to offer while he made those painful decisions. Lee, who had such an even-tempered disposition, showed very few signs of the stress he was under as he prepared his mother's final farewell. But those fingers of his fluttered non-stop as he played a silent concerto. The entire family, including Angie, her children and grandchildren, George and Dora, and Rudy's seldom-seen widow and children, in addition to all of Lee's people, Lucille Cunningham and her immediate family, the Strotes, Ray Arnett, the members of the band, everyone close to Lee was gathered at Forest Lawn for the funeral. Angie and Lee were stoical throughout the long day, but George took his mother's passing very hard. He wept uncontrollably when he saw the coffin. All the surviving family members were showing the strain by the time we adjourned to the penthouse after the burial. The old wounds inflicted during their childhood seemed to resurface. Grief, instead of making them closer, seemed to push them apart. George was virtually silent, clutching his wife's hand. 
But Angie, obviously distraught, began to boss me around. Lee intervened, saying, For heaven's sake, Angie, leave Scott alone. Can't you see he's taking Mom's death as hard as anyone? As for Lee himself, he never shed a tear from the first phone call to the gathering after the funeral. He displayed emotion by snapping at people. Consequently, it came as a shock a few months later when Lee wept buckets over the death of his favorite dog. Baby boy was the little poodle with the eye problem who played a part in bringing Lee and me together. Lee was absolutely inconsolable when the dog died of old age. For days afterward, he moped around the house, breaking into uncontrollable fits of crying. I thought his heart would break. Seeing his distress, I couldn't help concluding that Lee loved his dogs more than he loved his family. When Lee buried his mother, he buried all his unresolved feelings about her. He'd loved her and resented her, but he'd never dealt with those emotions. And now he never would. Sometime late on the evening of the funeral, after everyone had gone, Lee turned to me and made the only comment he would ever make about his mother's death. I'm finally free, he said. Although we would live together for two more years, Lee seldom spoke his mother's name in my presence again. Liberace, the entertainer, made much of his beloved mother's passing, while Lee, the man, put it behind him as he'd put so many other unpleasant things behind him. His reaction to Francis's death was a chilling example of his ability to close the door on the past, an ability that would one day serve him well with regard to me. 21. In 1977, shortly after I moved into the Vegas house with Lee, I came across a number of pornographic tapes that he'd left in the night table by our bed. When I questioned him about them, he said he enjoyed watching porn and had a small collection of tapes and films. It was the only time I ever heard Lee minimize a situation. In fact, his collection was extensive and well used. Before my arrival, he'd watched hardcore pornography as a steady diet. During our first weeks together, he showed me some of his films. They all depicted homosexual acts. And even at the age of 18, I found the movies offensive and boring. Sex in the privacy of your own bedroom can be thrilling, romantic, a real bond between two people. But sex on screen is just sad. The positions look awkward, the body's unattractive, the photography poor. Worse, from my point of view, was the fact that homosexual pornography seemed embarrassingly faggy. The dialogue, what little there was of it, was so stereotypically gay as to be laughable. I believe a man should still act like a man, no matter what his sexual preference. But Lee's porn films often starred men who, in the vernacular, would be called flaming fags. There are guys like that out there, but they're not representative of the homosexual population as a whole. I hated those films. Hated the fact that Lee liked them so much and wanted me to watch them with him. They aroused him while they turned me off. Each time Lee viewed one of his tapes, he'd want to have sex. The variety of sexual acts he saw on screen fascinated him. Nothing made him hotter than watching a three-way, three men in bed going at it. At the beginning of our relationship, I was afraid his fascination with hardcore porn would cause a real problem between us. Fortunately, back then, Lee cared more about me than about watching those movies. Since I disliked them so much, he stopped asking me to view them with him, and to the best of my knowledge, stopped watching them himself. Although sex was important to Lee, and he liked a variety of sexual acts, it was never the most important thing in our relationship. That was fine with me, and for a long time it was fine with Lee, too. He hungered for companionship. He couldn't stand to be alone, and needed to know someone would always be there for him. That need fit perfectly with my desire to have a father figure. Lee became my father figure. I looked up to him. In fact, I put him on a pedestal. Considering the difference in our ages and his immense talent and charm, it's no great surprise that I came to admire him so much. The public Liberace, the great entertainer, deserved all the admiration I could muster. But the private man had traits and tastes that were less than admirable. Foremost among them, his consuming interest in pornography. Although I cared for Lee more than anyone I'd ever known and saw him through rose-colored glasses, there were times more and more of them as the years went by, 
when ignoring or excusing his faults came hard. When things went well, we laughed a lot. The thing I remember most from 1977 to mid-1981 is laughter. In the privacy of our home, I poked fun at Lee, saying scandalous things that no one else would have dared say. He didn't mind me calling him an old queen, teasing him mercilessly about his makeup, his clothes. I was probably the only person in the world who didn't treat him like a star 24 hours a day, kissing his behind at every opportunity. But I began to sense a subtle difference in our relationship sometime in 1981. Lee didn't laugh at my jokes as much as he had in the past. I had to be careful not to anger him. He'd always been flirtatious toward other attractive young men, but now his flirting became so obvious that it embarrassed me. When he had a few drinks, he'd come on to teenage boys as though I wasn't even there. I'm sure the other people who worked for him realized what was happening, even though I didn't at first. Lee was tiring of me. The plastic surgery and the weight loss that had drastically altered my appearance helped maintain his exclusive interest in me for a while. But underneath, I was still the same old Scott. And at 22, past my prime for a man who liked younger, more malleable companions. Lee was a chicken hawk, and he would soon be searching for new prey. At first, I tried to ignore the symptoms of his growing restlessness. When I couldn't, we usually wound up fighting. Then I'd take a little cocaine to help me over the rough spots. As the frequency of our arguments increased, so did my drug usage. With the wisdom of hindsight, I realized that my drug habit caused some of the difficulty between us. It made me less malleable and harder to reach. I'd been a kid when Lee and I met. His opulent lifestyle had been completely alien to me. So I followed his lead. By mid-1981, following his lead had lost its appeal. I'd become a man with opinions of my own. Opinions I probably expressed too often. Now, when Lee tried to tell me how to dress, what to eat, where to go, I often ignored him. He resented it. But being Lee, he never openly expressed his resentment. Lee didn't confront his problems head on. That wasn't his style. He kept quiet while his dissatisfaction ate away at our relationship. As a result, he became more dictatorial. And in turn, I became more rebellious. We were on an accelerating downward spiral, and everyone seemed to know it but me. I kept on thinking, this too shall pass. Lee who'd insisted on my being with him morning, noon, and night, began to give me a little freedom. It started with my taking Francis Liberace to the Hilton to gamble. Sometimes Lee went with us, but more often he said he had errands to run. After Francis died, I continued to do a few things on my own. Having time to myself, after being what I still think of as a prisoner in paradise, made me so happy that I didn't question what Lee was doing when we weren't together. I made a few friends tried my hand at songwriting with enough success to be encouraged. Looking back, I realized being Lee's favorite had gone to my head. I'd been given too much too soon. I didn't know how to handle my good fortune, and my snorting coke didn't help. I had begun to think of myself as Lee's son, the power behind the throne, even as his equal. I felt I deserved to have my say and my way, at least part of the time. That proved to be a mistake. Lee didn't want an equal. He wanted a subordinate. Someone who'd jump when he said jump. They were still good times. Enough of them that I didn't realize how close we were to playing out our string. Both of us were drinking more, smoking heavily, and we began to have serious disagreements about our sex life. Lee, who wanted more variety, tried to talk me into acts I found repugnant. If you loved me, you'd do what I want. He complained bitterly. If you really cared about me, I replied, you wouldn't ask me to do things I hate. The arguments became more acrimonious with every passing month. Lee wanted me to engage in anal sex, and I hated even the thought. Our sexual encounters were creating even more tension between us. During our last year together, Lee and I made our annual pilgrimage to Fort Lauderdale, where he had a standing engagement. While we were there, Lee renewed an old friendship. The two of them made me feel like a total outsider as they talked about the good old days. People and places and incidents I knew nothing about. The man owned a string of adult bookstores and had supplied Lee with many of his pornographic films and tapes. 
We became a threesome for the next few days. Lee's pal kept on sniggering and telling me I ought to check out one of his bookstores. Obviously, Lee had already told him what I thought of porn. Try it, you'll like it, he insisted. I didn't have any desire to and told him so, rather graphically. But Lee had other ideas. Boober, he said. You're a goddamn party pooper. One night, after we'd all had too much to drink, I finally agreed to check the place out. The three of us piled into a car and took off for one of Lauderdale's sleazier neighborhoods, where the so-called bookstore presented a blank, windowless face from the street. Inside, racks loaded with pornographic books and magazines lined the front of the store, while shelves of merchandise, whips, chains, other objects used in sadomasochistic sex acts, even dildos and other things I'd never heard of and had no idea how to use, were near the back. Lee's eyes gleamed as he took it all in. There was a series of viewing machines, like old-fashioned Nickelodeons, where you could watch sex flicks to your heart's content. Heterosexual, homosexual, sex acts featuring animals or children, they had it all. Lee was going from viewer to viewer, grinning all over the place. The bookstore also had private cubicles in the back with what are known in the gay world as glory holes, for a small fee, a man could rent one of the cubicles, put his penis through the glory hole, and wait for a response. I was drunk when we arrived, a circumstance that prevented Lee from staying longer and enjoying the full use of the facility. We weren't there fifteen minutes before I threw up, making an unintended but valid commentary on my surroundings. Lee, who was thoroughly disgusted with my behavior, had no choice but to take me back to our hotel. The next morning I woke up with a killer hangover. But I made up my mind to have it out with Lee. A couple of aspirins later, I finally felt well enough to confront him. About last night, I said, You're a well-known star, and you're out of your fucking mind to go in a place like that. What the hell would you have done if someone, a reporter, had seen you in there? How would you explain that to all the little old ladies? Lee didn't have any answers. In the sober light of day, he agreed he'd made a mistake. Never again would he insist on going into an adult bookstore. But his interest in pornography didn't end. By 1981, Lee had tumbled from the pedestal where I'd rightly or wrongly placed him. I still loved him, dreaded the thought of losing him, but I no longer idolized him. Even then I recognized the fact that we both had problems. In the years to come, I would be able to analyze them realistically. Mine had to do with drugs. Lee's had to do with sex. Although his interest in sex was at an all-time high, his ability to achieve satisfaction had greatly decreased. Despite the silicone implant, he had difficulty achieving full arousal. Our sex life was diminishing, in part because Lee was much too proud to discuss his virility, or lack of it, with me. Instead, he used pornography to become aroused and ready for sex. Since I had no way of knowing why he did it, I interpreted his constant viewing of pornography as a complete lack of consideration for my feelings. We'd reached an irreconcilable impasse. I didn't know where to turn or what to do. If I lost Lee, and I still refused to face that possibility, I'd be losing a lot more than a lover or a meal ticket. I'd be losing the person who meant more to me than anyone I'd ever known. The man who'd become my family. I knew Lee so well I could even hear a difference in the way he played piano as we grew further apart. He was more emotional. It showed in his eyes, his voice, but most of all in his performances. Looking back, I guess he too was going through some pain. And a lot of regret. We still cared for each other. Enough to try to resolve our problems. When Lee suggested that we experiment with an open relationship, I agreed. At the time, I'd have agreed to anything that had a chance of stopping our arguments and keeping us together. An open relationship would have given Lee the sexual variety he needed, while we would continue to live together as friends and companions. It sounded reasonable. I wouldn't be losing Lee, and he wouldn't lose me. We'd just be sharing a part of ourselves with other people. Unfortunately, what sounded like a rational way to go on living together, when we discussed it in the jacuzzi, turned out to be an emotional hell. I soon learned I couldn't stand the thought of Lee seeing anyone else. And he blew his stack the first time he saw me with another man. Even though I explained that the man was a friend, not a lover. It's him or me, 
Lee declared. We both realized that an open relationship wouldn't work for us. But we'd given each other one hell of a scare. For a while, it seemed we'd both learned a lesson. No matter what, we decided to stay together. But from then on, I felt I couldn't trust Lee. My response to his ever-roving eye was to retreat further and further into drugs, using them to escape reality. Like most addicts, I still believed I could handle drugs. When Tony Orlando tried to warn me that my habit was out of control, I refused to listen. It was a hell of a lot easier to rationalize taking drugs, to blame it on Dr. Starts or on Lee for causing my unhappiness, than it was to try to deal with my problems. I don't mean to give the impression that I'd become an out-of-control drug addict. That wouldn't happen until I faced the reality of actually losing Lee. I could still go for days without taking as much as an aspirin. But gradually, what had been a monthly habit became bi-weekly and then weekly. I continued to try concealing my cocaine usage from Lee, who, despite his own fondness for amyl nitrite, cigarettes and liquor, professed to hate drugs. I never did coke around him, but he would have had to be blind not to know what I was doing. At the same time, although I hadn't caught him with another man, I was convinced he was seeing someone. Weeks would go by without Lee initiating a sexual encounter, and I knew Lee too well to think he'd gotten hooked on celibacy. The pattern of fighting and making up accelerated. When friends like Tony Orlando tried to talk to me about how much coke I was using, denial was the name of the game. I'm not addicted. I can handle it, take it or leave it, I argued. Then, of course, there were friends like Mr. Y, who were interested in seeing my addiction escalate so they could sell me more drugs. By late 1981, I was listening to all the wrong people. The more I used drugs, the more Lee pulled away from me. Although I didn't realize it then, He'd already started looking for a new protege. The casting call was out. 22. I'm not a psychologist, a social worker, or a doctor. But I believe that promiscuity is and always has been the most serious problem facing gay men in the gay community. Today, everyone realizes that such behavior is a major factor in transmitting AIDS. But back in 1981... I was more concerned about what promiscuity might do to my relationship with Lee than about what it could do to my prospects for a long life. Too often, gay men roam from partner to partner, indulging themselves in a series of one-night stands, acting like randy male dogs. Their code seems to be, if it feels good, do it. From my own observations and experiences, I've reluctantly concluded that the gay male sex drive is so strong, so powerful, that even today, confronted with the possibility of contracting AIDS, some gay men seem willing to die just to have a new experience. Lee was one of them. We'd agreed to have a monogamous relationship, but Lee's track record, coupled with his constant flirting, kept me from trusting him. I was always on the lookout for signs of trouble. Two of Lee's oldest and dearest friends served as a role model for the relationship I hoped he and I would share. Fred and Bob were a dance team, Retired from their many years with Lee's show and living in Connecticut when I first met them in 1977. They'd been together two and a half decades and seemed completely happy. We visited them every time Lee had an East Coast engagement, and my esteem for them grew with each meeting. When Lee decided to open an antique shop in his museum complex, I immediately suggested Fred and Bob as prospective managers. They were well settled in their Connecticut home and moving would mean a major upheaval in their lives. But they accepted Lee's offer out of their affection for him. I hoped their obvious stability, so different from most of the gay behavior that we saw day in and out, would rub off on us. Most of all, I hoped that Lee and I would have a long-lasting relationship like theirs. But that wasn't in the cards. Lee's desire to have sexual variety with a younger lover, coupled with my drug problem, continued to drive us further apart as 1981 drew to a close. We had terrible fights, instigated by me when I caught Lee paying attention to a younger man, or by Lee when he thought I was stoned. We'd wind up in a shouting match that always ended with Lee calling me a monster. Those words evoked memories of his final fights with my predecessor, Jerry O'Rourke. Lee had called him a monster, too.
I've created a Jekyll and Hyde, he sobbed, when our fights threatened to become physical. And he was right. My years with Lee had turned me into a spoiled, pampered, cocaine-using jerk who no longer liked himself. Lee and I stayed together for a complex variety of reasons. Habit, mutual dependency, caring. There were still happy times. Among them, the day Lee was asked to play all the nominated musical scores at the 1982 Academy Awards ceremony. For Lee, that was the culmination of a lifelong dream. He wanted to be an actor, a star, to win an Oscar, being asked to play at the award ceremony. Not just one nominated song, but all of them, was the next best thing. A jubilant Lee looked forward to the evening of March 25th, 1982, when he'd make his appearance at the Dorothy Chandler Pavilion before a star-studded audience. To Lee, it signified the acceptance he'd always wanted from Hollywood. At long last, the film industry seemed to be taking him and his talent seriously. One of his last unfulfilled wishes was about to come true. I couldn't help being happy for him, but that happiness didn't last. Early in 1982, Lee started paying a lot of attention to a kid named Carrie James, an 18-year-old who was a member of the Young Americans, the singing and dancing troupe that appeared with Lee. James was blonde, blue-eyed. In fact, he looked a lot like me before my plastic surgery. James hung out around our dressing room all the time, and Lee often favored him with a private chat catching the two of them with their heads together, having what looked like an intimate conversation, drove me to a fury. But every time I brought up my suspicions, Lee swore I was imagining things. His conversations with James were completely innocent. Lee's people seemed to realize that change was imminent. In private, Ray Arnett would tell me that James was the most boring kid he'd ever known. But Arnett praised James whenever Lee was around. When so-called friends told me that Lee was buying James small gifts, clothing, and the like, I forced a major confrontation. What the fuck's going on around here, I shouted. Why is that little son of a bitch hanging around our dressing room all the time? Lee played innocent. Nothing's going on, he said. The kid doesn't mean a thing to me. You're making a mountain out of a molehill. I wanted to believe. How I wanted to believe him. I tried to take what Lee said at face value, but jealousy made me half crazy. I watched for any sign that he'd been lying to me. For the next few weeks, James had the good sense to steer clear of Lee and me. Then, the third week in March, when we were appearing at the Sahara Tahoe, I got a phone call while Lee and I were in our dressing room, resting between the first and second shows. My favorite foster mother, Rose Caracapa, had died. The Karakapas were the first family to take me in when my mother had been hospitalized after we moved to California, and they were the last family I lived with before meeting Lee. If things had been different, if my mother had been willing to let the Karakapas keep me when I was little, instead of reclaiming me, I probably wouldn't be writing this book. They were a good, dependable couple who would have given me a solid background. People who cared for me as much as the law, the welfare workers, and my mother had allowed. They represented the best the foster family system can offer a kid. And I'd never stopped caring for them, even though I hadn't followed their advice. The news of Rose's death, coming in the midst of my emotional problems with Lee, tore me up. I asked him if it would be all right if he made his entrance for the second show without the car. I was too upset to come out on stage all smiles and play chauffeur. Sure, Scott, Lee said, patting me on the shoulder in his most fatherly way. I understand just how you feel. You stood by me when Mom died, and I'm going to stand by you now. Those were exactly the words I needed to hear. Without the Caracapas, Lee was all I had left in the world. I grabbed the emotional lifeline he seemed to be extending. He was as good as his word. He not only permitted me to sit out the last performance of the evening... He arranged for a Lear jet to fly me to the funeral the next day. I was so grateful for his understanding and support that it never occurred to me that he might have an ulterior motive for wanting to get me out of town. It would be one of the few times since we became lovers that Lee and I spent a night apart. Knowing how much he hated to be alone, I regarded it as a sacrifice on his part. We were both solicitous of each other's feelings and needs as we said goodbye at the airport. When I returned 24 hours later, 
It was obvious that something had happened in my absence. Lee's people were looking at me differently, treating me differently, refusing to meet my eyes. I didn't trust any of them. But I did trust my sister Annette's husband, Don Day, who had a job working the concessions in Tahoe and who was staying with us to tell me the truth. As soon as Don and I had a minute alone, I asked him what the hell was going on. Don told me that Lee had invited Carrie James over to the house while I was away, and that James had spent the night with Lee in our bedroom. There was no way I could stay in control after hearing that news. How, I asked myself, could Lee do that to me? To us? While I was at Rose's funeral? The fact that I'd been away mourning the loss of someone I cared for doubled my sense of betrayal. Angry? God, I'd never been so fucking angry. If Lee had made the mistake of walking in at that moment, I think I'd have killed him then and there. I cursed, shouted, tore our bedroom apart. I don't even know how long I went on like that. By the time I regained control, the room was a disaster area of broken glass and furniture. Meanwhile, Lee was hiding downstairs, terrified of facing me. No way could I stay under the same roof with him. I didn't even want to be in the same state. I had to get away, try to cool down and think things through. So I tossed a few things in a bag and asked someone to drive me to the airport. The Lear jet was still there, and I had the pilot fly me back to Los Angeles. In L.A., not knowing where else to go or what to do, I took a cab to the penthouse. I couldn't shake the feeling that my life was over. Lee had been my whole world. If I didn't have him, I didn't want anything else. The darkest thoughts ran through my mind as my emotions seesawed between anger and self-pity. Unable to face being alone, I called Mr. Y, the man I considered to be my best friend. He came over. We shared some cocaine and talked for hours. By the next day, I'd made up my mind not to call Lee. I wanted him to make the first move, to apologize for what he'd done. Then maybe I'd be able to forgive him and we could start over. While I waited for the phone to ring, a note arrived. It was from Lee and said, Love me or leave me. Not exactly the abject apology I thought I had coming. I stayed holed up in the penthouse, licking my emotional wounds, while Lee left Tahoe for Palm Springs. A couple of days later, I got a call from the man who functioned as the major domo of the cloisters. For God's sake, he said, what the hell is going on with you and Lee? Last night he had two French kids here with him in bed. I couldn't believe it. I'd been sitting around like an idiot, waiting for Lee to call. And the whole time he'd been amusing himself with a three-way. The anger I'd felt in Tahoe was child's play compared to the rage that shook me after learning that Lee had been tricking around as he'd done before we met. I called him at the cloisters, screaming into the phone. How dare you? How dare you do that to me? I could kill you. Again, I couldn't face the night alone. So I called Mr. Y and another friend who happened to be a former patient of Dr. Starts and who, like me, had become hooked on drugs. As it turned out, this friend would later be my sponsor in a rehabilitation program. This time, cocaine didn't cool my anger or soothe my pain. I paced the penthouse, ranting and raving at my friends. Meanwhile, Lee was back in Palm Springs, convinced that I now represented a serious danger to his health and happiness. He was scared to death. Of me! He was due in L.A. the next day to rehearse for the Oscar ceremony, and he intended to stay at the penthouse. Common sense should have dictated that Lee book a suite at Hermitage or some other luxury hotel in view of my occupancy of the penthouse and the problems between us. But Lee had no intention of changing his plans because we'd had a battle royale. Once he set a course of action, he was unstoppable, plowing forward regardless of the consequences. There would be no time for me to cool down, to gather my thoughts and emotions. No time for me to decide what to do about Lee, about myself. No time to sort out the events of the last few days. Lee wanted me out of that penthouse so he could move in. Hell, I don't blame him. It was his property. He had a right to be there, and in his view, I didn't. But I can't help wishing he'd have changed his plans just this once. Instead, he did what he always did when faced with an untidy problem that needed handling.
He called Seymour Heller. He told Seymour I had to be removed from the penthouse no later than two o'clock the next afternoon. Lee himself planned to arrive shortly afterward, and he didn't want me anywhere near him ever again. He told Heller that I'd threatened him, which was certainly true. But if everyone who has ever said in the heat of anger, I could kill you, carried out that threat, half the people in the United States would be in jail for murder. Right or wrong, Seymour regarded my threats as a serious danger to Lee's life. He made preparations to act with force. When I first left Tahoe to take refuge in the penthouse, Lee had asked Heller to have me watched. As I later learned, Heller contacted Jay Trowman, Liberace's business manager. Trowman subsequently got in touch with Tracy International, a private detective and security agency that had worked for Lee before. In the past, Tracy International had performed over a dozen investigations for Lee and provided bodyguards for him on special occasions. The firm, and specifically Tracy Schnelker, who ran it, was given the task of keeping track of my comings and goings after I arrived in L.A. Schnelker would ensure that my departure from the penthouse was timely. The night before the Academy Awards was one of the worst nights of my life. After my friends left, I just couldn't get to sleep. The wreckage of my life with Lee stared me in the face. I knew he'd never take me back after the things I'd said and done. But despite my anger over his infidelity, I couldn't stop loving him. It may have been wishful thinking, but part of me thought if we could just sit down, face to face and man to man, we might be able to work things out. I was still tossing and turning long after the television stations signed off. So I went into the living room and turned on the stereo. Lee had the lights rigged to respond to the music, dimming and brightening, and I finally dozed off early in the morning watching them. I would wake up a few hours later to find myself living a nightmare. 23. Lee woke up in the bed we had shared at the Cloisters on the morning of March 25th, 1982 the day he would make his much-looked-forward-to appearance at the Academy Awards ceremony. As he'd done every morning when we were together, he kissed and cooed at the various dogs who slept in the bedroom, scolding them all if one had an accident during the night. Perhaps he even had a lover or two in bed with him that morning. By his own admission, he had continued to have the two young Frenchmen as his house guests. Knowing Lee, I bet he'd already put the problem of what to do about Scott Thorson in someone else's hands. From that day on, Lee would do his level best to pretend I didn't exist. From where he stood, it had been an exciting week. With the two Frenchmen, he'd enjoyed the sexual variety he'd been craving, and in Carrie James, he'd found a suitably youthful and malleable replacement for me. James would, in fact, become Lee's next companion. As Lee dressed for the day, he was already concentrating on the evening ahead, anticipating the acclaim he expected to receive from the glittering Academy Awards audience. It was shaping up to be one of the happiest days of his life. But it would be one of the worst in mine. As I caught a few hours rest after a sleepless night, Seymour Heller made plans to remove me from Lee's life. Permanently. That morning, sometime after 11, acting under Lee's instructions, Seymour Heller met private investigator Tracy Schnelker and three of Schnelker's more imposing employees in one of the offices on the ground floor of the penthouse building. Heller had also called my half-brother, Wayne Johansson, asking him to be present during the meeting. While it may have made sense from their point of view, to have my half-brother present during a situation that could have been nasty. His presence is something I can never forgive. The subject to be discussed at that meeting, Scott Thorson, and more specifically, how to get me out of the penthouse before Lee arrived. Heller told everyone that I was in the penthouse using drugs, that Liberace wanted me fired from my job. I was on the payroll as a bodyguard chauffeur companion. Removed from the premises and, if possible, taken to a hospital where I could be treated for my addiction. He added the information that I carried a gun. Obviously, in Heller's view, he was certainly doing his job. But I felt hurt and bitter. 
Any detective hearing such a description would conclude that Scott Thorson was a very dangerous character, to be approached cautiously and with all available force. Later, testimony indicates that Schnelker came to exactly that conclusion while he listened to what Heller had to say. I'm sure that, as he and his men rode the private elevator up to the penthouse, they thought they were going to be in danger. When the elevator doors whooshed open, they stepped out ready for anything, except what they found. The penthouse is enormous, but Schnelker and his men had no trouble locating me because two maids, already cleaning the premises despite the fact that I was supposed to be armed and dangerous, told Schnelker where to find me. I was, in fact, still sleeping on the sofa in the living room. The first thing I remember was being roughly shaken awake. My immediate thought was that I was being robbed. I saw four men standing over me, none of them looking friendly. One of them had a hook instead of a hand, which he brandished in my face. My God, I thought they're going to kill me. Desperate to escape, I began to struggle with Schnelker. Ordering him to get the hell out of there, I'd call the police. That sounds ridiculous now, but I didn't know what else to do. During the ensuing brawl, someone sprayed me with mace, but they missed my face. Somehow, I managed to shake free of them all. Looking back, it's almost comical. They were as afraid of me and what I might do as I was of them. I sprinted through the penthouse, wondering why the Pinkertons, who guarded the building and had spoken to me the previous evening, had let such dangerous characters inside. I could hear men pursuing me, knocking over furniture in their haste. Sometime during their pursuit, I saw my half-brother Wayne near the elevator. That brought me up short. My first thought was, what is he doing here? Why doesn't he help me? Call the police. Then the truth hit me. I'd been set up. No one got up to the penthouse without the express approval of Lee or Eller. The only way up was by private elevator and you needed a key to operate it. At that moment, Wayne moved toward me saying, these are private investigators, Scott. They're here to get you to leave. Lee wants you to go. I was outraged. Wayne and I weren't close, hadn't been close for years. And yet there he was asking me to leave on Liberace's behalf. Who the fuck do you think you are coming in here like this? I shouted. You have no right to be here. Then one of the four men, probably Schnelker, said he'd come to help get me to a hospital. The whole situation seemed unreal. There stood my brother Wayne a man I rarely saw, and four hired goons telling me I ought to go to a hospital. They tried to calm me down, and I kept on telling them to get the hell out and asking for Lee. By then, the maids had appeared from wherever they had been working and were taking in the free show. While I faced Wayne and the detectives, Lee was enjoying a leisurely breakfast before dressing for the day. The sun was shining, and he may even have taken time for a stroll through his beloved gardens at the cloister perhaps stopping in his private chapel for a brief prayer. By noon, he was in his limousine, relaxing in total luxury as he made the two-hour drive into Los Angeles. His conscience was clear, his mind at rest, his hands clean. According to his way of thinking, he was in no way responsible for the events taking place in the penthouse. That would be his unwavering testimony in the years to come although he would freely admit ordering my eviction. That day, Lee focused on his upcoming performance rather than the end of our relationship. I didn't have that luxury. I'm a big guy, almost six feet three inches, and I weighed about 180 at the time. But in my pajamas and bare feet, I was clearly no match for four burly detectives who were determined to throw me out of the place I'd regarded as home for five years. My only weapon was anger. I couldn't have presented a real threat. Nevertheless, one of them maced me again, this time managing to hit me in the face. I guess they expected it to slow me down, but it only made me more desperate. I got past the four of them and raced for a bedroom where I planned to barricade myself. As I ran, thinking myself in a life-and-death situation, I heard one of the maids screaming, He has a gun! At first I thought she was warning me that one of my attackers had a gun, then when I heard Wayne shout that I had two guns, I realized the warnings were meant for the detectives. It is true that I had guns. Lee had insisted that I carry them and had obtained a permit for me from John Moran, 
a Vegas sheriff. But I'm not Dirty Harry. I didn't intend to make Detective Schnelker's day. All I wanted to do was get to a phone, call Lee, and find out what the hell was going on. Then I saw Seymour Heller, standing clear of the action but observing it all. Although I'd already been roughed up and maced, seeing him was the worst moment of the entire morning, because I knew Heller wouldn't evict me on his own. He would be there only if he was acting on Lee's behalf, and that meant Lee and I were finished. I reached the bedroom ahead of my pursuers, locked myself in, and tried to think clearly. But my heart was pounding. My skin and eyes burned from being maced, and tears were pouring down my face. Meanwhile, Schnelker and Wayne kept on shouting through the door, saying that I ought to go to a hospital and that Lee would pay for my treatment. I didn't trust those bastards, not after what they'd done to me. And I still couldn't quite take the whole thing in. I was fired. They'd come to evict me. What did that have to do with me going to a hospital? Obviously, I needed help. First, I called Irv Osser, an attorney I knew. I'm sure I must have sounded pretty incoherent as I tried to explain what was going on. Nevertheless, Osser told me to stay put, not to leave the penthouse under any circumstances. But that didn't seem a likely option in view of the fact that Wayne and Schnelker and God alone knows who else were standing outside the door telling me I had to leave before Lee arrived, or else. It was the implied threat behind the or else that scared me. I would have cried like a baby if I'd had the time. Lee and I had been looking forward to this day for months, planning what he'd wear, who we'd see, which parties we'd attend after the Academy Awards ceremony was over. Michael Travis had designed special costumes for the event, and Anna Natisse had designed magnificent furs to go with them. How I wished I could turn back the clock, start the week over. I couldn't believe I wouldn't get to see Lee in those costumes performing the Oscar-nominated songs. I couldn't believe I'd never see Lee again, that he hated me enough to send detectives to the penthouse to forcibly evict me. But I knew no one else would have dared give orders like that. They had to come from Lee himself. My next call was to Mr. Y, the underworld figure who had systematically insinuated himself into my life over the last year. I told Y what had happened and asked him to help me get out of the penthouse in one piece. My biggest fear at that moment was that Schnelker and his men would beat the hell out of me once I opened the bedroom door. Mr. Y warned me not to leave the penthouse with anyone, even if they promised to take me to a hospital. Do you know how easy it is to get rid of a body in the hills outside L.A.? He asked. Stay put until I can send help. Believe me, I had no intention of moving after talking to Y. He promised to send some of his employees, men he trusted to handle any situation, to help me in any way I required. More than anything, I wanted to talk to Lee, to ask why he was doing this terrible thing to me. I called through the door, asking to speak to Heller. When he got there, I said, Seymour, what the hell's going on here? Does Lee know what's happening? Lee wants you to leave, Heller replied. These are his wishes. I felt he was telling the truth, even though I didn't want to believe it. Despite all our problems, I loved Lee, and I thought he still loved me. This just couldn't be happening. Let me talk to him, I begged. Heller's voice seemed devoid of feeling, as he said, What would it take to get you to leave? I knew he was talking money, but I didn't want money. I wanted Lee. Just let me talk to Lee first, and I'll go peacefully. You're sick, Heller said. You should go to a hospital. I felt he didn't give a damn about me or the state of my health. All the hospital talk was so much crap as far as I was concerned. A ploy to get me to open that door. Heller would follow Lee's instructions to the letter, and Lee's instructions were to get rid of me one way or another. The four goons outside my door were living proof of that. You can't talk to Lee, Heller repeated. I was beaten, and I knew it. Further resistance was useless. I had no choice but to leave the penthouse. I agreed to go and told Heller I wanted my clothes, all the things I brought with me when I left the Tahoe house. But time was running short. Lee was due within minutes. Heller wanted me out of the building before Lee arrived. One thing for damn sure, I had no intentions of leaving until I heard wise men arrive.
My clothes were in another room, so there'd probably be no time to dress or pack after they showed up. When I heard new voices in the hall, I opened the door, grabbed a fur coat in my jewel case, and headed for the elevator. Mr. Y had sent four men, led by the manager of his gay nightclub. There was a lot of pushing, shoving, and shouting as they escorted me out of the building. Once we reached the parking lot, I asked to be allowed back in to get my clothes, but one of Schnelker's men blocked access to the private elevator. Losing what little self-control I had left, I began to shout obscenities and threats. The nightclub manager was trying to get me into his car when Pat Swanson, my real estate agent, arrived on the scene. I'd been looking at property with her earlier in the week, and we were supposed to go out again that afternoon. Swanson would later serve as a witness to the day's events, but she wasn't much help at the moment. There I stood in my night clothes, wearing a coat and carrying the jewel case, wanting to return for my clothes and my money, while wise men and schnelkers had a Mexican standoff. Suddenly the whole thing seemed pointless. The one thing in the world that I cared about was Lee, and I had the sick feeling I'd never see him again. The club manager, exhibiting a pretty cool head, got me in his car, and the next thing I knew we were driving down Sunset Boulevard, leaving my home, leaving everything I owned and loved behind. Lee arrived at the penthouse a few minutes after my departure. By then, the maids were hard at work, straightening furniture and sweeping up broken china, erasing the evidence of what had taken place so that Lee wouldn't have to face the harsh reality of my eviction by force. I suspect Heller spared him the more sordid and unpleasant details. Later, I learned that the two men met out in the parking lot where Heller reassured Lee I was gone. Lee's two teenage French pals were with him in the limousine. I'm sure they'd had a delightful drive and were looking forward to the evening's festivities, whatever that might include. Lee was running late and didn't even bother going inside the building. Instead, Schnelker, in his role as Lee's bodyguard, jumped into the front seat of the limo, and they all set off for the Dorothy Chandler Pavilion at Los Angeles's Music Center. I learned later, from depositions that not once during the 30-minute drive did Lee ask the detective what had happened in the penthouse that morning. Heller had assured Lee that everything was taken care of in accordance with Lee's instructions, and that's all Lee needed or wanted to know. He was determined to put Scott Thorson behind him as quickly as possible. It was his way, his lifelong pattern. Lee had his mind set on two things, the Academy Awards, and the pleasure he would enjoy with his two house guests later that evening. His cup was running over. All mine had come up empty. Arriving at the nightclub manager's house in my pajamas, looking like someone who just escaped a tornado, did nothing to improve my mood. I began calling the penthouse at once, trying to arrange to get my money and belongings. Meanwhile, the rehearsal at the music center went splendidly. Lee had a wonderful time mingling with the stars and playing the nominated scores. Rehearsal ended at 3, and he returned to the now-clean penthouse by 3.30 in time for a rest, a snack, and a pleasant visit with his new friends, before he had to return for the Oscars at 6. While Lee spent a euphoric afternoon in the penthouse, I made repeated efforts to contact him by phone. I knew we were finished, but I wanted to hear it from him. Not from Heller or Johansson or some hired goon. It seemed the least Lee owed me. He had been my lover, my father, my confidant, and my best friend while I grew to manhood. He'd meant more to me than anyone in the world. By throwing me out, Lee not only deprived me of emotional and spiritual support, he also took away my job and everything in the world I owned. I knew I would never get him back. But there wasn't any reason for him to withhold my personal possessions. When I couldn't get any answer to my repeated phone calls, I finally called the police and asked them to help. But they said that since I'd voluntarily left the penthouse, there was nothing they could do. I had no choice but to deal directly with Seymour Heller. He finally agreed to permit me to return to pick up my belongings that night while Lee was at the music center enjoying his triumph. Not knowing exactly what to expect when I arrived at the penthouse, and fearing a repeat of the morning's assault, 
I took an armed guard and a dog with me when I returned. Heller met me on the ground floor and showed me into the small room he'd been using as his base of operations that day. It was crammed with green plastic trash bags, which he said held my belongings. I couldn't believe it at first. Lee was tossing me out like yesterday's garbage. Even more painful was the fact that my half-brother, Wayne Johansson, was still on the premises and being treated like one of the family. Well, I was told to take my trash and get the hell out of there. Heller made it very clear that I must not make any further attempts to contact Liberace. That it would be unwise for me to return to Vegas, despite the fact that my house, my furniture, my cars, and the bulk of my clothes were there. I left the building carrying those lousy trash bags, feeling a despair so deep that I can't even describe it. And yet I still couldn't believe what had happened. I was to have been Lee's son. He'd even had me made over in his image. I had a reasonable facsimile of his face, but I would never again have him. 24. In 1980, when tennis star Billie Jean King was sued for palimony by a woman who claimed to be her former lesbian lover, Lee and I joked about the much-publicized scandal. Lee laughingly said, Billie Jean, what a guy. And I rejoined, you're next, Lee, in reference to the fact that, as his long-term lover, I could also sue him for palimony. At the time, the thought of breaking up, of facing each other in a court of law instead of across the breakfast table, was so remote that we both laughed at the mere idea. By the end of March 1982, the laughter had ended. I was torn up over the callous way Lee had had me thrown out of the penthouse. You'd think that after all the foster homes I'd lived in, I'd have become an expert when it came to handling rejection. But Lee's harsh eviction was the ultimate cruelty. The worst thing that had happened to me in my 22 years. It really hurt. I'll never forget or forgive the way it was done. The plastic trash bags. My half-brother's presence. A private investigator with the arm that ended in a hook. Being forced to leave the penthouse wearing pajamas. Being told that any attempt to contact Lee or return to Vegas could be hazardous to my health. Any lingering doubts I may have had about my position were soon squelched by my so-called friend, Mr. Y. He made it plain that my life might be in danger if I went against Lee's wishes. Heller had been quite clear the night he handed over my trash-bagged belongings. I was told not to contact Lee. I was not to return to Vegas. Do not pass go, do not collect $200. Unfortunately, this was my life and not a game of Monopoly. My actions and reactions over the next few months were based on what I saw as a very precarious, even dangerous situation. At first, I stayed with the nightclub manager, Mr. Wise employee. Everything I owned, except my jewel case and a few clothes, were out of reach in Vegas. My bank accounts, thanks to my own drug habit and friends like Y, who kept me well and expensively supplied with cocaine, were soon depleted. He and his friend Joe were to be my closest associates and advisors during the months that followed as I tried to sort out my future without Lee. Losing him in such a brutal way helped to accelerate my drug usage, which in turn deepened my problems. My initial attempts at recovering my possessions met with failure. I'd asked a friend who owned a truck to drive up to Vegas and pick them up for me, but he was denied access to both my tract house on Larimore and Lee's home on Shirley Street, where I kept most of my clothes. I couldn't believe it when my friend returned with an empty truck. I'd been told repeatedly that Lee didn't want to see me, but no one had said anything about him keeping my belongings. I just couldn't understand why Lee had ordered his people to do that to me. Obviously, I needed help, legal help, to recover all my possessions. During my years with Lee, Joel Strode, who worked for Lee, had acted as my attorney. But Strode would now be my adversary. I needed to be represented by someone who had no connection with Lee, who would be unimpressed by Lee's fame and power. First, I asked a former foster mother to recommend an attorney. She sent me to two men who had handled her divorce. After a preliminary meeting with me, they concluded that the only means I had of paying for their services was with my jewelry. 
they asked that I hand it over to be held in trust. It seemed like a good idea. I was staying with a known criminal, a man who supplied me with drugs. Clearly, my jewelry would be safer in their hands than in mine. I firmly believed, back in 1982, that attorneys were men of strict moral principles, men who were above suspicion. I'd been taught to look up to educated men like that. Consequently, when those two lawyers said they wanted to put my jewelry into some kind of trust account, I thought they would act in my best interests. Although I didn't realize it then, I was unconsciously looking for someone to replace the father role that Lee had filled in my life. Needing to trust and believe in someone made me vulnerable and careless. I turned the majority of my jewelry over to those two men, and that's the last I ever saw of it. Their offices were ripped off before they could put my valuables into safekeeping. Or so they told me. Exit my first attorneys. At this point, I asked Mr. Y to recommend legal counsel, and he told me to contact David Schmerin. I called at once and made an appointment to meet with Schmerin at Joe's house, a place where Schmerin was a regular visitor. Schmerin readily agreed to represent me in my efforts to get my belongings, house, furniture, cars, and clothing. I was angry enough to discuss palimony, and he agreed that I might have a case. After a couple of preliminary meetings, all held at Joe's home, Schmerin promised to contact Lee's legal representative, Joel Strode, on my behalf. Several of my friends suggested I get out of town while Schmerin made the preliminary moves. It made sense to me. I knew Lee would be angry when he learned that I now had an attorney. In the past, all of Lee's lovers had left quietly after he tired of them. But I was furious at the way I'd been treated and wanted to strike back, to hurt him as much as he'd hurt me. If that wasn't sufficient motivation, my home, my furniture, my cars, and my clothes were still in Vegas, a place I dared not return to without Lee's okay. I knew Lee wouldn't hesitate to use force to get rid of me. Vivid memories of the scene at the penthouse offered graphic proof of that. I also feared that pushing Lee, getting an attorney to represent my interests, might make Lee decide to rid himself of me for good. Leaving town temporarily seemed like the better part of valor. By then I'd learned that Lee had taken a number of steps to sever our ties and keep me from getting near him. Each one poured salt in my still fresh emotional wounds. I was told that the locks on all the properties we'd shared, including my own home, had been changed. The various phone numbers at all those properties had also been changed. I couldn't contact him in any way, short of going to Vegas, which I took to be risking a physical confrontation. But there was one way I could still get to him, and I intended to take full advantage of that situation during the next few days. Lee had neglected to cancel the joint credit card that we'd held for years. I used that card to finance my stay in Hawaii. And believe me, I checked into the best hotel and ate at the best restaurants. Sure, it was wrong. I know that. But doing it gave me a great deal of satisfaction. Lee was holding hostage my mail, my severance check, all my worldly possessions. I still had no more than the things I'd taken from the penthouse. But I did have that credit card, and I took tremendous satisfaction in every charge I made on it. I could imagine Lucille Cunningham's self-righteous outrage when she got the bills, and Lee's after she gave him a full report. Score one for my team. I didn't return to Los Angeles until my attorney told me he was close to arriving at a settlement with Joel Strode. We continued to meet at Joe's house. Then, one evening in Joe's presence, David Schmerin told me that, Liberace was going to be a tough adversary, that he would litigate this thing all the way, and that he had very deep pockets and could hire the best counsel. I don't claim to be an angel. I'm more than willing to accept my share of blame in regard to my breakup with Lee. I know my drug use caused a problem, but the facts speak for themselves. Lee had known about my using coke for months and apparently accepted it. We didn't argue about drugs, once, when Mr. Y left some cocaine in the house after a visit, Liberace actually asked when Y would return to pick up his medicine. As I said before, Lee and I moved in social circles where marijuana and cocaine were as accepted as liquor. Although he may have abhorred my drug habit, Lee had not chosen to get rid of me until he'd found a suitable substitute in Carrie James. Then, and only then, did Lee act. And when he acted, he used force assault and battery, 
and ultimately extortion to rid himself of me. Less than one month after I'd been tossed out of the home Lee and I shared, Schmerin told me that he and Strode had reached an accord, a meeting of the minds. Before Schmerin spelled out the terms of the proposal they had agreed on, he made sure I understood that I would not get my property, not one shirt or sock, not one thin dime, until I signed an agreement. In anybody's book, withholding someone's property, especially when it's done to force them to do something, is illegal. In criminal cases, it's called extortion. In civil cases, conversion. Although the legal document was 12 pages long and carefully couched in lawyer's mumbo-jumbo, the intent was simple. I was to get $75,000, three of my six cars, three dogs, and my clothes. I would be permitted to return to Vegas briefly to pick up my personal possessions. Seymour Heller would personally guarantee my safety and escort me through my house so I could pack my clothes. In return for the money, the cars, the dogs, the return of my personal property... I would be required to sign over to Lee the title to my house on Larimore, currently worth $200,000, and give its contents, which I estimated to have a value in excess of $50,000, to him as well. In addition, I would be required to sign over to Lee title to three cars, my Chevrolet van, an antique Cadillac, and an Auburn. True, some of these things had been gifts from Lee, but they had been given to me freely. I held clear and legal title to them. There had never been any mention of the fact that they would continue to be mine only as long as Lee cared for me. The agreement also specified that I would give up any other claims against Liberace of any nature. I believe that was included in the text to ensure that I wouldn't sue for assault and battery, or, more important, for palimony. Last but far from least, the document included a clause that prohibited me from revealing the true nature of my relationship with Lee. The offer shortchanged me by about a quarter of a million dollars. But I was playing by Lee's rules, and they were simple. I signed or I wouldn't get a thing. The agreement actually spelled out the extortion or conversion in subparagraph 6, where it said that Liberace would tender to Thorson, as soon as practical after the date hereof, all the clothes and personal belongings now in the possession or control of Liberace. By admitting in a legal document that my personal belongings were in Lee's control and wouldn't be returned until I signed. Lee unwittingly admitted to the conversion of my property. As we drove to Strode's Beverly Hills offices on April 22nd, 1982, Schmerin told me it was the best deal I could hope to get, that my drug addiction would make me a very unsympathetic witness should my dispute with Lee wind up in court. He talked about Lee's power, his money, his ability to carry on a legal battle no matter what the cost. Back in 1982, I was desperate for money. I owed for drugs, and no one had to tell me what would happen if I didn't pay those debts. I had no place to live, few clothes, no car, no job. The agreement, in effect, was a legal gun held to my head. If I wanted any of my property returned, including my paychecks and all my personal documents and memorabilia, I would have to sign. I had no chance of beginning my life over until I did. So I walked into Strote's office and signed, even though I felt the document was unfair. I scribbled my signature and took that check from Strote's hand and thanked God I finally had some money again. To my surprise, the check was made out to both me and Schmerin. Since I didn't have a local bank account, Schmerin suggested that we drive to his bank to make the deposit, he said he'd give me my share of the proceeds when the check cleared. He'd been working under a contingency agreement and was to receive one-third of the settlement, while I got the remaining two-thirds. A few days after the meeting in Strode's office, I returned to Vegas and went through the house on Larimore, accompanied by Seymour Heller, only to discover that many of my personal belongings had already disappeared. When I asked if there might have been a burglary despite a newly installed security system, Heller nodded in agreement. In reality, later testimony would show that Lee had asked Gladys to pack my things immediately following our breakup. What happened to them after that is anybody's guess. I came away from Vegas angry and upset, knowing I'd been ripped off, wanting to lash out and hurt Lee in any way I could. The period from Rose Caracappa's death to my return to Vegas seemed like a waking nightmare. Lee was at the center of it all.
I'd loved him, trusted him, even at the very end. Now he had failed to live up to the terms of an agreement he himself insisted I sign. It had never occurred to me that he would withhold some of my prized possessions. A valuable collection of porcelain flowers, a bronze sculpture, a television set, a favorite ring that commemorated our meeting. These were never returned. Apparently the papers we'd signed didn't mean a damn thing to Lee. As far as I was concerned, the whole thing had been a con and I was the world's biggest chump for falling for it. Lee had brushed me aside as easily and as thoughtlessly as he swatted a housefly. Like Jerry O'Rourke before me, I'd cease to exist where Lee was concerned. But unlike Jerry, I made up my mind not to take what Lee dished out without a fight. He wasn't going to be rid of me that easily. 25. On October 14, 1982, I filed suit against Liberace in Los Angeles County Superior Court. Much has been written about that suit. Most of it inaccurate. It was usually described as a palimony suit, with all the overtones of a juicy sex scandal that such a suit implies. In fact, palimony was only one of 13 causes of action. Most important was the cause of action based on extortion and conversion of my property. The lawyers debate the legalities of my case far better than I can. But there was one unlisted cause of action, the most important one in my mind, that drove me into court. Six months after being thrown out of the penthouse, I still hadn't stopped caring for Lee. I missed him in so many ways, like a child longing for a lost parent, a lover yearning for a loved one, a lonely man longing to see a friend. My entire life had been wrapped up in Lee. I couldn't figure out how to go on without him. While Lee and I lived together, I had no idea how emotionally dependent on him I'd become. But I felt like a cripple without him. I sued because it was the only way I could continue to be a part of his life. The only way I could ensure that he wouldn't forget me. Like a kid who prefers negative attention to no attention, I didn't care if the suit made Lee hate me. Just so long as he didn't forget me. Anyone who has ever been rejected by someone they still love will understand my motivation. I just wasn't able to let go. There were, of course, financial considerations as well. Lee had promised, time and time again in front of witnesses, to care for me for life, to have an exclusive and loving relationship with me. The fact that I'd been tossed aside for a younger man, a kid who looked much like me before my plastic surgery, infuriated me. I really wanted to hurt Lee. Anyone who says you can't love and hate a person at the same time is wrong. I loved and hated Lee in 1982, and I still feel the same way. Not a day passes when I don't think about him, sometimes with anger, more often with affection. When I brought my suit against Lee, I was represented by another, my third attorney, Michael Rosenthal. Rosenthal specializes in personal injury cases, not exactly the expertise needed for my problem. But I'd met Rosenthal through friends, and he seemed to wholeheartedly believe in me and the merits of my case. We got along quite well. My search for a competent, ethical, morally upright legal counsel reminded me of Diogenes's search for an honest man and was to prove just as difficult. Rosenthal seemed to have my interests at heart rather than his own. He proved to be ambitious and energetic on my behalf, even if I occasionally disagreed with his strategies. After we had a series of interviews, he concluded that the best way to get Lee's attention was through the press. Lee went to great lengths during his lifetime to conceal his sexual preference from the public. Now Rosenthal decided to blow the lid off the situation by notifying the media that he was about to file a multi-million dollar suit on my behalf against my former lover, Liberace. Not unexpectedly, the ladies and gentlemen of the press were at the courthouse in force when I arrived with Rosenthal. Cameras clicked frantically, television lights blazed, and eager reporters begged for a statement as we walked into the courthouse. Being courted by the press felt wonderful after being ignored for so many months by the man I cared for. I felt important for the first time in a long time. It was virtually the first satisfying moment I'd had in the six months Lee and I had been apart. It would also be the last. As it turned out, Rosenthal hadn't bargained for Lee's popularity and power. The torrent of publicity we received that day soon generated what I think of as the war in the tabloids.
a war that we had no chance of winning, even though we struck the first blow. Rosenthal intended to use negative publicity to bring Lee to his knees and have him begging to settle the case. After filing the suit, his next move was to place a call to the National Enquirer, offering them my exclusive story, for a fee, of course. Rosenthal negotiated a $32,000 deal, half of which he would collect for his services. The November 2nd, 1982 edition of the Enquirer, with a picture of Lee and me on the cover, bore the banner headline, Liberace Bombshell, Boyfriend Tells All. And I did. The Enquirer article covered our homosexual love affair, the plastic surgery, the promises of lifetime support and the proposed adoption, Lee's new relationship with Carrie James, and my subsequent eviction from the penthouse and from Lee's life. The story, which ran in two issues, was guaranteed to get Lee's attention. We expected him to ask for a settlement immediately, but we'd made a classic tactical mistake. That of using our best weapon first. Full public disclosure, instead of holding it in reserve. The night the story broke, Lee was appearing somewhere in the Midwest. Friends later told me that he was scared to death to go on stage, afraid his fans would hiss and boo now that they knew the truth. But Lee needn't have been concerned. When he walked out to face the audience, they gave him a standing ovation. Either they hadn't believed the things I'd said in the Enquirer article or they could forgive Lee anything, including having sex with young men. That ovation brought tears to Lee's eyes and gave him the strength to face everything that lay ahead. Predictably, he came out of his corner fighting. Looking back, everything he did after the publication of the Enquirer articles was inevitable, in view of his track record. I should have been smart enough to realize that Lee wouldn't take quietly being publicly branded a homosexual that he'd fight my allegations with every weapon in his arsenal. He used the press to strike the next blow, and from then on, I was at his mercy in the media. By the time Lee finished with me, I don't think anyone believed my story except my attorney. Lee retaliated by giving an exclusive interview to another major tabloid, The Globe. Their November 2nd, 1982 front page bore the headline, Gaze Out to Assassinate Me says Liberace. The page nine story began, These vicious lies. It's nuts, says Starr, as Gay sues him for $113 million. Lee was quoted as follows. This man is a former disgruntled employee. He was fired in 1982 because of excessive use of drugs and alcohol, because he carried firearms. This is an outrageous, Lee's favorite word, and vicious attempt to assassinate my character. We will fight this fully in the court. We will show that all of this is a fraud. The article continued. A source close to the superstar, who often speaks on his behalf, I suppose this was Seymour Heller's contribution to Lee's defense, says this is not the first time Liberace has been the victim of slander at the hands of the gays. It's a battle he has had to fight throughout his career. Every time it's happened before, we've fought it and won. And we'll win this time, and every other time, too. This quotation epitomizes the kind of thinking that prevailed throughout Lee's life. He simply refused to admit his sexual preference. Even if by refusing, he found himself slandering the very group of men who were closest to him. Gay men. In my opinion... His inability to deal openly and frankly with his own sexuality was a personal tragedy. Lee continued his pathetic charade right up to the grave. And then his people, Heller and Strote, continued the battle for him. Back in 1982, the Globe article was a masterpiece of half-truths. The story detailed how well Liberace had treated me, saying, Liberace gave him the best clothes, the best cars, and spending money that was just out of sight. The reporter who wrote the article never questioned why Lee would have done all that for a mere chauffeur. The article closed with an interview with a hypnotist who claimed he'd been employed by Lee to help Lee overcome the pain of a broken love affair. The implication is the love affair had been with a woman. Reality is, it was with me. According to the hypnotist, Lee had said, When negative people are around me, I say to them, Kvetch, 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 and they usually snap out of it. 
If they don't, I avoid them in the future and keep them out of my life. I can almost hear Lee saying those words. They certainly represented his philosophy. He would go to any lengths to put what he called negative people or negative incidents behind him. He'd done it with Vince Cardell. He'd done it when his mother died. And now he was determined to do it with me. Lee had made up his mind to bury me. And he had the power and the influence to do it. A major player in the next battle of the tabloid wars was Dirk Summers. He claimed to be a descendant of the Drew family that produced all the Barrymores. His biographical sketch also says that he was an associate producer on television's prestigious Hallmark Hall of Fame, a producer for Sammy Davis Jr., and the producer of 65 television shows and 11 motion pictures. And he was rumored to be screen actress June Allison's former husband. It sounds impressive. But in 1982, Summers' career as a television writer and producer had sagged. On October 28, 1982, in response to my original bombshell article in The Inquirer, Dirk Summers wrote a letter to Ian Calder, the publisher of The Inquirer, that said in part, Rarely have I read such a scurrilous attack on an international figure. The issue is not Lee Liberace, but the greed and lies by your source, Scott Thorson. I have made many documentaries, and in 1975 I was preparing a documentary on prostitution, both male and female. We were bombarded by calls and letters from prostitutes, both male and female, who wanted to be included in our production. One of the male aspirants was Scott Thorson, although he had one or two other names at the time. During the course of the interview, he told me of various Johns that he had turned on and of the kinky experiences, sexual, that he was involved in with numerous men. The verbatim quotes are taken from depositions that became part of the court records. The letter, which continued to take potshots at me while singing Liberace's praises, wasn't written for Ian Calder's benefit. In my opinion, it was written to let Liberace know that Dirk Summers was ready, willing, and able to destroy my reputation by proving I'd been a male prostitute. Summers sent a copy of the letter to Seymour Heller, a man he would later describe as Lee's alter ego, along with a cover letter stating that Summers would be more than happy to testify on Lee's behalf should my suit come to trial. In the cover letter, Summers claims to know that I was arrested for prostitution. By his own admission... Summers had been deluged with letters and phone calls from male and female prostitutes back in 1975 when he was putting together a show on prostitution. He claimed to have interviewed me at the time, although he said I used an alias. Seven years had passed since that one so-called and admittedly short interview. I'd aged, had plastic surgery, and was using my own name, Scott Thorson, when Summers claimed to recognize me from my picture in the Inquirer as the kid he'd met years earlier. It shouldn't have taken too much intelligence to realize how unlikely it would be that Summers could have remembered me out of the many male and female prostitutes whom he describes as bombarding him with messages in 1975. Had Seymour Heller or Joel Stroh taken the trouble to investigate Summers' claims, they would have learned that I was living with a foster family in 1975, as well as going to school. I was not, nor have I ever been, a male prostitute but it didn't appear to me that Lee's people were interested in getting the facts. Their sole interest seemed to be getting a weapon they could use against me in the tabloids, a weapon Summers obligingly supplied. Summers came to Lee's attention in the most favorable way. In the days that followed, Seymour Heller made direct contact with Summers, setting up a meeting at Summers' home on November 6th, a meeting also attended by Joel Strode. At that meeting... Summers said he had information about my supposed past activities as a male prostitute that could be helpful to Liberace. On November 8th, Summers was contacted again by Heller and Strode, who asked if he would be willing to tell his story to Mike Snow, a reporter for The Globe. The next day, Snow called Summers, and the two men had a very lengthy conversation that resulted in a new banner headline for The Globe's December 2nd issue, Wicked Past of the Gay Suing Liberace. The Summers interview began. He, meaning me, told me he was turning 25 tricks a day. Since male prostitutes are often the doer rather than the doe, that would have taken a runaway libido. A man who can turn 25 tricks a day is a better man than I have ever been or will be.
The Globe went on to give lurid details of my supposed life as a boy prostitute. Early in December 1982, Liberace promised to lend his name to a golf tournament Summers said he planned to hold on March 25th to 26th, 1983, at the Dunes Country Club in Las Vegas. Having secured a top celebrity name, Summers was able to raise a great deal of money from would-be tournament sponsors. When the golf tournament failed to materialize, Summers ran into trouble with the law and with Liberace. Lee later claimed he had never given Summers permission to use the Liberace name. Eventually, Summers came to my attorneys, volunteering to say he had never been sure I was one of the interviewees in his proposed prostitution show, and that he now realized he'd been completely in error about the entire episode. By then, we were suing the Globe for defamation of character, and Summers' testimony would have been helpful. One other person had played a major role in ruining my name, none other than my half-brother, Wayne Johansson. Next to the interview obtained from Summers, the Globe published an article attributed to Johansson and again written by Mike Snow. My half-brother had invented a story about my wicked homosexual past, saying I had my first lover when I was 11. He even soiled my relationship with the Brummets by claiming I had a homosexual affair with Mr. Brummett when I was 15. The Summers story had angered me. My half-brother sickened me. We hadn't been close for a long time, but I never expected him to turn on me in such a cruel and vicious way. By the end of 1982, Liberace had obviously won the tabloid wars. He had the money, the power, the popularity to make the public believe his side of the story. I don't begrudge him that brief happiness, even though it meant that the public didn't believe the things I'd said. I don't even begrudge him his relationship with Carrie James. Lee would win the war in the tabloids, and he would win almost all the legal battles, but he wouldn't win the final fight of his life. The Battle Against AIDS. 26. When I filed suit against Lee, it didn't occur to me that I'd be unleashing a drama that would consume the next five years of my life. The Los Angeles Superior Court calendar is a crowded one. On average, it takes four or more years from the date of filing until a plaintiff has his or her day in court. In my case, trial would be set for early spring 1987. By then, the defendant would be dead. Today, the legal documents, summonses, complaints, cross-complaints, demurs, depositions, copies of items and evidence fill five large cartons. They represent countless hours of work on the part of a half-dozen attorneys and court reporters, as well as many hours spent under oath for plaintiffs, defendants, and material witnesses. My own depositions, numbering more than a thousand pages, make a stack far thicker than this book. Late 1982 saw Lee and me locked in a battle in the tabloids, a war he won handily. From 1983 on, we would be caught up in a series of legal maneuvers. As Lee threatened in his Globe interview, he was prepared to litigate forever if that's what it took to win. Joel Strode quickly emerged as Lee's staunch defender, a man who would stop at nothing to protect his boss. Since the most important part of my case was based on conversion of property, Rosenthal soon realized he needed an expert co-counsel, someone with an extensive background in business litigation. All my other attorneys had been recommended by friends, but Ernst Lipschutz had been recommended by a prestigious New York law firm. He impressed me favorably during our first meeting. He was a soft-spoken man of medium height, with alert, inquisitive eyes. From day one, he looked, sounded, and acted like a polished professional. Lipschutz specialized in business litigation, focusing on business fraud. At our first meeting, he made it clear that he didn't believe in the kind of grandstanding and playing to the media that had resulted in massive tabloid coverage. Lipschutz said if he came on board, he would refuse to conduct the case in the hot glare of media attention. There would be no more press conferences, no more exclusive interviews with the tabloids. He was, he informed us, a lawyer, not a circus master. I had to agree that the publicity I had received thus far had resulted only in my being branded as a liar and a street hustler. Lipschutz insisted that, from then on, the case would be conducted with as much dignity as we could muster. The first item on his agenda, after agreeing to become co-counsel, was to urge me to drop the ninth cause of action involving the so-called palimony. That came as a shock. 
The ninth cause of action was the one the media had focused on, the one that got all the headlines, the one that hurt Lee the most personally. By then, I'd wanted to embarrass him as much as possible. Rightly or wrongly, I felt he'd ruined my life, and I'd made up my mind to make him suffer for it. As Lipschutz talked about the proper way to conduct the case, I couldn't help thinking, who the hell is this guy? Coming in here and telling us what to do after one day on the case, when Rosenthal had been handling it for months. The ninth cause of action, based on Lee's promises to adopt me, to care for me forever, was the most important one from a personal standpoint. Sure, money was a consideration. I'd be crazy to say it didn't matter. But exposing Lee to public ridicule, holding him up to the world as a liar, was even more important. Those promises had been made in front of a number of Lee's people. They knew the truth. And unless they perjured themselves, the public would know the truth when I had my day in court. I also knew Lee would interpret dropping the ninth cause of action as a sign of weakness, and I wanted him to know I was prepared to pursue the case as long and as vigorously as he was. Lipschutz patiently explained his reasoning, saying that the judge was likely to dismiss the palimony cause on the grounds that a contract for sex couldn't be enforced, that Liberace, Strode, and Heller who would be far better witnesses than I, would probably be believed if they said that Lee never made any promises to me about caring for me financially. Lipschutz added that if a judge ruled against the ninth cause of action in a preliminary hearing, we'd be in the unfortunate position of starting the real trial looking like losers. He said our proof was much stronger in the other areas of the case, and he wanted to do everything in his power to get us into court looking like winners. Unfortunately, I wasn't thinking very clearly in those days. Logically, everything Lipschutz said made sense, but emotionally I couldn't go along with it. I wanted to punish Lee, and the best way to do that was to go right on reminding the public, through the palimony portion of the case, that Lee was gay. It was his Achilles heel. That proved to be a mistake. Predictably, one of Lee's attorney's pre-trial activities was to file a summary judgment motion requesting the ninth cause of action be dropped. A hearing on the motion was set for February 1983. Disaster struck when Lipschutz had a heart attack a couple of days before the scheduled hearing. By then, I was of the opinion that Lipschutz was better suited to handle some of the aspects of my case. Rosenthal asked for a continuance, but the judge refused to grant one, saying that as long as I had legal representation, he saw no reason to delay. Just as Lipschutz had predicted, the judge dismissed the ninth cause of action on the grounds that a contract for sex can't be enforced. Lee and his attorneys had won the first of the many legal battles. Then Lee, who'd already demonstrated his masterful use of the media, gave an interview to Neil Carlin of Newsweek concerning the results of the hearing. The Newsweek article said in part, In 1982... Scott Thorson filed a $113 million palimony suit, charging that Liberace had promised to support the Las Vegas dancer in exchange for sexual services. It didn't take the judge long to decide I was being exploited, says Liberace of the case, which was thrown out of a Los Angeles court in February. I could have stopped the whole thing before it started by paying off, he remembers, but that would have been blackmail, and blackmail never ends. Today, the tabloid slander finally behind him Liberace gratefully acknowledges his fans' willingness to forgive, forget, or not care. The article made marvelous reading for Lee's loyal admirers, but it was far from accurate. First, I had never claimed to be a Las Vegas dancer. Second, the case wasn't thrown out of court. The other twelve causes of action had yet to be settled, and despite many attempts to get them dismissed too, would still be pending when Lee became ill. Third, if anyone had been guilty of blackmail, it was Lee when he withheld my property. Fourth, there had been enough slander on both sides of the dispute to last a lifetime. As soon as Lipschutz was back on his feet, he filed a libel action on my behalf against Newsweek and Liberace. My case spawned a number of corollary cases. The original suit included Schmerin, Schnelker, Strode, and Heller as Liberace's co-defendants. Early in the legal maneuvering, Rosenthal decided to drop Strode from the suit to narrow the case's focus, but he didn't obtain a release from Strode. Strode filed a suit for malicious prosecution against Rosenthal and me. Liberace, Heller, and Schmerin filed counter-complaints. 
We filed a libel action against the Globe, Mike Snow and Wayne Johansson. Marie Brummett sued the Globe to clear her husband's name. Michael Rosenthal was suing Joel Strode for slander, claiming that Strode, in the presence of Rosenthal's father and others, said, How is your love life with Scott Thorson? I understand that love blooms between the two of you. Which one of you is the husband and which is the wife? It's an unfortunate fact of life that all my attorneys, none of whom was gay, would be subject to such speculation. Being a lawyer, Rosenthal struck back in court. My battle with Lee resulted in two other suits. Tracy Schnelker sued Liberace for the part Schnelker had been caused to play in the whole affair. That case was still pending when Lee died. Last, a criminal case against Dirk Summers had been filed for Summers' part in promoting and taking money for the bogus golf tournament. By the end of 1983, we were all suit slap happy. I lost track of the many times I had depositions taken. We battled every step of the way. Simple things, such as the place Lee would be deposed, became major points of conflict. He wanted to be deposed in Las Vegas. Inadvisable, said Lipschutz, in view of the fact that the case would be tried in Los Angeles Superior Court. Then Lee insisted on being deposed in Strote's office. For psychological reasons, Lipschutz didn't want Lee questioned on what Lee regarded as friendly turf. After Lipschutz filed a motion to enforce a Los Angeles deposition, Lee agreed to be deposed in the Los Angeles court stenographer's offices. The lawyers wrangled over everything, from permitting me to take cigarette breaks during my depositions to how to guarantee everyone's safety and privacy during the proceedings. Lee's people said they feared Rosenthal and I would turn the depositions into a media circus. My lawyers argued that I feared for my personal safety because of what I had construed as threats against my life from people associated with Lee. Early in the case, Rosenthal and I decided we wanted Joel Strote removed as Lee's attorney of record because he'd acted as my counsel on a number of occasions in the past. Technically, we were right. It did create a conflict of interest. But Lipschutz argued that Strote, although a competent lawyer, was far from being the best in the business. Lipschutz feared that having Strode dismissed would result in Lee's hiring a heavy hitter. Again, we overruled Lipschutz's very sound advice. And Lee did just what Lipschutz predicted. He brought in Marshall Grossman, a senior member of one of the most powerful and prestigious law firms in Los Angeles. From that day on, it was to be an uphill battle for my side. Grossman was tops, and he had unlimited funds at his disposal. Lipschutz was tops, but hampered by my inability to supply him with funds and by a sometimes obstructive client. My continued use of cocaine didn't help me or my case. During my depositions, Grossman, who'd been thoroughly briefed on all my weaknesses, did everything in his power to upset me, to keep me off balance, and he succeeded. I didn't make a very good impression as a witness on my own behalf. To my surprise, neither did Lee. He tried to impress the court reporter by telling her how much money he made an hour, and in general, he seemed unprepared. I hadn't seen him for months, and it was hard to control my emotions while I listened to him giving his version of how our relationship had ended. Looking back, the whole experience has a nightmarish quality. Month after month and year after year, Lee used his money, his power, and his popularity to hammer away at us. I don't know why we didn't give up. I had no money to pay my attorneys, no money to hire investigators, no money to pay for depositions. The money from the original settlement had been quickly spent on lawyers' fees and cocaine. Getting a job wasn't easy because everyone in Hollywood knew, thanks to the tabloids, that I had a drug problem. I'd finally gone to work at United Postal Centers in West Hollywood and worked there until I began this book, thanks to a very understanding employer named Carol Rosen. But I had no skills and it wasn't a high-paying job. I made barely enough to support myself, let alone fight a prolonged legal battle. Lipschutz covered almost all of the case's costs out of his own pocket. By 1985, I think he'd invested more than $10,000 in my suit. It had become a matter of principle for him. A David and Goliath battle. There were occasional good days. In particular, one day before Strode's dismissal from the case, he was making an attempt to get the presiding judge to dismiss my entire suit. Strote asserted that once I had signed the original April 22, 1982 agreement, which stated I was not forced to sign it, I had no further right to sue. The judge looked at him long and hard before commenting, Are you saying you believe 
I could force you to sign an agreement not to sue by pointing a gun at your head, and you couldn't void the agreement by proving you weren't forced to sign it? Strote replied confidently, Yes, Your Honor. The judge grimaced and said Strote could not convince him that that was the law of California. Lipschitz broke into a contented smile, but he seldom had much to smile about. I think he was probably the only man in the country who believed I told the truth about my past and my life with Lee. On his own, at his own expense, Lipschutz had traveled around California investigating my background, talking to people who'd known me when I was growing up. During his travels, Lipschutz had come to know a very different man from the spoiled, drug-addicted, emotional mess who emerged from a five-year relationship with Liberace. Lipschutz had come to know the independent self-starter I'd been. More than anyone else, he'd learned how much I'd lost by loving Lee. Not money, not cars, not my home. What I'd lost was myself. Lipschutz knew it, and I think that's why he fought so hard on my behalf. His motivation sure as hell wasn't the money. While I slogged through each day, trying to get my head straight and usually failing, Lee had embarked on a relationship with Carrie James, similar to the relationship he and I had shared. Like me, James went everywhere with Lee. I occasionally saw them pictured together in some periodical, and it hurt like hell at first. Gradually, the pain faded as I filled my life with other things. But it was never easy. Early in 1986, Lee embarked on a powerful public relations ploy. He began a book that would reinforce the bogus life history he'd been selling the public for so long. It would be published by Harper and Row in late 1986, entitled... The Wonderful Private World of Liberace. After all the scandal, all the gossip, Lee said he wanted to set the record straight. The second paragraph of the book states, This latest effort deals with my private life, the offstage person few people know about. The text was classic Liberace, a mixture of truth, half-truth, and outright lies. On the first page, Lee detailed the type of questions he faced when interviewed by the media. To the query, have you had a facelift? He replied, not yet. But if you think I've already had one, it means I can still wait until my friend and authority on the subject, Phyllis Diller, tells me it's necessary. In fact, Lee had had two facelifts and a deep skin peel. To the query, is that your real hair? He replied, the hair is real but the color only my hairdresser knows. In fact, the hair was real, but it had grown on someone else's head. The fiction continued. Lee, who'd always refused to discuss his sex life prior to my suit, titled Chapter 16, How I Lost My Virginity. In it, he claimed to have been seduced at the age of 16 by a blues singer named B. Haven. Then he wrote, The thrill of making it with an older woman diminished as I grew older. Younger girls started to represent more of a challenge, probably because of their innocence. I was disgusted by Lee's lies. The text bore no resemblance to the things he told me, unless you substituted football player for blues singer, men for women, and boys for girls. Then, and only then, does it come near the truth. The book is larded with pictures, including one of Carrie James, Lee, and Kenny Rogers, all standing with their arms around each other. James is simply labeled as my friend. In other publications, he'd been called a chauffeur, a secretary, a companion. All Lee's usual euphemisms. Looking through the lavishly illustrated text brings back a lot of memories of the houses we bought and decorated together. The dogs we both loved. The Liberace family. And most especially Francis, who I had come to care for. Those photographs fill me with nostalgia. But the misrepresentations in the text are so blatant that I get angry every time I read it. The one that upsets me the most deals with Liberace's health. By 1986, rumors about Lee's health were circulating throughout the entertainment industry and the gay community. I don't know for certain if he knew he had AIDS when he wrote the following words, but he certainly had to know he was a very sick man. For the first time in his life, Lee no longer had a weight problem. He wrote, He meaning Lee's physician, Dr. Elias Gainham, was concerned over reports that I'd lost 30 pounds on a, would you believe, watermelon diet. In subsequent testing, he discovered I'd robbed my system of essential nutrients, 
which was causing me to experience a letdown in my normal high energy level. Some of his testing required special equipment and had to be performed in a local hospital. As a result, false rumors started to circulate about my health. According to the gossips, you name it and I had it. Let me assure you, I've never felt better in my life. These words ring with pathetic bravado now. They were written by a man who, in less than a year, would be dead of AIDS. 27. By the beginning of 1986, the legal battle was so acrimonious that my attorney, Ernst Lipschutz, and Lee's attorney, Marshall Grossman, had developed a bitter adversarial relationship. Twelve of my suit's original causes of action had yet to be settled, despite the fact that Grossman had done everything in his power, using every weapon in his vast legal arsenal to get the rest of my case dismissed. Everyone involved, from principals to witnesses to counsel, had been sucked into the mud-slinging, name-calling mire of accusation and counter-accusation. I'd never anticipated that so much time, energy, and talent would be consumed by what had started out to be nothing more than a lover's quarrel. There seemed to be no way to turn back. As Lee said in one of his depositions, he was caught in a war he never made. There were times when I too wished I could forget the whole thing. But we'd long since passed the point of no return. The suit had developed a life of its own. By then, our attorneys had an interest in winning that was so consuming that at times it seemed as if they were the injured parties. I sat in on the first of Lee's depositions, feeling completely miserable every time I looked at him. Over the years, it became easier to remember our relationship. I could look at him, even say a civil hello, without feeling torn by the desire to hit him or hug him. But we hadn't spoken in private, and I didn't think we ever would. Carrie James was still with him, and so far Lee showed no signs of tiring of his new companion. It came as a bolt out of the blue when Lee called me early in 1986. His voice sounded unchanged, still as familiar to me as my own. I remember thinking my imagination was playing tricks on me when I heard Lee say, Scott, is that you? We'd been at war so long that I'd long ago given up any hope of reconciliation. But suddenly, the four years since our last conversation disappeared. I felt as if we had talked just yesterday. As if all the bitterness, the anger had happened between two other men. A part of me had been waiting for that phone call since the Academy Awards ceremony in 1982. And now that it was finally happening, I didn't know how to handle it. So many things ran through my mind. Had Lee called, after all that time, to say he was sorry about everything? Was he going to make a personal appeal to me to settle out of court? Did he hope to be friends again in spite of everything? None of those ideas sounded likely. And yet I couldn't help hoping those were his reasons for telephoning. Hearing his voice made me realize how much I'd missed him. How have you been? Lee asked, as if he'd been calling me every day and this was just another in a series of friendly conversations. Fine, just fine, I replied, knowing that he hated a kvetch that he wouldn't want to hear I couldn't seem to get my life back together without him. And your health, Lee continued, with a tinge of anxiety elevating his voice. How's your health? I'm fine, I said again, although that wasn't quite true. I still used cocaine despite a dozen attempts to kick the habit. It kept me thin, nervous, and broke. Are you sure you're feeling all right? Lee persisted. Sure, Lee, I'm fine, I reiterated. Wondering why, after four years of silence, he would call to inquire about my health. Then it hit me. The unspoken fear that hides in the dark corners of every gay's mind. Please, God, no, I thought. Let me be wrong. Not Lee. Don't let it be happening to Lee. So far, unlike so many other members of the homosexual community, I'd been lucky. None of my friends had died of AIDS even though the obits and variety reported an increasing number of deaths among young, single show business males. It wasn't hard to read between the lines and figure out that many of those deaths were related to AIDS. I'd even heard a few rumors about Lee. He'd lost weight in the last couple of months, and gossip within the gay community had it that AIDS was the cause. But I'd ignored the gossip. Hollywood is often more successful at creating rumors than it is at making movies. There are always stories making the rounds, and Lee, by denying his homosexuality, 
had certainly alienated the gay community. No wonder they talked about him. But the stories were, I'd reassured myself, just vicious lies. I could hear Lee clearing his throat. Well, he said, I guess you've heard that I haven't been feeling too well. Sure, I replied, but I didn't take it seriously. Are you all right? Silence. The wire hummed with it. It seemed to last forever. My God, I thought. It's true. Finally, Lee said, I just wanted to be sure you're okay, Scott. And I'm glad you are. He sounded genuinely relieved. We talked a little about mutual friends. I had a hard time keeping any hint of emotion out of my voice while we chatted. I knew that Lee had called me for a reason. I also knew he'd never be able to spell that reason out. We were still locked in a court battle, and no matter what changes occurred in his life or mine, he'd never forgive me for suing him and publicly branding him as gay. But legal battles and personal vendettas aside, Lee wasn't a big enough bastard to let me go on living my life without warning me about his condition. It didn't take any special brilliance on my part to figure out what that condition was. I believe that Lee called me because he wanted to do the right thing, to warn me that he had AIDS. Then, despite his good intentions, he couldn't go through with it. So he'd concentrated on making sure I wasn't sick, knowing I'd put two and two together and go see my own doctor. I sat still as a stone for a long time after hanging up, turning the brief conversation over and over in my mind, desperate to come up with some other reason for Lee to call. After all, I reassured myself, he hadn't really come out and declared, I have AIDS. Maybe I was making too much of it, reading things into what he'd said that weren't there. I felt scared, more scared than I'd been the day Lee had evicted me from the penthouse. God... I didn't want to think about Lee having AIDS because that meant that there was a chance, a very good chance, that I had it too. I sure as hell didn't want to die, not at 27. Like most gay men, I'd read everything there was to read about AIDS. It didn't seem possible that Lee could have contracted it during the years we'd been together. As far as I knew, we'd been faithful to each other right up until the last week. I had no proof of Lee's infidelity prior to our breakup. We were both too jealous to go along with the open relationship that Lee had proposed. There'd been a lot of flirting, but I didn't think it had gone any further. While the AIDS virus had been leapfrogging through the gay community, Lee and I had been in a seemingly monogamous relationship. So how the hell, I asked myself, could we have gotten AIDS? No matter what, I still cared about him a lot. I always would. Lee had been my best friend, my mentor. We'd had some good times. I missed those times, and I always will. I didn't want him to die. I don't know how long I sat quietly, trying to deal with that phone call. Deep down, I knew Lee had AIDS. I couldn't help remembering the two Frenchmen who'd been a brief part of Lee's life back in 1982 when we broke up. During that period, I'd heard other stories about the way Lee used his newfound freedom, stories of excessive behavior on his part. There'd have been more than enough time in the years since we parted for him to have contracted it. And from things I'd heard, he'd been sexually active enough to have put himself at extreme risk. Damn Lee and his libido. His philosophy that too much of a good thing is wonderful. I knew he wouldn't have called for any other reason. But as long as Lee continued to fight the suit, as long as he pursued his career, I couldn't be absolutely positive about his illness. It was easier to think Lee had called because of a whim, because he suddenly got lonely for old times and old friends. Nevertheless, I began to follow his career more closely, to check to see if he was playing Vegas or Tahoe or L.A. And I saw my own doctor. Getting a clean bill of health was an enormous relief and reinforced my hope that I'd been way off base about Lee's call. At first, Lee's work schedule seemed relatively normal, he continued to play enough dates to allay my worries. More important, his attorney, Marshall Grossman, continued to pursue the case. Within a couple of weeks, I'd almost managed to convince myself that I'd completely misinterpreted the phone call. When I heard, via the grapevine, that Lee would be making his long-dreamed-of appearance at Radio City Music Hall sometime in the fall of 1986, I felt sure he was fine. Then, one night... In June 1986, I ran into him at a restaurant in the Beverly Center in Beverly Hills, and after getting a good look at him, denial was no longer possible.
I hadn't seen Lee for a year, and his appearance came as a shock. Lee had always been a stocky man with a barrel chest. He'd gotten increasingly overweight during the years we'd been together, and we'd laughed about how much he loved food and hated dieting. Occasionally, he'd give lip service to the idea of losing weight. But when the time came, he just couldn't do it. There was always a new restaurant or a new recipe to try, or a favorite meal served up by Gladys. Lee couldn't deny himself the pleasures of the table any more than he could deny himself the pleasures of the bed. Yet that night at the Beverly Center, it was obvious that he'd lost a lot of weight. I didn't believe the stories his people had been broadcasting about the famous watermelon diet. Lee should have looked terrific, the way most people do when they drop an unwanted 30 or 40 pounds. But he didn't. Under his makeup, he looked pale, sick, and old. We stood and talked briefly. I lied and said he looked great, that being thin became him. He asked about my health again, and then again, staring at me almost as hard as he had the night we first met. The message was plain. If I had the guts to deal with what he meant rather than what he said. I didn't need to hear a doctor's diagnosis to know what ailed Lee. In response to his queries, I told Lee I'd seen my own doctor and felt great. I knew Lee would get my meaning. He smiled, told me he was happy for me, and we parted. By then, the entire world knew that Rock Hudson had died of AIDS. I expected it would be just a matter of months before the public knew Lee had the same disease. Poor Lee. He'd spent a lifetime denying his own homosexuality in public, fighting the papers, the tabloids, fighting me for daring to tell the truth. Soon, everyone would be able to judge his personal honesty for themselves. Heller couldn't handle this problem for him. The best medical minds in the world couldn't. It would take a miracle to help Lee now. Sometime in early autumn, 1986... Ernst Lipschutz called to say he'd been advised that Lee had dismissed Grossman as his attorney of record. A new attorney, Tony Bruno, had been hired in Grossman's place. In my opinion, Lipschutz said, that can only mean one thing. I think they're going to try and settle out of court. They know Grossman and I have become adversaries in every sense of the word. So they've brought in someone else to work out an agreement. Lipschutz's intuition turned out to be right on the money. Tony Bruno raised the topic of an out-of-court settlement almost at once. I asked Lipschutz to try to find out if the offer was motivated by Lee's deteriorating health. But Bruno stonewalled the question. According to her, Liberace had never felt better. When asked if there was a special reason why the settlement offer came this late in the game, she replied that Lee just wanted to put an end to our dispute. I didn't believe Bruno for a minute, and neither did Lipschutz. I told him about the phone call and the chance meeting in the restaurant. He knew what I suspected. The offer to settle out of court merely confirmed my suspicions. But three more months would pass before the scheduled court date for a voluntary settlement conference. Meanwhile, Lee was making preparations for his appearance at Radio City Music Hall. The show, which climaxed his career, would run more than two hours, and Lee had agreed to do a total of 21 performances. The demanding routine would have taxed the strength of a young entertainer. But for Lee, 67 years old and suffering from AIDS, it was damn near suicidal. Common sense dictated that he cancel the appearance. I'm told he didn't consider it, not for a second. He came from the show-must-go-on school of entertainers. Lee had a brush with death back in 1963, but he'd continued performing during his Hershey, Pennsylvania Holiday Inn booking despite the fact that his kidneys were shutting down. His will was as strong in October 1986 as it had been 23 years earlier. Lee had dreamed of appearing at the music hall for years and made his first appearance there in 1984. Now nothing, not even the Grim Reaper, would be allowed to keep him from repeating the success he'd had in 1984. Lee hadn't told any of his people that he suffered from a fatal illness, he talked about being overtired and anemic instead. To this day, some of them refuse to accept the fact that he died of AIDS. I understand their reluctance. He seemed larger than life to everyone, filling our hearts and minds as easily as he filled a stage. He'd become a living legend, and legends don't die. It seems impossible even now that anything could have killed him. But he was already a dying man when he stepped on the Radio City Music Hall stage that October.
doing so took great courage on his part. He had no way of knowing if he'd be able to complete the agreed-on number of shows. If he faltered in front of John Q. Public, he must have known how hard it would be to go on keeping his final secret. With nothing more than his own fighting heart, Lee held his illness at bay and put on the show of his lifetime. Although I wasn't fortunate enough to see his final appearances, friends tell me Lee was at the top of his form full of energy and good spirits for each performance. He held the sophisticated New York audiences in the palm of his hand, from the overture to the final curtain. The show opened with motion pictures of Lee's home projected on a screen at the back of the stage. Their opulent luxury set the tone for the entire show. Then the scene dissolved to a picture of the New York skyline at night, while wisps of smoke billowed over the stage creating an atmosphere of beauty and mystery. Lee made one of his more spectacular entrances, flying across the stage wearing a harness under his costume that enabled him to soar as easily as Superman. Such apparently effortless flying is in fact one of the most physically taxing theatrical tricks, requiring great stamina and agility. Lee could have conserved his energy by being driven on stage in one of his many Rolls Royces, but this was to be his swan song as an entertainer, and he wanted to give it his unqualified best. I still shudder when I think what that cost him, flying across that stage night after night. He'd land in the wings, get out of the harness, and make his entrance on foot to thunderous applause. Knowing him, I suspect it was the applause that kept him going, that fed his soul after his body had begun to fail. No matter how bitterly we'd fought in the tabloids and then in court, there are no words to express my admiration for what he did in those 21 magical shows at the music hall. No one guessed that he was terminally ill. Not his audience, not his closest associates. Ray Arnett, a man who'd been a part of the entourage for years, later told me he didn't suspect. Perhaps he didn't want to. Lee put on the act of his life for all of them. He was living his final dream and he intended to live it in full throttle. That takes one hell of a man. He made his final entrance near the end of the show in a red, white, and blue rolls, while the Rockettes marched in perfect precision, banners swirling, and the orchestra reached a crescendo. The two-hour performance concluded with patriotic flag-waving. Night after night, Lee took his final bow to a thunderous ovation. No performer deserved it more. It was nothing short of a miracle that Lee made it through all 21 shows. I've been told he couldn't have made it through a 22nd. His strength gave out as he took his final bow on November 2nd, 1986. It was the last time any audience would have a chance to share the special fun and wonder of a Liberace show. Had Lee been able to choose the time and place of his final curtain call, I think he would have chosen the one God or fate or whatever power you believe in gave him. He came home in November to celebrate his last holiday season. Lee invited his closest friends, the nearest and dearest of his people, to share Thanksgiving and Christmas. But I'm told that he still refused to share the truth about his health. Lee always hated a complainer. It's to his eternal credit that he didn't permit himself to be one either. As far as anyone knew, he was suffering from a combination of overwork and excessive dieting. Because they all wanted to believe it, they did. It's that simple and that sad. While Lee prepared for the season of peace on earth, goodwill toward men, our legal drama was playing out its final scenes. On December 3rd, 1986, the interested parties, or their attorneys of record, met in Los Angeles Superior Court to work out their differences. A compromise met, we signed an agreement a few days later. Lee and I were finally finished with our war. Knowing what I did about his health, I could have refused the settlement and fought on in the future against Lee's estate. And I might have won. In refusing the many motions to dismiss the case, the courts seemed to indicate that it had some merit. But my argument was with Lee. My anger had been directed at him. I could not, would not, battle it out with a dying man or his heirs. And to be honest, I needed the money the settlement gave me. It's always been that way with me, and I'm afraid it always will. Bit by bit, from 1982 to 1986, 
I'd been saying goodbye to Lee. Signing the agreement meant the relationship had ended. I'd loved him and lost him. Now the world would lose him too. 28. On Tuesday, December 20th, 1986, on page 14 of the Los Angeles Times, a headline declared, Palimony suit against Liberace settled. Five years of litigation had gone by, and the media still couldn't seem to get the facts straight. It was not, I repeat, not a palimony suit. Had the headlines been required to read correctly, conversion of property suit against Liberace settled. I doubt the paper would have bothered to publish the story. I never expected to hear from Lee after we signed the agreement. The last tie between us had been severed. He would go his way and I would go mine. My biggest concern was to stay off drugs, to build a new life. I'd been angry at Lee for a long time, feeling he'd cheated me out of whatever happiness I could hope for. But now, feeling gut sure he had AIDS, I couldn't help being grateful that we'd broken up when we did. Fate had dealt me a better hand in March 1982 than I'd realized at the time. Leaving Lee in 1982 may have saved my life. Despite a stipulation that the parties to the final settlement would never reveal its terms, the Los Angeles Times printed an accurate estimate of the financial arrangements. But stories about the settlement would soon be replaced by stories about Lee's health, as rumors ran wild through the entertainment communities in Los Angeles and Las Vegas. Lee had taped an interview with Oprah Winfrey for her 1986 Christmas show, and makeup couldn't hide the fact that he looked almost as bad as Rock Hudson had during Hudson's final public appearances. One of the tabloids had already learned that, for the first time in Lee's 43-year show business career, he had no future bookings. It didn't take the media long to put two and two together, and in this case, it added up to AIDS. While the rumors about his health escalated, Lee remained in seclusion in his Palm Springs home. He no longer felt well enough to see his closest associates, men such as Ray Arnett and Bo Ayers. They would not be permitted to share his last weeks, a fact that makes them, in my opinion, the lucky ones. I never expected to see Lee again either. After all, we'd settled our suit, and I didn't think we had anything more to say to each other. But Lee had one last surprise in store for me. He telephoned a few days after Christmas, and just as with the call months earlier, his prime concern seemed to be my health. I did my best to reassure him. However, he couldn't or wouldn't take my word for the fact that I was in the best of health. Lee, who'd always been so unflappably even-tempered, sounded agitated as he repeated his questions. Then, almost abruptly, he said he had to go but that he'd call again. I was half hoping he wouldn't. Lee hadn't sounded well on the phone, mentally or physically. If I had my choice, I preferred to remember him as he'd been before we parted. Not old and sick and failing as I feared he was now. His next call, about a week later, deepened my concern. He wanted to see me, he said, to make amends. I tried to tell him there was nothing to make amends for, that we'd both made mistakes and that I hoped he forgave mine as I forgave his. But he was insistent. He had to see me. I didn't want to make the trip to the cloisters. For one thing, I knew Lee's people would resent my presence. Lee might have forgiven me for suing him, but I felt damn sure they hadn't. Going to see him on his home turf would be the equivalent of walking into the lion's den. And I wasn't that brave or that foolhardy. I told Lee I didn't think seeing each other was a very good idea. But he kept on insisting. Sick or well, he had the tenacity of a bulldog when it came to getting his way. I made him promise that any meeting between us would be as private as possible. That no one else would be in the house beside Lee and the person who would let me in. He agreed to my terms and we set a time for our meeting. It takes two hours to drive from Los Angeles to Palm Springs, and I almost turned around a half dozen times. I was still afraid of Lee's power, his ability to hurt me without even meaning to. He'd sworn again and again under oath that he hadn't meant me any harm when he told Heller to get me out of the penthouse all those years ago. No matter what Lee's intentions, I'd been threatened, roughed up, and maced. To this day... I don't think he actually asked anyone to do that to me. But when he gave the orders that set the wheels in motion, he must have known my eviction from the penthouse might turn nasty. And he hadn't hesitated. I had no idea what lay waiting for me at the cloisters.
reconciliation or renewed warfare. Lee could easily have people there who would be less than friendly when I showed up. Emotionally, I wanted to trust him, to believe him when he said he wanted to make amends. Logically, I felt that going to see him was one of the dumber things I've done in the last five years. The desert is spectacular in January. Lush, warm, and sunny. While well, L.A. is foggy and damp. But the gorgeous scenery and delightful weather didn't calm my anxiety as I exited the interstate and headed toward Palm Springs. Would Lee keep his word, I worried? Or would he take this last opportunity to make me regret suing him? and publicizing his homosexuality. As I pulled up in front of the high stucco wall surrounding the cloisters and got out of my car, the estate looked just the way it had the last time I'd been there. A wave of nostalgia washed over me as I took in the tiled Casa de Liberace sign. I drew a deep breath, rang the bell, and waited for the heavy wooden gate to swing open. A maid let me into the compound, and it soon became apparent that Lee had kept his word. No one else was there. The house looked deserted, except for a few of the smaller dogs who greeted me ecstatically, cavorting at my feet and trying to lick my hands. The fact that they still remembered me after all that time brought tears to my eyes. Despite their enthusiasm, it was a far different homecoming from the one I'd hoped for five years earlier, when I dreamed of returning to this, Lee's favorite house. The house looked the same, but everything else... My life and his had changed. Lee was waiting for me in the bedroom, and seeing him was a terrible shock. I don't think he weighed more than 140 pounds. With his gaunt face and wasted body, he looked like a scarecrow. A heartbreaking mixture of fear and despair filled his eyes. I walked over to him to give him a hug, but he stopped me. I don't want you to touch me, he said. If I'd had any guts, I'd have hugged him anyway. But seeing him like that scared the hell out of me. I backed off and concentrated on patting the dogs instead. Lee seemed to want to talk about the past, the good times we'd shared. And I let him reminisce while I struggled to get used to his frightening deterioration. It was one thing to hear stories about how terrible he looked, how sick he was. None of those stories prepared me for the reality. AIDS had a death grip on Lee. I could see it wasn't going to be a long visit. He just didn't have the strength, and a part of me couldn't wait to get out of the house. Seeing Lee like that had to be one of the most frightening experiences of my life. He told me that his sister Angie and his old friend Tito Minor, the ex-wife of Don Federson who discovered Lee, were practically the only people he saw anymore. I could understand why. One look at him and you knew he was dying. No matter how many stories his publicist put out about his just needing a long rest, this rest was going to be permanent. I wanted to cry, but I knew that wouldn't do Lee any good. Laughter would have helped both of us, but I couldn't think of anything funny to say. Fortunately, it didn't seem to matter. As we talked, there were times when I felt as if Lee's illness had affected his mind as well as his body. He rambled, lost his train of thought, skipped from one topic to another. It took him a while to get to the point. But he finally looked at me and said, I'm not going to make it. Tears filled his eyes. I don't want to be remembered as an old queen who died of AIDS. I tried to reassure him, to tell him he would always be remembered as a great entertainer. Nothing I could say seemed to help. Promise me you won't talk to anyone about this visit. He said, oh, how bad I looked. Not trusting my voice, I nodded. Scott, Lee said, I asked you here because I wanted you to know you made me the happiest. Then he gave me a ring that had belonged to his mother and one of his own that he always wore during his shows. Just a little something to remember me by, he said, smiling with something like the old sparkle in his eyes. Lee knew I loved jewelry almost as much as he did. Nothing he could have given me would have pleased me more. I remembered his telling me how he'd given away so many of his treasured possessions back in 1964 when he thought he was dying, and a terrible feeling of longing and regret washed over me. This time there would be no miraculous recovery. Lee and I had been through a lot together, not all of it good, but I wouldn't have wished AIDS on my worst enemy. Seeing him like that was rough. I just hope it gave him a little peace.' 
Before I left, he gave me one last parting gift. A big panda bear, much like the one I'd seen on his bed ten years earlier. The first time I walked into his bedroom in Vegas. Then our brief visit was over. Driving back to L.A., I knew I'd never see him again. On January 14th, the Las Vegas Sun ran an editorial that was, in part, an appeal to one of entertainment's brightest stars. To face reality with courage and determination. To lick the disease if there is a way. He has all the money in the world. And he should be experimenting. Not only for his own life, but for the sake of others. It didn't take a genius to read between the lines and figure out that the paper was talking about Lee. Even though they didn't come right out and name him. Predictably, Seymour Heller rose to the challenge and immediately issued a vigorous denial. Saying that Lee didn't have AIDS that he suffered from emphysema, heart disease, and anemia. That was to be the party line for the next few weeks. When Heller was asked why Lee didn't have any future bookings, he quoted Lee as saying, Seymour, I have these lovely places, and I never take time to enjoy them. What's the sense in having them if I don't take the time? In reality, Lee's time had almost run out. His last few weeks would deteriorate into a Roman circus with the media playing the lions while Lee and his people played the Christians. The worst thing, in my opinion, is that the circus would never have happened if at any time in the past Lee had admitted to being homosexual. Instead of treating him sympathetically, the press seemed determined to catch Lee in the lie of a lifetime. They began to gather outside the cloisters where the death watch had begun. Again, the Vegas sun scooped everyone, when it's January 24th, 1987 edition, or the headline, Liberace, Victim of Deadly AIDS. The day before, Lee had checked into the Eisenhower Medical Center in Palm Springs, where he would spend three days in isolation. As he fought his deadly illness, his worst fears were realized. He had lived his life flamboyantly, and his final days would be equally attention-getting. Liberace and AIDS were a major story to be told and retold in the papers and on all the newscasts. Seymour Heller fought a last-ditch effort to keep Lee from being branded on his deathbed as an aging queen dying of AIDS. Heller built a solid wall of denial that the press didn't breach until Lee's death. Everyone associated with Lee, including his private doctor, told the same story. Lee had heart problems, accompanied by anemia and emphysema. When Lee left the medical center... The people closest to him were quoted as saying he was feeling better. In fact, he left because he wanted to die at his beloved cloisters, rather than in unfamiliar surroundings. He would not be alone during his final days. The man who lived his life surrounded by other gay men would spend his final days being ministered to by women. Angie, Gladys Lucky, and another housekeeper, Dorothy McMahane, would keep a constant vigil by his side, while round-the-clock nurses gave Lee the best medical care available. But all their efforts would prove useless against a disease for which there is no known cure. Outside the cloisters, the media maintained their own vigil. Curious bystanders, perhaps drawn by the television cameras, began to keep the vigil, too. Any hope that Lee could die with dignity disappeared. Everything that happened during those final days became fodder for the tabloids. Lee's last hours were described in infinite and often inaccurate detail. No element of the story seemed too personal to publish. There were accounts of how Lee asked to say goodbye to his dogs, how the day came when he no longer recognized them, how he had conversations with his mother or his two deceased brothers as he lapsed in and out of a coma. Lee's last words are contradictorily quoted as being... Baby boy, I'll soon be there to feed you. And I'll soon be with you, mother. Although the official death certificate places February 4th, 1987, 2.05 p.m. as the date and time of his death, insiders are reported to have said that he died at 11.30 a.m. There would be other discrepancies. Lee's personal physician, Dr. Ronald Daniels, listed cardiac arrest due to cardiac failure as the cause of his death. Technically, I guess he was correct, if not strictly forthcoming, in that everyone dies of heart failure. At 2.50 p.m., 
one of Angie's sons-in-law stepped outside the cloisters to announce that Lee was gone. At 3.20 p.m., a plain gray hearse was admitted to the cloister's compound, and Lee's body, encased in a black plastic body bag, was placed inside. As the vehicle exited the grounds, heading for Los Angeles, where the body would be prepared for burial at Forest Lawn, cars full of reporters and even a television helicopter gave chase. The next day, shortly after Lee's body had been embalmed, the Riverside County Health Department formally rejected Dr. Daniels' death certificate and ordered an autopsy. California law requires that an autopsy be conducted when there is a suspicion that someone has died of a contagious disease. According to the Riverside coroner, Raymond Carrillo, there were more than enough grounds for suspicion. But Carrillo would be handicapped by the efforts of Lee's friends to protect his reputation. Heller and Strote vigorously protested the need for the autopsy, citing Dr. Daniels' death certificate. They would deny Lee's aides with their last breath if need be. Because Lee had already been embalmed, it would be necessary to take tissue samples and to get the medical records, including blood tests, from his recent stay at the Eisenhower Medical Center. Carrillo would eventually be forced to subpoena them. All of this kept Lee's name on the front pages. Lee's Palm Springs Memorial Service at Our Lady of Solitude served as a media event rather than a last farewell. Reverend William Erstad's earnest plea, let us not judge our fellow man, everyone needs forgiveness, went unheeded, as did a telegram from President Ronald Reagan saying that Liberace will be remembered in many ways, but most importantly as a kind man who lived his life with great joy. I sat in the church that day, listening to the well-meaning words, knowing they would be ignored by the press. Lee, having spent so much of his life trying to conceal his homosexuality, would now be remembered as the second famous entertainer to die of AIDS. By denying his homosexuality, by trying to conceal his AIDS rather than going public as Rock Hudson had done, I felt Lee had set the entire gay movement back a decade. Back in 1982, during the tabloid wars, Lee had said, the gays are out to assassinate me. In a bizarre way that no one could possibly have foreseen, his prediction had come true. Epilogue. Lee's illness and subsequent death shook me up more than any other event in my life, made me take a serious look at where I was and where I seemed to be headed. A few months after I began to suspect Lee had AIDS, I finally managed to kick my chemical dependency. I joined an AA drug program where, coincidentally, my sponsor turned out to be a recovered addict who had also been introduced to hard drugs by Dr. Jack Starts. Staying clean is a battle I fight every day, and it's never easy. But it's essential to my survival. Job-wise, I'm not doing as well. Being Lee's former lover isn't something I can put down on a resume. Today, because of the AIDS epidemic in Hollywood, employers are reluctant to hire known gays. Sometimes I feel as if the deck is stacked against me, even though I'm the damn fool who shuffled the cards. I've been through tough times before, and I've always survived. I plan to survive this one, too. Putting this book together has helped me to see things. Myself, Lee, the effect we had on each other's lives, more clearly. In the months following his death, Lee continued to be the subject of controversy, discussion, and legal action. He was mourned, lamented, hated, and loved, just as he had been in his lifetime but not forgotten. One day in April 1987, I got a pathetic phone call from one of Lee's people, a man who'd been with Lee through 30 years of performances. I woke up this morning, he said, and the damnedest thing happened. I completely forgot that Lee was gone. And you know, Scott, it's the time of year when we always go on tour. So I picked up the phone to call Seymour Heller. I was going to chew him out for not telling me when Lee and I would be leaving town. The poor guy's voice was quivering as he said, Let it hit me. We'll never be going on the road again. There won't be any more tours. Like me, this man couldn't come to grips with the fact that Lee was dead. Like me, he seemed to be wondering what to do with the rest of his life now that Lee wasn't part of it. I could sympathize with the guy, but I couldn't help him. 
I'd faced the same problem five years earlier, and I still hadn't come up with a good answer for myself. Everyone associated with Lee had to learn to deal with his death. It affected them all differently. The first of several disputes over Lee's estate made headlines in 1987. Rudy's four children, who'd been excluded as heirs by a new will written just weeks before Lee's death, appeared in a Las Vegas courtroom to contest the will's validity. Then, on May 12, 1987, Joel Strode, now the executor of Lee's estate, filed a claim for unspecified damages against Riverside County, claiming that Lee's reputation had been damaged by the county coroner who publicly linked Lee's death to AIDS. It would seem that Strode was prepared to fight one last futile battle on Lee's behalf, to keep Lee from being identified publicly and for all time as a homosexual male. I admire Strode's loyalty, although his actions were ultimately futile. Perhaps he too was having trouble accepting Lee's death. Perhaps he was trying to do what he thought Lee would have wanted. I've never been able to figure the guy out. In any case, the court denied the claim. And in July 1987, the Riverside County Coroner made his final findings public. The coroner concluded that Lee had died of an AIDS-related cause. While the survivors argued among themselves, Lee's estate went into probate. Lee had earned hundreds of millions of dollars in his lifetime, but he'd spent lavishly. I have no way of knowing how much money he left, but the events that followed his death seem to indicate that the estate is cash poor. On May 24th, 1987, Christie's of London, one of the world's most prestigious auction houses, announced that it would hold a three-day auction in the Los Angeles Convention Center in mid-April 1988 to dispose of more than 20,000 items belonging to Lee, ranging from dozens of trademark candelabra to mirrored pianos to Rolls Royces. Bit by bit, the things Lee loved including most of his homes, are being offered for sale. Lee's sister, Angie, has made a public plea for funds to save Lee's Vegas house from the auction block and turn it into yet another Liberace museum. As of this writing, the Shirley Street house is still on the market, and I guess it will sell one of these days. More recently, in August 1987, I heard that Angie, Gladys Lucky, housekeeper Dorothy McMahane, and Carrie James, were all bringing suit because Lee's new will, written by Joel Strode and signed just days before Lee's death, didn't fulfill the promises he'd made over and over to them during his life. It all has a terribly familiar sound. As they say, what goes around comes around. It's sad but predictable that the people closest to Lee would quarrel now that he's gone. He was the glue that held them all together. The only thing that now seems to unite them is a determination to keep me from writing this book. With few exceptions, they have refused interviews, turned down requests for pictures, used Lee's vestigial influence to keep places such as the Vegas Hilton from helping me, and threatened a suit should this book be published. Those who have cooperated, fearing reprisals from Strode and Heller, have asked that I never reveal their names. But I have two powerful reasons for writing this book. As you may have guessed, I need the money. The settlement I got at the end of the lawsuit went for legal fees and to set up my own apartment. More important, I believe that Lee's story, his true story, rather than a carefully concocted fairy tale, deserves to be told. For his story can teach all of us a lesson. It serves best as a cautionary tale, whose moral is too much of a good thing be it sex, booze, success, or fame, is not wonderful. In fact, it can kill you. Afterward, Beyond the Candelabra. At the close of the time period covered by Behind the Candelabra, I was a young man, but a young man with the life experience of someone much older and more experienced than is typical for my age. Lee's money, age, and dominating role within our relationship had resulted in my meeting and coming to know people with considerable influence in a wide range of pursuits. Movies, television, Vegas, nightclubs, and organized crime. Primarily the drug trade. And I had possessions. 
My famous lawsuit against Lee was not terribly successful. But during my time with him, I accumulated considerable assets. Not just hard assets like cars, houses, and jewelry, but also investment in businesses. And the businesses with the biggest impact on my life going forward were nightclubs. In the best of times, the nightclub business attracts investors with less than the most altruistic motivations. With my luck, I found myself in partnership in a number of clubs with a man who went by the alias Eddie Nash. Nash's primary occupation was acting as kingpin of the drug trade for organized crime throughout Southern California, among other areas. In his overall enterprise, our nightclub's primary purpose was to launder money being thrown off by his drug business. We were scrubbing huge amounts of drug money. Nash's success in the drug trade attracted the attention of, and created envy in, smaller, less disciplined drug traders, particularly a wild group known throughout the Southland as the Wonderland Gang, because of the location of their operating headquarters on Wonderland Avenue, in the Laurel Canyon section of Los Angeles. In one of the most sensational cases of the 1980s, Nash colleagues butchered four members of the Wonderland Gang in their hangout, in retribution for their break-in at his mansion and theft of drug inventory, massive cash reserves, jewelry, and other valuables. Nash gained knowledge of the perpetrators of the theft by torturing John Holmes, a pathetically drug-addicted porn star who frequented both Nash's mansion and the Wonderland gang hangout in his search for drugs. The federal government had leverage on me because of my shared ownership of the money laundering clubs, so my testimony at trial about the torture of Holmes was regarded as very helpful in the conviction and sentencing of a major mob figure. And into the federal witness protection program I went. But now I was penniless. Federal confiscation of my club ownerships was just the starting point. The government ended up with all my jewelry, real estate, and other belongings of any value. But they gave me a new name, life history, and social security number. Hello, Jess Marlowe. Witness protection works by changing pretty much everything about you to hide you among the population. I was sent to rural Florida and became an employee of an evangelistic church with a significant outreach program. Only God could have arranged for me to meet him under circumstances that I would truly respond to. It was here that I quickly became a born-again believer and developed a reputation for my testimony. In short order, the pastors learned that I could move an audience with my preaching, and I became part of their itinerant preaching program. I was actually becoming something of a hot commodity in the television and radio evangelism scene, flying in private jets to speak at events held by respected preachers, including an appearance at a Billy Graham crusade event. The witness protection marshals warned me. I will give them that. My service in sharing God's word was raising my profile throughout America including prisons, and Eddie Nash was able to pierce my veil of protection. I went to the door of the motel where I was staying in Jacksonville, Florida, expecting a pizza. Instead, I got five thirty-eight caliber slugs, three in the abdomen, one striking my spinal column, one in the chest, and one in the head. The hitmen left me for dead, and indeed I was technically dead for several minutes, based on medical definitions, but I was rushed to University Hospital and revived, at least into a coma state, a coma that would last six months. During my preaching career, my messages had particularly affected a young divorcee in Maine. She felt moved by the Lord to pray for me and visit me in the hospital. Due to the circumstances, my room was guarded, and a number of similar-minded people were turned away by law enforcement. In one of those coincidences that make it hard to believe in coincidences, my soon-to-be benefactor found herself on a business trip to Florida and able to walk straight through the entire hospital and directly into my room without any contact whatsoever with any official personnel. And so we were reading scripture and praying, and eventually she offered me shelter in her home in Maine. From 1991 to 2005, I lived in Maine with someone who had nothing but my best interests at heart. But my heart wandered continually, causing me to seek drugs and to leave her in Maine for more than just a few days at a time. For 14 years, I always came back to Maine and to her and to the large group of dogs she had allowed me to bring into the house as pets.
To this day, I believe that had I not met Liberace, a career with animals either as a vet or trainer would have been my best course. In any event, in 2005, I could no longer resist the temptation to return to something like the life I had had with Lee. The problem was that